You are now tuned into Then Radio. If you enjoy our videos, we ask that you consider joining our Patreon to support our channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you never miss a new video. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and as always, thank you for watching. Of the international secret police. Feeling zero. Feeling zero. Feeling zero. Feeling zero. La Chotzi Ring, an important personage in Tibet, blasts the hopes of Clint and Barney when he refuses to aid them in their pursuit of the octopus. However, when his son Dawa is almost killed by an octopus arrow intended for Speed Gibson, the Tibetan swears to help the secret police in every way that he can. We find them all in Tzi Ring's home now, shortly after the near tragedy. And to think that the life of an innocent boy should be threatened, and here in Lhasa... The holy city. The octopus is no respecter of persons or places, Si Ring. His ambition drives him to do mad and terrible things. And now you can understand why we of the secret police are determined to track him down no matter where he goes. Yes, yes, Mr. Barlow. We must unite against this common enemy. If he dares threaten my home, what would be the fate of the peasants of Tibet where he allowed free reign? Same as what happened to the Chinese in Hong Kong, Mr. Si Ring. They were being smuggled into other countries and sold for slaves. And the government could not stop that? Nothing has stopped the octopus yet, Mr. Searing. But that's where the secret police are going to be different. We're going to stop him, and how? Mr. Barlow. Oh, yes, Dawa. If honored male parent will consent, have I your permission to join the international secret police? Well, now that's an idea, Dawa. I'll think that over. I know that you'd be of credit to the service. Oh, thank you, Mr. Barlow. I hope that your thoughts will lean in my favor. <laughs> Clint's thoughts generally lean, kid. <laughs> Quiet. Okay, I was only kidding. Mr. Barlow, will you and the others do me the honor of dining with me this evening? I should uh, not only like to have the pleasure of your company, but also learn the details of your work on this important case thus far. The more I know, the better able I'll be to aid you. Food. Boy, I'll say we stay. I think I've eaten less in Tibet than in any other country in the world. <clears throat> We'd uh, be delighted, Mr. Searing. I have searched the garden thoroughly, Mr. Barlow. I was unable to find any trace of the intruder. Well, that's not unusual, Chief people. Octopus gangsters scarcely ever leave any trace of their visits. Only the result remains. In this case, this murderous-looking arrow. You're hanging on to that, Clint? You bet, Barney, for fingerprints. Well, of course, I'll find yours and mine on it, since we both handled it, but I may find some others, too. That's why I've wrapped it in this cloth. Oh, uh, uh that brings uh, something to my mind. A dawa. Would you not like to present Speed with one of your bows and a quiver of arrows? I understand that he is greatly interested in archery. One of Dawa's bows? For me? Oh, golly. Honored male parent, you have spoken the very thought that was in my mind. I was intending to present him with my best bow. See? Here it is. And the arrows, too. That bow, Dawa? Why, that's the one you shot with. The one you like best. For the friend I like best, Speed. You saved my life. And we are the same as blood brothers. That is so. Gee, I... I don't know what to say. Look, Clint, Barney, this swell bow and these arrows. And look at that quiver. That's a honey. It is made out of yaw skin, Mr. Dunlop. Uh, it is very strong. Well, what's the pull on that bow, Dawa? Fifty pounds, sir. A handsome gift speed and one that will give you much pleasure. I'll say. Gee, Dawa, I don't know how to thank you now, but I will someday. Don't you worry. You don't know how to thank me. But it is I who am in your debt, Speed. Well, you're lucky to have such a friend as Dawa, Speed. I'll say so. Real friends are as scarce as hen's teeth. I feel that we have all been brought together for a purpose, gentlemen. 
And now, while my servants prepare the feast, let us discuss this octopus in more detail. Quan Wu, you think you will be able to take care of the slaves that are to be brought here tonight? See that they are imprisoned in the soundproof rooms, that none escape to give an alarm? I, Master, where shall you be? In Lhasa. Lhasa? Is that why? Why not? As Paul Meunier, I have good reason to visit the city once in a while. I have not thus far. And this fact might arouse a certain suspicion. Besides, there is one in Lhasa I would like to know. Who is that? A Tibetan. La Shou Tsiring, an important man, Kwan Wu. One to be more feared than any government official or high lama, because he is well loved by his people. You will attempt to win his friendship? Attempt? <laughs> I do not know the word. I shall command his friendship. Of course. He owns a vast amount of property, much of it near this pass of the Iron Dagger. Since the slaves will be brought over his property at night, it is well that he should trust me, since then his guards will not be riding his boundaries. God. He also owns vast herds of yars and sheep. I understand. When will you return, Master? Sometime tomorrow. If I am detained, I shall let you know over the shortwave radio. From Lhasa? Where will you find one you can use? Fool, have you forgotten the secret set hidden in my car? Ah, that one. Yes, I had forgotten. I do not know if I should leave you in charge of the castle or not. Yes, Master, you can trust me. Uh, I hope so, Kwan Wu. For your sake, I hope so. <laughs> and now order the car. I shall leave immediately by the secret passage. Uh, tell the workers to be sure there are no travelers in the pass when we drive out of the hidden garage. I shall relay your command at once. Uh, wait. Yes? While I am absent, have the men build a garage of some sort near the foot trail that leads up to this house. Once I am seen in the car, the car must be visible should anyone call on me. Else they shall wonder. True. That shall be done, Master. And now I shall go to Lhasa and see what La Shou Tsiring has to say for himself. Uh, Mr. Barlow, while Tsiring and his son are out of the room preparing for the feast... Will you allow me to give you and the others a few suggestions as to our Tibetan feasting customs? Well, I wish you would, Chief Depot. This looks like it's going to be a formal feast, and we don't want to pull any boners. Pull a bone? <laughs> Make a mistake, Chief. Oh, I understand. Now, first tea and little cakes are served. But since we have already had those, we shall go into that next room, where you will observe large cushions around that table. You mean we're going to sit on cushions, Steve? Yes, Mr. Dunlap. Do you not approve? Approve? <laughs> Boy, I love it. All my life I wanted to sit or lay on a cushion while I ate. And now's my chance. Uh, yes, Mr. Dunlap. And since you are not used to Tibetan meals, you will probably find it necessary to lie down before the meal is finished. Yeah, well, uh, huh? Why, Chief Chipo? Our average meal consists of 42 dishes in 16 courses. I beg you, what? And one must eat at least half of each portion for politeness' sake. For politeness' sake? <laughs> oh, nothing at all, nothing at all. Boy, that's a lot of food. Well, you've been complaining about not eating enough, boys, so here's your chance. And when tea is served, one takes a few drops out of his cup with the third finger of his right hand and thumb and flicks it upward as an offering to the gods. It has to be the third finger and the thumb, huh? To follow tradition, yes. Well, I never used a teacup as a finger bowl, but I guess it's always a first time. <laughs> It'll be raining to you if you get Barney started at that, Chief Tipo. Hey, that's not fair, kid. I know my table manners. Yeah, so do we. That's why we're worried. <laughs> Uh-oh, there's the dinner gong. The feast is ready. Will you come, my friends? You bet. Sure, come on, boys. Is this going to be a regular Tibetan meal, Dawa? Uh, yes. My honored male parents made it a feast in your honor, Speed. Mine? Gosh. Hey, pipe the silver dishes and the chopsticks. Don't tell me I gotta eat with them things. Yes, now pipe down. Yeah, but Clint, I'll starve if I have to eat with chopsticks. I can't balance my grub on them skinny pieces of wood. And what if they had peas? Oh, but well, these chopsticks happen to be ivory. Wood or ivory, all the same skinny. Uh, welcome to our humble table, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Barlow, will you sit here? Speed next to you? Mr. Dunlap? On the next question, my son, 
take your usual place on my right hand, and the Chief Tipo will take the remaining cushion. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Say, this yeah. sure looks like a lot of food, Mr. Searing. This the whole meal, huh? Oh, my. No, Mr. Dunlap. What you see are merely the hors d'oeuvre and appetizers. Honored mill parent, may I make the tea offering to the gods this time? Yes, my son. Then will you all join me in the offering? Those who do this are forever friends. You bet, Dawa. Let's see now. Third finger and thumb and right hand. Okay, I'm ready. May the blessings of heaven be upon this feast and those who feast at this table. And now, the offering of the tea. Uh, hey, oh. Clint, you shot your offering right in my eye. Oh. Well, I'm sorry, Barney. I'm not quite up on this, I guess. <laughs> Perhaps. Perhaps you find this custom curious. But you all seem interested in our Tibetan customs, so I thought uh, we would die in the traditional manner. It's swell, Mr. Seary. Oh, what's this? It is a bowl of macaroni, Mr. Dunlap. And I'm supposed to eat macaroni with chopsticks? Will they give you trouble? Well, that macaroni's going to be kind of slippery on this ivory. We shall procure knives and forks, then, for all who desire them. Uh, well, what about you, Speed? Oh, the servant can supply you. Well, I'm going to use the chopsticks, Dawa. I learned how in Hong Kong. It's easy after you know how. Yeah, but I'd starve while I was learning. Good old knife and fork. Thanks, Searing. You are most welcome. Ah, here is the rest of our first course. You mean... All that is only the first course? Why, yes, Mr. Dunlop. Uh, here is sweet sa, a Chinese vegetable. And here, sheep's kidneys and uh, Chinese sea slugs. They increase your strength. Quick speed. Slip me a sea slug. If this is just the first course, my strength is going to need increase. <laughs> <laughs> Land at one. Oh, uh, yes, Chute? A visitor is within your house. <laughs> yes? The Honorable Paul Mounier. Mounier. The octopus. In this house? Well, what can it mean? Gentlemen, we shall continue our feast. And when we are completely done, we shall see the Honorable Paul Mounier. The International Secret Police. Speed saves the life of Da Wa, son of La Sho Tsi Ring, an important Tibetan. He wins the man over to the side of the secret police. The boys are invited to stay for a feast given in Speed's honor and also discuss the details of the octopus case. Meanwhile, the criminal, in the guise of Paul Mounier, the scientist, decides to come to Lhasa and visit Tsi Ring. He arrives just as the boys are beginning the feast, and now 
Some 42 dishes and 16 courses later, we find our friends leaning back on their cushions, exhausted from the feast. Oh, suffering wang doodles. I've just eaten enough to last me for two months. (laughs) That's what you say now, Barney, but you'll be howling for breakfast the first thing in the morning. And now, if you will excuse me for a moment, I shall leave you and receive my guest. Mr. Mooney. Oh, uh, shall I come along, Mr. Steering? I would prefer to meet him alone first, Mr. Barlow. By asking him to wait until we had dined, his temper should be quite aroused. Yes, that's excellent psychology. First, I shall observe his attitude toward me. And then, at the opportune moment, I shall send Chute the servant to summon you all. I shall not tell him who my other guests are until after you appear in the room. The expression in his eyes will tell me much. Gee, Mr. Searing, you ought to be in the secret police. Perhaps I may serve your organization better by not becoming a member, Speed. And now, if you will pardon me for a little while... Why, of course. We'll wait here for the servant to summon us. Thank you. And watch your step, Mr. Searing. You've got a terror sitting in your front room. I do not fear a man like the octopus, Mr. Dunlap. My honored male parent is Phyllis. Too much so to meet such a horrible criminal as you have described, my friend. Well, don't you worry, Dawa. I think your father can take care of himself. Well, my stuff. Well, you didn't have to eat all of everything that was set before you. I didn't. Only ate half each course, and I did that because Chief Tipo said it was the polite thing to do. Didn't you, Chief? Uh, yes, Mr. Dunder, but I did not Never mean... Never mind that... what you meant. I was the only polite guy here. Rest of them hardly touch some of the food. <laughs> Gosh, Barney, we've only got room for so much. By the way, Dawa, will you go over this list with me to make sure I've got all the dishes down? Of course, Speed. But why did you write down all the dishes that were served? I want to show the list to my friends back home when we get back to America. They'll want to know everything that happened here in Tibet, even to what we ate. And I could never remember everything. <laughs> Very well. But you will have eaten enough Tibetan food by the time you leave to remember it well, Speed. Now, read off your list, and I'll stop you if you have forgotten anything. Okay. Hors d'oeuvre, which were nuts and chilies. Then that big bowl of macaroni. Oh, gosh. Don't you like macaroni, Mr. Dunlap? Uh Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, kid, I liked it fine. Only hearing about it now, so soon after that dinner, I... I... Don't mind me. <laughs> uh, next, the treat saw. That's the Chinese vegetable. The sheep's kidneys. Fish with vinegar. Chilies and mustard oil. Chong B, another Chinese vegetable. And to increase our strength, Chinese slugs. Uh, oh. Have I got them all so far, Dawa? Yes, Speed. Uh, then came the radishes. Carrots. Yaw's tongue. Roast mutton. Sheep's liver. Yeah, sheep's... we ate every bit of the sheep, but the ba. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, never mind your wisecracks, Barney. Give the kids a chance. I'm not stopping them. Anyhow, you're supposed to be planning and shouldn't be hearing any of this stuff. <laughs> uh, then we had shrimps, another Chinese vegetable, Chinese nuts, crystallized sugar, raisins, dates, almonds, shark's fin, Chinese peas. Uh, Brenzels, that uh, Indian vegetable. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Dawa. After that, we had roast meat with sea slugs, pastry puffs containing meat, Peas, shrimps, and wosen, another Chinese vegetable, stewed mutton, fish again, peas with sugar, bamboo roots, pears, young sprouts of pea plants sweetened, and then we had some more pastry puffs contained in sweet stuff, fish and seaweed. This was supposed to remove hoarseness. Yeah, and believe me, I was hoarse from swallowing by that time. <laughs> Fried mutton, fish abdomens, Chinese cabbage, and another bowl of rice. I guess that's all. All and enough. <laughs> uh, you have my sympathy, Mr. Dunlap. I need all your sympathy, Chief. And another pillow in the bargain. <laughs> you are most fortunate that we are not at our country home, Mr. Dunlap. How come? Well, there, after a feast such as this, we go for a walk around the gardens. Then return for tea and cakes. Uh, what? More food? Not only more food to eat, but more to look at. For after our return, the servants bring the raw joints of the meat that is left to show us what good meat we have eaten. Oh. (laughs) Young master? Yes, Chute? Your honored male parent requests that you and your guests appear in the visiting room. Thank you. Good. I've been waiting for this. Help me up off this pillow, will you, Speed? I can't move. Sure, Barney. Uh, Oh. Uh, I'm up. Never thought I'd make it. 
I am most anxious to look upon the face of this octopus. Well, you will see nothing to arouse your suspicion, Dawa. The man is a master at disguise and makeup. Well, you're better than the octopus at disguises, Clint. Well, thanks, Pete, but let's forget me for the time being. I want you boys particularly to watch your step. Don't betray by a word or action that you know Mounier to be anything but the famous scientist he pretends to be. You understand? Yes, sir. I shall not betray my innermost thoughts. You may depend on me. That's a good boy. Leave the talking to Barney and me, Speed. And Barney, you'd better not say too much. Don't worry. For once, you can have the whole stage, old pal. I'll just be looking on and digesting my supper. All right, come along, then. Odawa, you'd better go first since we're your guests. Of course. Through this door. Thank you, Doc. I am anxious that you should meet my son, Mr. Mounier. Since he must someday take my place, I wish him to know men of science. Tibet has a need for such men. I am as anxious to meet the son of such a great man as yourself, Honorable Tsiring. I have lived in seclusion since coming to your country because my work necessitated it. Uh, but hearing of you, knowing of the good that you are doing, Tibet, I felt that we should know one another. I... Oh... Hello, Mr. Mounier. Honored male parent, I have brought our guest. Thank you, Dawa. You, uh, you seem startled, Mr. Mounier. I, w- <laughs> I must confess that I am, sir. You see, I have met your guests before, under rather peculiar circumstances. <laughs> yes, that's right. In fact, we, uh, broke into your home to bring about our first meeting. <laughs> Did we not, Mr. Mounier? That is correct, Mr. Vala. Our friends thought me to be some sort of criminal, Mr. Tsiring. What was it you called me? Uh, uh, some sort of a fish. The octopus. Ah, yes, yes, that is right. Thank you, Mr. Dunlap. You're welcome. I was explaining to Mr. Mounier that our feast kept us from him so long. When you have been in Tibet longer and come from your seclusion more often, Mr. Mounier, you will understand our customs better. I did not mind waiting, Mr. Tsiring. As a matter of fact, I rather enjoyed it. I have been working hard of late. Resting here in your home was somewhat of a luxury. And since I came from the pass of the Iron Dagger just to call on you, I had no reason to hurry. Just to call on me? Yes, yes, we have much in common. I wouldn't say that. Mr. Tsiring works for the good of Tibetan people. And I... Work for her harm? You're not interested in Tibet, are you, Mr. Mounier? I thought you went to that hideaway in the past so nobody'd bother you. So you could carry on your mysterious experiments to your heart's content. You have a good memory for my words, Mr. Dunlap. Like an elephant. (laughs) Do you know, Mr. Barlow, I believe your aide still suspects me of being the octopus. Well, why? Eh? What do you mean? Well, there was no suspicion in his statement, Mr. Meunier. He was merely repeating what you yourself once told us. Yes, yes, that is true. But I am beginning to think I was wrong, Mr. Barlow. Too much seclusion is not good. Then you mean we can visit you oftener? Why, uh, I'd like to show Dawa your laboratory if I could. He'd like it. Oh, yes, indeed, Mr. Meunier. I should enjoy visiting your home very much. It is impossible just now, I'm sorry to say. In a few weeks, I shall welcome your speed. But now... Uh, No. I am in the midst of my most important experiment. I allow no one in my laboratory, not even my servants. Oh, I see. Okay, we'll wait. Ah. And now I must intrude no longer, Mr. Searing. I shall return another time when you are not entertaining guests. Perhaps uh, tomorrow. I am spending the night in Lhasa. As you wish, Mr. Mounier. Jute. Yes, Allard One? Please escort Mr. Mounier to the outer door. Yes. Thank you. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening to you, Mr. Mignier. Am I glad to see him go? And that kindly old gentleman is the world's worst criminal? I can hardly believe it. You believed that arrow that almost punctured you, didn't you? Oh, yes. Well, you can count that arrow as that guy's calling card. He is truly a dangerous man, Mr. Barlow. His eyes glittered like cold fire when you came in with my son. And I'm glad you recognize the evil in him, Mr. Searing. You must believe in our cause if you're to help us at all. Would it be well for me to follow Mounier, Mr. Barlow, to discover where he went? No. I can't ask you to remain on this case any longer, Chief Tipo. You've been ordered to return to Nag Chukar tonight. We can't interfere with your duties any more than we have. I must return, that is true, but I shall come back to Lhasa as soon as possible. Good. 
And I think you'll find us at uh, Mr. T. Ring's country home. Huh? Are we going to take a vacation? Vacation, nothing. Uh, can we go to your country home, C. Ring? Of course, Mr. Barlow. I promise to help you in every way. But we must do it secretly, so as not to endanger your life or that of your son. You mean we're going to go there and the octopus mustn't suspect we're there on official business? Exactly. I have it. We could invite these friends there for the picnic day, honored male parent. The day that is called Zamling Chisang, the incense of the whole world. It falls on the day following tomorrow. Dawa, you've got something there. But why do you want to go to the country, Clint? Because Searing's home commands a view of the Pass of the Iron Dagger. The octopus is up to something. Since he was so insistent that we shouldn't visit him for a while. And we're going to find out what he's up to. Of the International Secret Police. Speed, Clint, and Barney are at the home of La Chaux-Zi Ring, an important Tibetan who intends aiding them in their pursuit of the octopus. The arch-criminal himself, in the guise of Paul Mounier, also pays the great man a call. He is surprised at the presence of the secret police and says that he will come another time. From his conversation, Clint suspects that something is going on in the pass of the Iron Dagger that he should know about. Accordingly, Z Ring invites them all to his country home, which commands a view of the pass. Ostensibly, they are there to celebrate a Tibetan picnic day, the incense of the whole world. But from all indications, it won't be any picnic for the secret police. We find the boys looking over the country home of Tsi Ring shortly after their arrival. Gee, Mr. Tsi Ring, if I had a nice country place like this, I don't think I'd ever leave it to go to Lhasa. Not my wishes, but business takes me to Lhasa, Speed. I can best direct the education of my people from there. So it is imperative that I go at least once every week. Dawa, my son, does not often accompany me, however. He shares your complete enthusiasm for the c- country. Uh, yes, indeed. Though it was most fortunate that I accompanied you on this last trip, honored male parent. Otherwise, I might never have met Speed. Oh, I think you two would have gotten together sooner or later, Dawa. You know the old saying, birds of a feather. <laughs> birds of a feather? What, Mr. Dunlap? You, uh, huh? Why, they uh, fly or sing or something. What are you grinning at, Clint? Help me out, can't you? <laughs> I was wondering where you came out on that one. <laughs> Barney was talking about a proverb of ours, Dawa. Birds of a feather flock together. Oh, flock or fly, what's the difference? <laughs> oh, Barney always gets his proverbs mixed up when he tries to use them. I got more important things than proverbs to remember. Yeah, I'll say so. I see we get an excellent view of the Pass of the Iron Dagger from this porch, Mr. Steering. Yes. 
We can see it well, but we do not share its weather, fortunately. Even the Tibetan winds, which rage across my country every afternoon, fall to the merest breeze here, scarcely disturbing the amethyst haze that gathers as evening shadows lengthen. I've noticed that purple haze, Mr. Thiering. It is unusual in the high altitudes of this country, isn't it? Very. To my knowledge, this is the only valley blessed by such beauty. The peasants think that the valley is haunted by good spirits, that they move about in the amethyst haze. Huh. This valley haunted? Oh, don't say that around Barney. He'll run screaming from the place. Hey, I never <laughs> screamed in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if Chief Tipo has arrived from Nantuka by this time. Oh, yes, Speed. It is not far from Lhasa, you know. Then I guess he's given all our messages to Bob Gilmore and Jean and her father. Yeah, wonder how they're getting along. Uh, don't worry about them, Speed. Bob will take care of them all right. And if anything goes wrong, he knows where to reach us. I told Chief Tipo to tell him everything that had happened to us in Lhasa. If he does that, it'll take him a week. Uh, who are these people you speak of, Speed? Well, Bob Gilmore is a secret police operator, Mr. Tsering. He helped us a lot in Hong Kong. Jean and her dad, Dr. Kingsley, were with us there, too. We first met Jean in Honolulu, though. Yeah, funny thing. Speed saved her life, too, Dawa. Pulled her out of the surf at Waikiki Beach. Really? Hmm? Gee, Barney, the guard would have gotten her if I hadn't. Maybe. She was bobbing up and down in the water like a jack-in-the-box, gulping in half the ocean every time she went in under. The ocean. How I would like to see it. You mean you never have, Dawa? Oh, no. Do not forget speed. I have never been out of Tibet, though my American tutor told me of the wonders of the sea. Do you swim? Oh, yes. We have lakes, you know. Fresh water, huh? Gee, you'd like the breakers, Dawa. You swim out of ways, and then if you time one just right, you can ride it in clear to the beach. How wonderful that must be. Like flying. Yeah, unless you time one just wrong, then it's like drowning. <laughs> well, now we'd better get down to business, boys. You bet, Clint. What do you want us to do? Well, I was thinking last evening while the octopus was talking to Mr. C. Ring, thinking where I'd seen him before, or someone that looked like him. How do you know how he really looks, Clint? He's got enough disguise on his face to hide a gorilla mug. Well, there are certain things that can't be disguised, Barney. Mainly the eyes. Now, I've seen those eyes before. That's easy to explain. You might have seen him through that mask he used to wear. No, it's more than that. And I think that familiarity may prove a valuable clue. But there's only one way to track it down. Uh, what do you mean, Mr. Barlow? To get a picture of him when he doesn't know he's being photographed, Mr. Seering. Now, if I had such a picture... I could telephoto it back to Chief Riley in New York, and he could compare it with those in the rogues gallery of our secret police files. How interesting. Golly, Clint, why didn't we think of that before? Because we'd only been able to talk to the octopus face to face recently. It is going to be difficult to obtain such a photograph, Mr. Barlow, since the octopus asked us not to visit his castle for a few weeks because of his newest experiment. Yeah, that's true, Dawa. And if we should call in spite of that warning, his suspicions would be aroused. Would they not be aroused if he saw you with a camera, Mr. Barlow? He wouldn't see it. Our cameras are so small that they can be worn under a coat or vest without making it bulge. The lens takes the place of one of the buttons. Remarkable. Yes, it's often enabled us to take pictures that we never would have gotten otherwise. And now, our main problem, however, is to visit Paul Mounier as soon as possible, without seeming to go against his wishes. Yeah, what are you frowning about, Speed? Huh? Oh, nothing, Barney. I was just thinking. Well, don't. Every time you think, we run into a mess of trouble. If we could just get that picture, I think we might give the octopus plenty of trouble, Barney. And right now, I'd like to know what he's up to. Especially what he's thinking when he goes to Mr. Searing's house in Lhasa and finds that he and his son have gone to their country home with the secret police. He will suspect nothing, Mr. Barlow. We left word with Chut, the servant, to say that you had been invited here to celebrate the day of the picnic, the incense of the whole world. You don't know that guy yet, kid. If he knows we're here with you all, it won't be incense he'll smell, but trouble. Yes, sir, Dawa. He'll smell trouble. OC21 calling OC40. OC21 calling OC40. Come in, Kwan Wu. Yes, Master. I am ready. I am standing by. Good. Listen carefully. I am not sure, but I suspect that the secret police have enlisted the aid of Tsi Ring. What? They were with him last night when I called. I left saying that I would return today. I've just left Tsi Ring's home. His servant informs me that his master and the secret police have gone to the country home to celebrate some sort of Tibetan picnic day. That may be true. Never. 
Clint Barlow is not the sort to waste his time at picnics when there is work to be done. I am returning to the castle immediately. But it will take a while to drive. They'll be on your guard constantly. Do you expect an attack? I happen to know that Sea Ring's country home commands a view of the pass of the Iron Dagger. Consequently, I expect anything. Were there any slaves brought in last night? Yes, master. Fifty-two. They are in the room below. How are they behaving? They do not completely understand their fate as yet. Being peasants, they are stupid. So long as they are fed well and warm, they are reasonably content. Good. Once they are shivering in the Himalayas, they may howl to their heart's content. But now, even though the walls of those rooms are soundproof, the slaves must be kept quiet. You understand, Kwan Wu? Use any means to keep them quiet. I understand, Master. Where are you now? I have driven to the outskirts of Lhasa. I dared not talk over the short wave in the city, lest someone might notice and wonder. This has been my first opportunity to warn you of the close proximity of the secret police. You uh, have seen no one? No, Master. No one but the slaves that were brought in last night. They came in through the secret passage? Yes, but the night was so dark that they could have been brought up the foot trail and no one could have seen them. No matter how black the night, they must always come in the secret way. But I shall be at the castle myself tonight to uh, welcome the new slaves. I shall await your coming with pleasure, Master. This castle is a gloomy, lonely place. Very well. Be on your guard until I get there, Kwan Wu. I shall start immediately. Oh, this is sure a swell dog of yours, Dawa. What's his name? He is called Campo. That means luck or lucky. Yeah? Uh, he was given me by a shepherd of ours when he was just a few days old. <laughs> Had he been left with them, he would probably be very savage by now. These hounds not only fight off intruders from the flocks, but wild animals as well. They must be savage. Well, he looks wild enough, so big and black. He's gentle as can be. Until danger threatens. Then he reverts to type. Uh-huh. Say, Dawa. Uh, yes, Speed? You said your father has lots of sheep and yaws grazing around on his land? Oh, yes. Many large herds between here and the pass of the Iron Dagger. Uh, here, use these field glasses. You can see them plainly. Thanks. Boy, I'll say he has plenty. Uh-oh, there goes an automobile. Why, so it is. That is unusual on that road leading to the pass. Who's in the car? Now, wait a minute. Now I can see... It's Paul Mounier, the octopus. By this time, he knows we've left Lhasa. I wonder if he's angry. He's driving awful fast. Say, do you think I could borrow some of your father's sheep, Dawa? Borrow sheep? Why, yes, Speed, but why? Well, I've been thinking. We haven't got a chance of getting a picture of the octopus for quite a while if we wait like he wants us to. But if I could get up there to his castle without him knowing it was me, I bet I could snap plenty of pictures without him knowing anything about it. Oh, but that is impossible. He would recognize you, Speed. You would be in great danger. He wouldn't know me because I'd be disguised as a shepherd. Those sheep would put the idea over, and maybe you'd let me borrow Kampo, too. If he's a sheepdog... You could disguise yourself as a Tibetan? Sure, I've done it before and fooled him. I'd change the disguise on my face this time, but everything else would be the same. I've got the right clothes, and that camera of Clint's would fit under the yaw skin vest just fine. Oh, but your uncle, he would not allow you to go to the pass of the Iron Dagger alone. No, not if he knew about it. You mean, you will tell him nothing of your plan? Yeah, that's right. I don't like to do it that way, but I'd never get the first base if I told him. Will you help me, Dawa? It's important that we get that picture. It may clear up the whole case. I'll help you, Speed. And more. What do you mean, more? Two shepherds are going to the pass with their flock of sheep. I'm going with you.
Reed Gibson of the International Secret Police. Suspecting that the octopus is up to something, Speed, Clint, and Barney go to the country home of La Chaux-Tsi Ring, supposedly for a Tibetan picnic celebration, but in reality to keep a close watch on the pass of the Iron Dagger. Clint is struck by something familiar in the appearance of the octopus in spite of his Paul Mounier disguise and tries to find some excuse for going to his castle to take a photograph of him without his knowing it. Since Mounier has asked them not to call for several weeks, it looks hopeless. Meantime, Speed decides to get the picture himself by disguising as a Tibetan shepherd boy again. He asks Dawa's help, and the Tibetan boy not only agrees to help him, but to go with him. Slipping away while Clint and Barney are in conference with La Sho, the boys disguise themselves and, with the dog Kampo and some sheep, make their way to the dangerous pass. We find them at the top of the narrow foot trail. Boy, it's a steep climb, isn't it, Dawa? Yes, Speed. And these stubborn sheep have made it even more difficult. But at least the climb is over. Now, where shall we go? Well, there's Paul Mounier's house up ahead. Yes, I see. Gloomy-looking place. A fit den for an octopus, I should say. Shh. Better not even mention that name here, Dalwa. Someone might hear us. Of course. I'm sorry. Now, in back of the house is a large field. I think that'd be a good place to park the sheep. If we really were shepherds, I think we'd take them there... Then while they're grazing, we can sort of get the lay of the land. Yes. Campo will take care of the sheep. You need not worry about that. Uh, let us go there now. Oh, oh, sh- Campo, keep quiet. He senses danger. Look, Speed. That man ahead, standing by those rocks. Golly, he's got a gun. Must be a guard or something. Now we're in for it. What shall we do? Nothing to do but go ahead. And when we pass him, Stair likely was wondering what he was doing with that gun. Oh, 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 oh. Excellent. Oh. That would be the natural thing, were we truly peasants. If he asks any questions, Dawa, you'll have to do the talking because I don't know your language at all. The man appears to be Chinese, Speed, so I shall not address him in Tibetan, but in broken English, as a shepherd might use. Swell. Let's get going, then. I'm playing dumb, so it's up to you to talk to him and letting us go by. I do my best. Namsa! Namsa! Make haste, foolish sheep! That fellow's watching us like a hawk. I think I'll whistle like we don't expect any trouble at all. Excellent. Namsa! Namsa! Face in miserable sheep. So you eat green grass before night falls. Else, male parents, beat me. All the fun. Peace, Campo. All is well. Where are you taking your sheep? I know not, honored one. They taking us. We but follow. They smell green grass. Behold... My miserable sheep, starving. Bah, they look hot enough to me. You cannot trespass on this property. You must halt. We have halted, O oh honorable one. But sheep not understand your command. They listen only to a voice of stomach, which tells them they hungry. Uh, stop that whistling. Uh, well, can you not speak? Alas, he cannot, honorable one. Evil spirits have taken his speech. Uh. We come from most unhappy family. We must tend miserable sheep. And if they not fatten, our honorable male parent beat us and give us no barley or tea. Uh, I have no interest in your cursed family. But you cannot remain here with your sheep. This is the house of the great Paul Monnier. He cannot delve into the mysteries of science with the bleating of sheep deafening his ears. Please, honored one... Have patience with us. Behold, our sheep have gone ahead, have already reached sweet grass that grows in field near Great House. It's difficult to drive them away until they have eaten their fill. 
Sheep, stubborn animals. Oh, very well. I cannot waste time arguing with children and sheep. Your animals may graze for an hour, but no longer. Remember that. Only an hour or you shall receive two beatings. One from your father and one from me. Thanks. A thousand thanks, learned sir. May you be forever protected from eight demons of country. Ah, ah, you superstitious Tibetans. Be off with you. And remember, only for an hour. <laughs> boy, oh boy, Dawa. You can sure tell some stories when you get started. By the way, why did you stick your tongue out at the guard when he started talking to us? I thought we were goners for sure when you did. Why, the more rumble classes in Tibet always stick out their tongues before addressing their better speed. I thought he might know of the custom, and it would seem strange if I did not follow it. <laughs> Tibet is a funny country. If I stuck out my tongue at Clint before talking to him, I'd be in for plenty of trouble. Is that so? <laughs> you will probably see many more things that are strange to you, Speed. Beggars, for instance, in addition to sticking out their tongues, also put up two thumbs when asking for arms. <laughs> they do. They'd be asking for an automobile ride if they did that in America. They would. Now, I call that strange. Well, I guess it all depends on where you live in the world. Well, here we are at the field. The sheep are grazing okay with Compo watching them. And I think we're out of sight of the guard. Yes, sir. What next, then? I'm going to snap a picture of the back of the house. Can't tell. It might help out in some way. Then I'm going to go toward that open window over there in the corner. You mean you will attempt to enter the house by that window? Yeah. Speed. I am suddenly fearful for you. There is an atmosphere about this lonely castle that is terrifying. Moreover, I do not like the weather. You don't? I was just thinking it was swell. There's no wind at all. That is the trouble. It is well past the hour of the winds. And yet, the air is still. In Tibet, that means danger. Danger of what? A terrible storm, or a cloudburst, or a hailstorm. In either case... I should not like to be caught in the pass of the Iron Dagger. Say, if that's the case, me either. But the sky's clear. There's not a cloud in sight. I have told you of the dangerous weather of this pass. When the wind does come, it will drive black clouds before it that, when they hit the warmer air of the valley, will tear apart and loose their fury over the pass. Golly, I'll make it snappy then, Dawa. If I don't get my picture inside a half an hour, I'll come on out and we'll leave. But I am coming with you, Speed. I cannot allow you to enter that house alone. No. You've got to stay out here and watch, Dawa. If you see any sign of danger, give me a signal. Signal? What sort? What's that you said to your sheep when you wanted them to hurry? You mean, uh, Namsa? Yeah, that's it. Call that out. Only call it real loud so as I can hear you from inside the house. I understand. Oh, wait, Speed. There is the guard again. He's going inside the house. Yeah. I wonder why. Speed, do not go on with your plan. Let us return to the home of my honored male parent. Should anything go wrong, no one would know what had happened to us. You left no word for your uncle. I know, Dawa, but don't worry. Nothing's going to happen to us. Just you stay here and watch, and I'll be back before you know it with a picture of the octopus. Just you wait and see, Dawa. <laughs> The slaves are beginning to be fearful. Master! Master! <laughs> yes, Kwanu? What is that guard doing with you? He should be outside the castle, not here with the prisoners. He brings news, Master. Two shepherds have brought their sheep to graze on the landing field. What? They are but boys, Master. They can do no harm, and I told them they must be away in an hour. They can do no harm? I could send you to the torture room for this? Oh, no, no. Have mercy. Fools deserve no mercy. Why did you allow these shepherds to pass in the first place? The sheep went ahead before I could stop them. I could not desert my post to chase them. You deserted your post to come inside the castle. Oh, my throat was parched. I craved water. What shall I do, master? Order the shepherds away? No, that might arouse suspicion. Since the slaves are here in the house, I cannot risk rousing the anger of the shepherds. I would need good reason to drive them away. What shall we do then? Leave them alone? For the time being. But... You say they are boys? Yes, master. Ah, I think I will go upstairs and see them for myself. Perhaps they are not exactly what they seem. In which case, uh, <laughs> our Tibetan shepherd boys will never leave the castle. I 
I'll uh, show you the camera I was telling you about, Mr. Steering. I think you'll be interested in it. Assuredly, uh, Mr. Barlow. Say, Clint, wonder what's happened to Speed and Dawa. Haven't seen hide or hair of them for a long time. Oh, Dawa is probably showing Speed over the grounds, Barney. Yeah, let me see now. Where did I leave that camera? Last I saw it was in its case in your makeup kit. Oh, yes, that's right. You you use a great deal of makeup in your work, do you not? <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, here we are. What? Well, somebody's been in this case. Some of the makeup is missing. Uh, uh huh? And look, Barney, the camera case is empty. Good heavens, Mr. Barlow, you you don't think you have been robbed? No, they they wouldn't have taken the camera and makeup in that case. The the camera. Speed heard me talking about getting a picture of the octopus to telephone it to Chief Riley. Clint, you don't think the kid decided to tackle the job of getting it alone? I don't dare think until we know more, Barney. But we've got to find those boys. Well, come. Let us step out on the porch again, gentlemen. There is an enormous shell there that I blow to summon my shepherds. The sound carries a long way. Good. Let's get out there quickly. That crazy kid. You think he'd do such a thing, Clint? Well, he's done similar things before, Barney. Here. Here is the shell. Okay, give it all you got, Mr. Searing. Not a sound. Strange. Thou I would answer immediately if he heard that. He won't answer, Searing, because he's gone to the pass of the Iron Dagger with speed. What? Suffering wangdoodles. If the octopus sees those kids, he'll know them, disguise or no disguise. Exactly. Come on. We've got to get up to that castle before he sees them. We have a minute to lose. Of the International Secret Police. Accompanied by Da Wa, son of Tsi Ring, Speed has disguised himself as a Tibetan shepherd boy, secreted a tiny camera under his yaskin jacket, and gone to the headquarters of the octopus to snap a picture of the criminal, since Clint expressed the need of one to telephone it to Chief Riley. Clint knows nothing of his nephew's plan until the boys and the camera are found to be missing. Guessing what has happened, Clint, Barney, and La Chaute Ring start for the pass of the Iron Dagger in the face of a gathering storm. Step on it, Clint. For all we know, Speed and Dawa might be facing the octopus right this minute. Oh, relax, Barney. I'm driving as fast as this road will permit. If we have an accident, we won't be able to help the boys at all. True, Mr. Barlow. Besides, it may be that the octopus, or Paul Mounier as I know him, may still be in Lhasa. Don't think so, Mr. Searing. He said he was going to call on you today, you know. And once he knows you're out of town, he'll beat it back to his castle. But he would not dare hurt the boy. It all depends on what they're up to. If 
If he catches speed with that camera, there's no telling what he'll do. Well, we'll soon be there. That's some. I hope we get there before the storm breaks. You mean them little clouds popping up over the pass are going to make a storm? Yes, Mr. Dunlop. And the lack of wind this afternoon foretells a very bad storm. Oh, even the weather's against us. Yes. The pass of the Iron Dagger is known to be a cauldron that brews ugly weather. Well, the worse the storm, the better for us, perhaps. What do you mean? Well, don't you see, Barney? If we break in on the octopus now, it will arouse his suspicions. If by chance he hasn't discovered the boys yet... But with a storm at our heels, we can say that we were out for a drive. We were near the pass when the storm suddenly came up and decided to seek shelter in his castle. Excellent, Mr. Barlow. Yeah, if he believes it. But if he don't, I'll take the storm outside compared to the storm inside the castle. Here, Martha. You can see the young shepherds from this window. Very well. But you had better keep out of sight, Kwan Wu. One of these shepherds may know you. I do not understand. You will, later. Hmm, it looks innocent enough. The sheep, the hound, but there is only one shepherd boy. The other must be near. Perhaps he has sought shelter from this wind. It is bitter cold. Yes, those shepherds will have a taste of a hailstorm before they leave the pass. But where is that other one? I see no sight of him. And this window commands the whole landing field. Thunder. Is there danger from these storms? Will the lightning strike this path? Would this castle have stood here for so long if lightning often struck here, Kwan Wu? The danger from these storms, I understand, is from the large hailstones. But let me tell you, I think there is more danger in this house right now than any storm could bring. Danger here, Master? Why? I think that one of those shepherds is Speed Gibbs. What? But why would he come here to spy upon you? He knows that has gained nothing in the past. I do not know why he has come. But perhaps we can find out if we can find him. By the dragon, we must find him. If he is in the castle and should come upon those slaves below, we are lost. Exactly. But I wonder if it is best to go in search of him or wait for him to come to me. Master, that other boy appears to be keeping watch outside. I have noticed that. Wait. Wait, I have it, I have it. <laughs> what do you mean? Send word to the guard to bring the other boy here to my laboratory. Is that not dangerous? Not at all. And if he is keeping watch, he will attempt to give an alarm when the guard approaches him. That will draw Speed Gibson from wherever he is hiding. Master, you are very clever. I know human nature, Kwan Wu. Now give those orders to the guard, then hide yourself behind those drapes. Speed Gibson must not see you. You understand, Kwan Wu? It's cold in this old castle. That wind's bad. I'd better hurry and get that picture, or else I'll have to give it up. Dawa said once the wind came, the storm would soon follow. Near as I can figure out, I'm heading for the laboratory, and that's where the octopus probably is. Gosh, it's getting dark. There'll be enough light in the lab to take a picture. Hmm, here's another door. Must be close to the lab now, near as I can remember its location. Glad I brought my flashlight along or I'd be falling over the furniture. Looks kind of spooky covered with those white sheets like it is. Namza! Namza! Hey, that's Star Wall giving the danger signal. Namza! They've got him! Somebody's got him! I gotta help him! Golly, the storm's breaking, too. Those poor sheep and us, we're in a mess for sure. Oh! Why, what does this mean? Paul Mounier. You know me? Uh, yes, I mean, no. I've heard of you. Come in, come in, boy. Don't stand staring there in the doorway and shut the door, too. How is it that you speak English? I did not know that Tibetan shepherds were so well educated. Uh, yes. Ah, that tells me very little. Do not be afraid, boy. Who and uh, what are you? Where, where's the other shepherd? You answer my question by asking another. Where is he? Do not worry. He'll be here shortly. You see, I was curious as to why you brought your sheep to my meadow. There are grazing grounds in the valley, much easier to reach, I should think. Your grass is better. How did you know? 
I do not recall seeing you around here before. My my father told me about the meadow. He's been here. So? And do you not know that I am busy with important work? That I came to this isolated past so that I would not be disturbed by uh, curious intruders? We weren't curious. We were just grazing our sheep. When you knew a storm was in the offing? At least, real shepherds would know that. I, well... Here is the other shepherd. Let go of me! This cussed dog would have bitten me had I not struck him down with my gun. Speed, Speed, I tried to give the alarm and this beast hurt Campo. For all I know, he may be lying out there dead. Well, don't worry, Darwa. You're safe. That's the main thing. We'll go see about Campo in a minute. What shall I do with them, master? Put them below with the others? Others? The guard means my other servants. That will be all, guard. Get back to your post. But, master, the wind, it is rising. It grows more cold. Rain is already falling. And with this cold... It will turn into hail. No man can live through a hailstorm without some sort of protection. Back to your post, I say, and see that I am not disturbed again. Uh, yes, master. I obey. Well, I guess we'd better go, Mr. Mounier. If we want to get out of the pass before the hail comes, we'd have to hurry. Yes, and we must first gather the sheep. The storm is scattered. One moment, my young friends. It is too late for you to leave my castle. Well, what do you mean? The hail will come at any moment. You heard what the guard said. It is impossible to live through it. Oh, don't worry about us. But I do worry. I would not think of turning you out in such weather. Even if you are only shepherds. Huh? But you heard what Darwar called me, didn't you, Mr. Mounier? I'm Speed Gibson of the secret police. (laughs) You expect me to believe that? You mean you don't? Of course not. I do not know how it is that the Tibetan shepherd speaks English, but I do know you are not Speed Gibson. You look nothing like him. But I'm disguised, and so is Darwa here. That is true, Mr. Mounier. Remember, I met you only yesterday evening at the city house of my honored male parent, La Shotzi Ring. You have the audacity to pretend you are the son of La Shotzi Ring, my boy? It happens to be the truth. Oh, come now. You cannot expect me to believe that. Supposing your story were true. Last evening, I distinctly remember saying before Speed Gibson and Dawa Tsiring that I would be unable to entertain visitors for several weeks to come, since I was in the midst of an important scientific experiment. Now, two such intelligent boys as Speed and Dawa would have known better than to come here the very next day. No, no, I cannot believe your story. You're lying. We are not, sir. I have never told an untruth in my life. Honest, Mr. Mounier, we are who we say we are. Granting that you are for the moment, why did you come to my castle? To spy on me? Why, we we came to find out about the story of the Iron Dagger. What? Yeah. Don't you remember telling me about the Tibetan legend that says an old Iron Dagger is stuck in some rock in the past? I thought maybe we could find it by hunting around. In disguise? Well, after what you said last night... I thought you might get sore if you saw us in your backyard, so I thought that... <laughs> and this iron dagger you mentioned, did you think you would find it in my house? Your house? Yes. You gained entrance without my knowledge. You would still be roaming about without my knowledge had I not ordered my guard to bring this uh, other boy to me for questioning. I'm sorry, Speed. I should never have given the alarm. <laughs> of course you should, Dalwar. Now, you listen to me, Art. I mean, Mr. Mounier... If you don't believe us, my uncle could identify us. Get in touch with him. How? I have no means of communication with Lhasa. The hail has come. Yes. And I think that you came here to spy on me and to rob me. Yours shall be the fate of thieves. What do you mean? What are you going to do with us? I'm going to turn you out in the hailstorm, my boy. If you wish to search for the Iron Dagger, you will have plenty of opportunity now. No, no, you cannot do that, Mr. Mounier. It would mean death. You came here without my permission. You shall go by my order. I shall show your countrymen that the word of Paul Meunier is not to be trifled with. You'll get into plenty of trouble over this. Wait and see. How? When your bodies are found broken and beaten to the ground by the hail, I shall know nothing about it. Two shepherds, foolish enough to dare the wrath of the elements in the past of the Iron Dagger, paying for their foolishness with their lives. Too bad, but it is not my fault. You can't get away with this. Just you wait and see. My uncle will tear this place apart if anything happens to us. Uh, your uncle, if you have one, is far away. Now come, come to the door with me. Let go. Let, Let go, go my uncle. Let go. Let go. <laughs> you see, you can do nothing. Here is the door. Another minute and you will be outside. Okay. Let us in. Open up. Yes, step on it. 
These hailstones are putting dents in my dome. Quit it, Barney! Now, Mr. Mounier, we'll find out if I'm telling the truth. the International Secret Police. Speed and Dawa go to the octopus castle to take his picture unknown to him. They are captured and brought before the criminal for questioning. In spite of their disguise, the octopus knows their identity but pretends to disbelieve Speed when he admits who he is. Under cloak of this pretense, the octopus says that he will punish them by sending them out into the hailstorm which has just broken over the pass. Since this means injury and possible death, the boys plead for mercy, but it does no good and they're about to be thrown out into the storm when Clint... Barney and La Chotzi Ring arrive. We find them all in the laboratory while the storm howls outside. Golly, Clint. We sure came in the nick of time. Mr. Mugnay thought we were really Tibetan shepherds. Come to steal something from him. He was going to put us out in the storm. But isn't such punishment a trifle severe, Mr. Mugnay? Mr. Barlow, I still feel that you do not comprehend my earnest desire for complete privacy. I must have it if I must resort to stern measures to keep it. Now... And in the future. The Tibetan law might stop you in some things. Then you'd have all the privacy you wanted in jail. Now, Barney. Well, how does he get that way? Kicking kids out in this weather. I just got a few hailstones bounced off my bean, and that's all I wanted. Yes. Surely, Mr. Mounier, you must realize the strength of our storm. Allow me to reassure you, Mr. Tearing. I had no idea that they had the strength to uh, kill. Why, you did. You said so. Oh, you... wait a minute, Speed. Yeah? I think you better stay out of this. After all, you were trespassing on Mr. Mounier's property, from what I can make of this whole thing. But we meant no harm, Mr. Barlow. It was more of, of an adventure for us. There was no need for all this near tragedy. No need for the guard to strike down my dog, my campo, when he sought to protect me from his approach. You never should have left our home without telling me, Dawa. I realize that now, only too well, honored male parent. Had Mr. Mounier been successful in his idea of fit punishment for us, you probably never would have known the true reason for our end. I fear that our young friends are given to exaggeration. Uh, by the way, Mr. Barlow, how is it that you happened to arrive when you did? Uh, we were out for a drive. As you may know, Mr. Tsering's land extends even as far as the Pass of the Iron Dagger. Well, we were at the entrance of the pass when the storm clouds suddenly gathered. Searing, knowing the intensity of these storms, suggested seeking shelter here, since we had no time to return to his home. I, uh, I understand. Well, since you are here, you may as well make yourselves comfortable. Perhaps the boys would like to remove those heavy coats they are wearing. Yeah, no. Uh, I'm still kind of cold from that scare we had. Aren't you, Dawa? Uh, yes, I believe I am. 
But one thing I must do is to see about Campo. Can I see him from these windows, Mr. Monier? Uh, you should be able to. Try this one. Uh, you can see the whole meadow from here. Oh, then you must have seen us all the time. Yes, at least I saw Dawa. You had entered the house by the time I noticed that my meadow was uh, inhabited. Uh, yeah. Look at the poor sheep, Speed. All huddled against those rocks. But at least they're out of the storm. And Speed, look! Just on the other side of the sheep. Campo! It's Campo and he's all right. Yes. Oh, the blessing of heaven upon those rocks that shelter the animals from the cruel hail. Say, looks like the storm's letting up a little. Yes. These storms go as quickly as they come. Hey, do you think we can leave before dark, Mr. Thiering? Oh, yes, Mr. Barlow. Good. For a while, I thought we'd have to ask Mr. Mounier for shelter for the entire night. I uh, should be on them. Even if the storm abates, I would invite you to be my guests, were it not yeah, for the Yeah, yeah, yeah. I... Were it not for your important experiment, I know. Well, don't worry, Mounier. We'll be only too glad to get back to Tsee Ring's country house. The air's healthier around there. I'm glad that you realize that, Mr. Dunlap. The pass has an evil reputation. Yeah, in more ways than one. Mr. Tsiring, your servant at your home in Lhasa told me that you came to the country house to celebrate uh, a picnic day. Yes. It is called the incense of the whole world. Charming. Perhaps, uh, should I find the time, I may join you in your celebration. We would be happy indeed to be honored by your presence, Mr. Mounier. The actual day is tomorrow, but the celebration will last three days. Thank you. Well, storm's over. Better be getting back down the trail. Yeah, but how are we going to get them sheep in the cars beyond me? Well, we can drive them back to the shepherd we got them from, Barney. He's not far from the mouth of the pass. Nothing doing, kid. You've been driving us crazy enough without adding sheep to the mix-up. Come on, let's get out of here before you dig up some other animals to take along. Now that uh, we're safe once more and you're out of your disguise, Speed... Just what did you mean by going to the Pass of the Iron Dagger without my permission? Well, gee, Clint, I knew you wanted a picture of the octopus to tell a photo to Chief Riley. And I thought I'd be able to get it sooner than you would if I went up there in disguise. I never thought he'd catch me. No, no, that's your main fault, Speed. You leap into situations without thinking of the results. By doing what you did, you not only risked your life and our was, but jeopardized the position of the secret police. The octopus must think that he has us fooled. But he won't if you continue these crazy ideas. I'll say not. After all, Clint and me have had years in the service, Speed. We ought to know a little more about what to do than you. I'm sorry, fellas. And so am I. Oh, you're not to blame, Dawa. Speed should have known better. He's had experience with the octopus before, and you haven't. I have now, sir. I shall never forget that murderous look in his eyes when he attempted to drive us out into the storm. And would have done it if we hadn't timed our arrival so perfect. Lucky we discovered the camera was missing when we did. Is that how you knew where we were? Clint knew in a minute. He knows how that brain of yours works by this time. But we have more proof than ever that Munier's the octopus, fellas. Because anybody else would have believed me when I said I was Speed Gibson and that this was Da Wall. He disbelieved you purposely, all right. Thought that would be a good way of getting rid of you permanently without shouldering any of the blame. Oh, yes, Mr. Barlow. He said as much himself. Uh, what? Yes. He said that should Speed's story be true, and should he have an uncle... If our bodies were found on the trail, bruised and beaten by the hail, no one could possibly place the blame on him. The dirty dog. What can we do to stop this criminal? Well, it's just the trouble, Mr. Searing. We can't do a thing right now, except watch and wait. Speed's little adventure has set us back a few more weeks. No, it hasn't, Clint. I got the octopus picture. Six of them, in fact. You... You what? Sure. I had plenty of chance to snap him while he was talking to Dawa and me. Speed... I had no idea that you were taking his picture. Neither did he. I got proof files, full face, and three-quarter face. I was so scared that I could hardly work the camera, but I did all right. Now you've got your pictures to tell a photo to Chief Riley, Clint. Well, Speed, well, what can I say? That... I've said it before, and I'll say it again. You and me might as well turn in our badges, Clint. The kid's doing all the work. It is amazing to think that Speed would have the courage to take those pictures... Even when he was in such terrible danger. Well, that's the trouble, Mr. Searing. Speed has too much courage. It's going to get him into a lot of trouble someday. But meanwhile, Speed, for those pictures, uh, I want to thank you, boy. Golly, you bet, Clint. I'm glad I had the chance to snap him. <laughs> boy, oh boy. I wish I could see the look on the octopus' face if he knew we had some snaps of his mug. <laughs> well, he's not going to know it if we can help it. Let's see now. Where can I telephone to those pictures from? From Lhasa, Mr. Barlow. Well... Why, is that possible? Oh, yes. 
That is one of the modern improvements that has come even to the holy city. Swell. It's liable to save Tibet a lot of trouble. I hope so, my friend. Well, I'll take it in the first thing in the morning. And we should have a reply from Chief Riley by the end of the three-day picnic celebration. Gosh, if those pictures match up with one of a known criminal in our rogues gallery, then we can arrest the octopus right away. Yes, Reed. And I'm proud of you, fella. Even if you did disobey me. I'm mighty proud of you. Master, the new slaves are being brought in. Do you wish to watch their arrival? No. You are disturbed over something. Yes, Kwan And as usual, it has to do with the secret police. There is something going on under their smiles and pretended friendship. Nothing that can harm you? I'm not so sure of that. Why did Speed Gibson come here this afternoon? Too bad his uncle came when he did. Else we never would have been bothered by that boy again. But he did come. Obviously to rescue Speed. That other story of his was probably false. If that were the case then the boy must have come here without Barlow's knowledge. That means he's up to something more than merely spying on me. But what? Do you think he could know something of the raids our men are making on the villages and farms? Of the slaves hidden away below? No. If he knew that, then Barlow and Dunlap would know it. And they would have an excellent reason to bring me before the Tibetan authorities. I trembled while they were in the laboratory. I feared that they might discover the secret of the lower room. That danger is secondary, Kwan Wu, but we shall run no risk. How many slaves are coming in tonight? I cannot tell exactly, but 100 have already been brought in. Hmm. And the night is still young. That means many more will come. Wu, tomorrow I want you to begin preparing the slaves for the transfer. Give them extra heavy doses of the vapors of sleep. Place them in sacks. Master, you mean they are to start for the meeting place at the foot of the Hamalyas? Yes. We cannot risk being overcrowded here. Should we be raided, I want to be able to uh, do away with the slaves so that no trace of them can be found. Drop them down the shaft of death? The one below the torture chamber? <laughs> yes. Once they drop into that black end, so far as we know, bottomless hole, they are lost forever to the world. But we shall use that only in case of emergency. I would rather sell my slaves in India than destroy them. Of course. I shall follow your commands, master. The work shall go forward at dawn. The facts can be carried down the foot rail and placed in the cart I shall order. And no one will question their contents, since each sack will be plainly marked scrap goods. No one will want to investigate them, not even the secret police. You say I should take charge of all this? Where are you going to be? Kwan Wu, tomorrow I'm going to the country home of La Shou Tsiring. We shall celebrate a picnic day, the incense of the whole world. And I shall spoil whatever plan Speed Gibson, Barlow, and Dunlap are up to. You depend upon that. of the International Secret Police.
Speed Gibson has obtained candid camera photographs of the octopus in his disguise as Paul Mounier at great personal risk to himself and Dawa. In fact, Clint and Barney arrived at the criminal's castle just in time to rescue the boys since the octopus purposely refused to believe their statements as to their true identities and was about to punish them as thieving shepherds. Now, back at La Chaute Ring's country home, Clint and his host prepare to go to Lhasa to telephoto the pictures to Chief Riley, not knowing that the octopus, suspecting trouble, plans to visit the house that morning. The boys have just finished breakfast, and for a change, everything looks bright for them. Oh, gee, it's a swell day. Perfect for the picnic, Dawa. Yes, Speed. Somehow we always have excellent weather for our day, the incense of the whole world. You know, it is a day of gratitude and thanksgiving. And nature seems to share in our happiness. Yep, it's a swell day for murder. Murder? <laughs> oh, that's just one of Barney's pet sayings, Dawa. But uh, I do not understand. Have you ever murdered anyone, Mr. Dunlap? Yeah, who, me? Of course not. Well, then, uh, why would the weather affect a murder? Well, you see, I... Uh... Oh, let it go. I promise never to say it again. <laughs> well, what's the joke, Speed? <laughs> oh, Barney was trying to explain something, and he couldn't. Oh, see, that's nothing new. Well, we're going to leave for Lhasa now. We'll be back inside of two hours. We? Oui. Am I going along? No, there's no need, Barney. Mr. Z. Ring has kindly consented to come along, so there won't be any delay in getting that telephoto of the octopus off to New York. Oh, here he comes now. Are you... You ready, Mr. Marlowe? Yes, thanks, Mr. Z. Ring. We can leave any time. I have the pictures I want to send here. Excellent. I have ordered the car so we can go immediately. Very well. I'll leave you in charge, Barney. And so long. Uh, goodbye. Goodbye, 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 goodbye. 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 Gee, I sure hope Chief Riley makes it snappy looking through the secret police rogues gallery, comparing those pictures I took of the octopus with the known criminals. He'll make it snappy, all right, Speed. But I don't think he's going to find much. Well, why not? I think the octopus is too smart to have ever been mugged. He's not the usual sort of criminal, you know. I got a hunch that he came into the crime racket from some other business entirely. That's why it's almost impossible to nail him. No fingerprints, no jail record that we know of, no nothing. Gosh, I hope you're wrong, Barney. If that proves to be true, Mr. Dunlap, how can you hope to capture this criminal? He'll make his mistake, don't worry. They all do, Dawa. No matter how big they get, just one little slip and down they come. Boom. I see. No, Barney... I've been thinking a lot about Miss Marcia lately. I'd give anything if we could find some track of her. We know she's in Tibet, but where? Yeah, I've been thinking about her too, kid. Ever since she was kidnapped by the octopus, I've been thinking about her. To whom do you refer? Marcia Winfield, Dawa. She was swell. Came over to China's governess to Jean Kingsley. But she really came to try and find her brother who's been missing for three years. He was tied up with the octopus in some way, too. And I guess Miss Marcia got to know too much because she disappeared also. How horrible. And you've never had any word from her? No. We don't even know if she's still alive. But we're not going to give up trying to find her. That's a cinch. I should say not. I'm getting tired of running around to bed on foot and in cars anyhow. My fingers are itching to take the stick in that old plane of ours and send her into the air. Where is your plane, Mr. Dunlap? We left her in Nagchuka, Dawa. And look... Will you call me Barney? This Mr. Dunlap stuff's getting me down. <laughs> it is a great honor, Barney. Well, I don't know about the honor, kid, but it makes me feel better. The plane's no use to us right now, Barney. But the octopus and the pass of the iron dagger not far from here, what good would it do us to fly? I don't know. But I think I'll get back to Nagchuka pretty soon and overhaul the crate. We may need her all of a sudden. You never know where the octopus is going to pop up, even though he's supposed to stay up in the pass. Yes? What is it? Mr. Paul Mounier, calling on your honored male parents, young master. Mounier? Gee, the octopus. Hey, he must know why Clint has gone to Lhasa. No, but we'd better see him or he might go to Lhasa himself and run into Clint sending those pictures. That's right. Have him come in, Dawa. Very well. Bring Mr. Mounier to our presence, please. Yes, young master. Now remember, you kids, treat this guy nice. We've got to until we get the goods on him. You bet. Do not fear, Barney. Mr. Paul Mounier. <laughs> Good morning, my friend. Good morning, Mr. Mounier. I uh, hope that I have not arrived too early. But I was so anxious to see how you celebrated this famous picnic day that I did not want to miss any of it. That is quite all right. Uh, won't you be seated, Mr. Mounier? Thank you. Uh, where is your father, Dawa? And Mr. Barlow? Uh, 
They went to Lhasa, but a short while ago. To Lhasa? But I thought they came here expressly for this picnic day. Uh, so they did. But uh, at the last moment, we found we had no incense. So my honored male parent and Mr. Barlow, thinking it a nice morning for a drive, decided to get the incense themselves rather than send a servant for it. Sure, gotta have incense, you know. The name of this day is the incense of the whole world, and we gotta do our part. I see. Uh, Mr. Barlow seems to take great pleasure in going for drives, does he not? Oh, sure. Clint has always liked riding in automobiles. That is, he likes that next to flying. Hmm. Uh, how do you celebrate this picnic day, Dawa? By giving thanks for our blessings, feasting, and playing games. We have a quieter celebration here than they do in Lhasa, but it is a great day for us. Then I shall await the return of your father and Mr. Barlow with great pleasure. Since the ceremonies naturally will not begin until they arrive, I am also interested to see this incense they went after. Yeah. Boy, I sure hope they don't forget it. Lhasa is certainly a noisy city on a picnic day, Mr. Thiering. Why are those shells being blown? They summon monks and worshippers to the services at the monasteries, Mr. Barlow. This is a religious day as well as a picnic day. And before we leave Lhasa, I should like to visit the Potala Temple and give thanks for all my many blessings. Why, of course, Mr. Thiering. And I have plenty to be thankful for myself. Speed took some dandy pictures of the octopus. Excellent negatives that made good contrast prints. They should be clearly received in New York. Telephoto is indeed a wonderful thing. I am most happy that our portable sending set could aid you. Well, it was the best luck I've had in months, Mr. Searing, having that portable set so close. If it hadn't been possible to send those photos from Lhasa, Barney would probably have had to fly the prints back into China to find a sending set. Very probably. Ah, we, we approach the Putala, my friend. Do you wish to enter the temple with me? Or await my coming at the turquoise roof bridge that leads to it. Well, I'll just wait if you don't mind, Mr. Seering. Those beggars over there sitting in the sun look very interesting. I'd like to watch them while waiting for you. Very well. I shall not be long. Wait on the turquoise roof bridge. Turquoise roof bridge. Well, that's a beautiful name. Great mercy, learned sir. A little present for me, please. Uh, huh? Oh. Oh, oh I, I didn't see you sitting there in the shadow. I almost stepped on you. That is why I spoke when I did. Have you a little present for me, learned sir? Uh, a present? Oh, you mean money? Yes. You are most wise. <laughs> and your tongue is most smooth, my friend. You're a diplomat in the rags of a beggar. I am not a beggar, my friend, but a llama. Uh, a llama? A holy man? Yes. Clint. Barlow. Were you? How do you know me? I've never seen you before. And I have never seen you. But we holy men of Tibet have other ways of knowing. I bring you a message. From whom? From Marsha Winfield. Marsha? Where is she? Where did you see her? Peace, my friend. I shall tell you all. The young lady is held prisoner in a hut near the lake Tangrenor. Tangrenor? To the north of here? Yes. I passed there a month ago. I saw Miss Winfield and heard her story. I just arrived here this morning. I knew you would come here to the turquoise roof bridge. But how did you know? Never mind that. I have delivered the message. And one more thing. Take a parcel of incense back to the home of La Ring. Incense? What has that got to do with the case? You will soon discover. But do not forget. Here comes Clint now. Excellent. I shall be most happy to see him. What's that he's carrying? We shall soon find out, Barney. Well, we're back again. And have I got news? Say... Uh... Oh. Good morning, Mr. Mounier. Good morning, Mr. Barlow. As you see, I came to help celebrate this great Tibetan holiday. Uh, yes, uh, I see. I trust you have made our guest comfortable, Dawa? Yes, my honored male parent. To the best of my ability. I was a little surprised to find you absent this morning. But then I was told that you and Mr. Tsering had gone to Lhasa. 
specifically to purchase incense for the holiday. Incense? Now, don't tell me you forgot it. That would be odd, since that alone took them to Lhasa. Uh, yes, it would be strange if I forgot it, wouldn't it? Open the package, Bean. Oh, you sure you want me to, Clint? Well, of course, why not? Well... It's incense! What? Holy smoke. <laughs> Am I glad you didn't forget it, Clint? I never forget, Speed. Well, you seem surprised at my purchase, Mr. Mounier. I, uh... Oh, no, no, not at all. I was merely thinking, Mr. Barlow, I, I must return to the Pass of the Iron Dagger immediately. What? After coming here to help us celebrate? Uh, yes, I, uh... Well, I, I neglected to do something before I left. It uh, completely slipped my mind. And the incense reminded you of it? Why, yes. How did you know? And never mind. I just knew. And now, uh, good morning and goodbye, Mr. Mounier. The International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. goes to La Chaudzi Ring's country home hoping to discover what the secret police are up to. Meanwhile, Clint and his host have gone to Laza to tell a photo of the pictures of the criminal to Chief Riley in New York. Dawa explains their absence by saying they have gone for incense to celebrate the picnic day and the octopus waits to see if the story is true. In Laza, Clint is accosted by a holy man on the turquoise roof bridge who tells him that Marsha Winfield is held prisoner at Lake Tengrinor. He also advises Clint to purchase some incense before returning home. Barlow does not understand why until he returns to find the octopus awaiting him. After his arrival, the arch-criminal hurriedly leaves, and now we find the boys discussing the mysterious message Clint received through the holy man. And that's the whole story, boys. The llama, or holy man, called me by name and told me where Marsha was. Why, it's the most amazing thing I've ever encountered. Gosh, how could he have known your name, Clint? The Tibetan lamas have many ways of knowing things, Speed. Thought transference is an exact science in this country. This lama probably saw Miss Winfield's mind picture of Clint 
and consequently knew him when he saw him. But, Mr. Thiering, how could he have known I was going to be at the turquoise roof bridge? It would take a great while to explain the mysteries of Asia, Mr. Barlow. Yeah, and right now I want to know more about Marcia. Where is this Tangrenor Lake, anyhow? It is to the northwest of here, Bonnie. An enormous lake. It is, I should say, about a uh, hundred miles away. It seems to me I remember seeing it when we put a Nogchuka from the Tangrenor Mountains. Isn't the lake near that mountain range, Dawa? Yes, it is, Speed. It is also on the edge of Chang Tang area. Chang Tang? Uh, the northern plains, Barney. Uh, here, uh, let me show you on a map. Yeah, that'd help. All this business about Great Fear and Chang Tang don't mean a thing to me. Uh, here's a map. Yeah. Uh, place it so all may see it, Dawa. Uh, yes, honored Neil Tarrant. Uh, now, uh, just where is the lake? Uh, here, Mr. Barlow. It does not appear so large on this map, but I believe it measures some 930 square miles. <laughs> That's a lot of water. Now, the Changtang, or Northern Plains, are indicated uh, here, extending from 80 to 92 east longitude and from 31 to 36 degrees north latitude. They are a tangled mass of plains and valleys, 16,000 and upwards. Golly, that's high. Must be awful cold there, Mr. Searing. It is, Speed. Far too cold for crops and trees. There is enough vegetation on the fringes to take care of their flocks of ya and sheep that belong to the shepherds there. But those poor peasants barely exist. In the inner reaches, brigands await the unwary traveler. Why in heck would anyone want to travel through that sort of country? Necessity rather than choice takes people across the great plains, Mr. Dunlap. Well, the best feature about the Chang Tang that I can see is that it should make a fairly good landing field for our plane. What? You mean we're going to fly up there, Clint? Absolutely. We haven't any time to lose from up that llama told me. Swell. That means I go to Nagchuka, see that the plane is in good condition for the hop, and bring her back here. Yes, Bonnie. I think we'd all better go to Nagchuka and start out from there. I don't want the octopus to know of our absence. If he had the slightest suspicion that we were going after Marsha, her life wouldn't be worth anything. Clint, what if this message from that llama is really another octopus trap? Uh, what? Sure, he's done that before. Maybe we're getting too hot on his trail and he figures the best way to get rid of us is to send us up to Lake Tenguinor where anything could happen to us and nobody'd know the difference. That's right, Speed. It could be blamed on the brigands. Say, I think the kid's got something all right, Clint. Yes, but we've got to find out, Barney. We've got to run that chance for Marsha's sake. How can you leave without your enemy discovering your absence, Mr. Barlow? Well, we all can't go. That's a cinch. We'll have to split the party. Barney and I will fly to Tengrenor, and Speed will stay here with you. Oh, excellent. Gee, I'll have a tough time always explaining where you're supposed to be, Clint. If one of you stayed and I went to Tengrenor, I think it'd be better. No, that won't do it all. No, no, wait, wait just a minute. We aren't leaving right this minute, you know. This is a thing that has to be thought out and discussed. Because we can't afford to make a false move. Very true, Mr. Barlow. And since this is a picnic day, supposing uh, you enjoy our Tibetan ceremonies while you are thinking your plans out. And we shall begin them by burning some of the incense the Lama warned you to bring back with you, Mr. Barlow. Yeah, that reminds me. The kid here said you went to Lhasa just to buy that stuff, and the octopus didn't believe him. He waited here just to show us up. I almost had a fit when you walked in with that. Would that not prove that the message you received from the llama was not a trap set by the octopus, Mr. Barlow? No, Mr. Seedring. The octopus has a genius for such things. But trap or no trap, we'll have to find out for ourselves. Quan Wu. Yes, Master? I have been thinking about the Winfield girl. There is no need for me to hold her as hostage any longer. Evidently, the secret police have given up hope of ever finding her, so I may as well do away with her. And her brother as well? Yes. When they are gone, they cannot talk about me. Very true. Their lips will be sealed forever. I may have kept them alive too long already. Someone may have glimpsed them and wondered at their presence near Tengrinor. No one would recognize them, Master. Their skins have been stained a darker hue. They are dressed in rags. Yes, but I have an uneasy feeling just the same. I'm going to send for one of my planes from the Black Pass, and I want you to fly to Tengrenor and superintend the uh, disposal of the Winfields yourself. I must act. Why not? I cannot go myself with the secret police in the neighborhood. Besides, I must see that the slave traffic continues. That is more important to me than the fate of Marsha Winfield or her brother. Very well. But I do not care for flying. It is a short flight, and I shall send for one of my best aviators. You will leave tomorrow. I do not know just when, since I have not talked to Black Pass over shortwave yet. But I shall let you know the time of your departure as soon as possible. I shall await your commands. 
Meanwhile, how shall we dispose of the Winfields? I do not want any trace of them left. I believe the lake is our answer to that. Wait the bodies well, and then row them out to the middle of the lake. Leave them there. <laughs> and no one will ever find them in the chill depths of Lake Tengrinor. Speed, have you enjoyed our picnic day, the incense of the whole world? Oh, it's been great, Dawa. Only I've been kind of wondering what Clint and Barney have been planning all afternoon with your dad. Do you really want to fly to Tengrenor? Oh, sure. Gee, I'd do anything to rescue Miss Marcia from the octopus. It would be very dangerous. Well, I guess we'd better go inside. Well, that's okay with me. Maybe we can find out what the plans are. You know, I can't keep from thinking about that llama that gave Clint the message from Marcia. How he knew all he did, even to knowing that Clint must bring back that incense. I told you that you would see many things in Tibet that could not be explained by reason, Speed. Yeah, I remember. But that incense business... Oh, it's too much for me. I shouldn't worry about it if I were you. Oh, well, here we are. Is that you, Dawa? Uh, yes, honored male parent. Come here, please, and bring Speed with you. Very well. Sounds like they've finished planning all right. Gosh, I'm excited. So am I, Speed. I only wish that I could go with you. Searing, once we find Marshal Winfield, we have the octopus where we want him. Her evidence will enable us to arrest him. Hi, Clint. Am I going on the flight? Yes, Speed. I am? Oh, swell. Yeah, no, wait just a minute. I'm only allowing you to come along because of necessity. There's no telling how many octopus gangsters are up there guarding her, and it'd be foolish to attempt the rescue alone. So I've decided to leave Barney here to keep an eye on the octopus, and you and I'll make the flight to Tengrinor. Uh, what about Chief Tipo, Mr. Barlow? Could he not help you in this? Well, he can help us plenty after we find Miss Winfield, Dawa. But until then, he can do nothing. Remember, the Tibetan government needs visible proof of the octopus's guilt. True. I had forgotten for the moment. Well, when are we going to start the flight, Clint? Well, that all depends on the condition of the plane, Speed. We'll go to Nagchu Car tonight, you, Barney, and me, and see just how things are. If all goes well, we might be able to take off tomorrow. Hot dog! Yeah, and me grounded. Me who was itching to get in the air again. Oh, don't you worry, old cloud buster. You'll have plenty of chances to fly soon. While you and Speed are at Tengrinor... We shall keep word of your absence from the octopus should he come to visit me again. Yes, and that's where you can help a lot, Dawa. Not long ago, you said you wanted to become a member of the secret police. Well, now here's your chance to break into the work. Oh, thank you, Mr. Barlow. I shall do everything in my power to help you. Yeah, well, don't work too hard at it, kid, or the octopus will get wise to the fact that something's up and make it his business to find out what. Yeah, he has spies all over. There may even be one in this house. I doubt that, Speed. All my servants have been with me years. I trust you. Why, of course you do. Oh, by the way, Mr. Searing, a while ago you mentioned that you might be able to get hold of a portable shortwave radio set. That is true. I purchased one when I obtained the telephoto set. It is in the government building at Lhasa. Uh, it is not in use at present. Well, could you bring it here so that Speed and I could keep in touch with you? Yes. I know that I could. Gee, that'd be swell. Barney could keep us posted on what's happening here. Yeah, if I have time. Things are liable to be happening so fast after you leave that I won't even have time to talk. Oh, say, so, so nothing can stop you from talking, fella. <laughs> <laughs> Barney will have a great deal to talk about while you're gone, Mr. Barlow. I intend asking him many questions about the secret police. Well, you'll probably have him back here by this time tomorrow evening, Darwa. And now, I guess we'd better pack our things, Speed. Because we won't be coming back here until we've made the flight to Tengrinor. Okay, Clint. Won't take me long to pack. You are definitely leaving this evening? Yes, Dawa. We don't want the octopus to notice our departure. We can best do this uh, under cover of dark. Your father has kindly given us the use of his car. And anything else that may aid you, Mr. Barlow? Say, hey, look out of the window in the direction of the pass of the Iron Dagger. Is that fire I see? Fire? Let me see. Uh, here are the field glasses, Barney. Thanks, kid. Hey. That fire's moving down the foot trail from the octopus's castle. Looks like torches. Torches? Now what's he up That's to? That's up to Barney to keep an eye on him, Speed. Right now, we're going to get ready for our flight to Tendrinor.
of the International Secret Police. Zero. Marsha Winfield is held prisoner in a bleak hut on the shores of Lake Tengrinor, Clint decides to fly there with speed and rescue her. Meanwhile, the octopus, knowing nothing of this, orders a plane from Black Pass so that Quan Wu can fly to the lake and do away with the girl and her brother. Speed, Clint, and Barney leave La Shotzi Ring's home that same night to go to Nagchuka to fit up the plane. We find the two boys with Chief Depot the following morning. Uh, I am most happy to see you again, Mr. Barlow. I did not dream I would have this pleasure so soon. Well, neither did we, Chief Depot. But now that we have a clue to Miss Winfield's whereabouts, we're wasting no time in going there. And we're being mighty careful in case it's an octopus trap. Ah, uh, yes, you cannot be too careful. And if you find Miss Winfield, then I can really help you. We shall lose no time in capturing this monster. We got an idea that he's up to something right now, Chief. Guys with torches was going up and down the foot trail leading to his castle last night. We didn't have time to see what was going on, but when I go back to Sea Ring's house, I'm sure going to find out. And we're going to keep in touch with Barney by short wave, Chief Tipo. Mr. Sea Ring's installing a portable set in his house right this minute, I guess. He said he was going to. Yes, if you want to talk to us, be sure and go there, Chief Tipo. We have a set in our plane, you know. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, how is the condition of your plane? Swell. I've been working on her all night, going over every inch of her. And she's raring to go, thanks to your cooperation, Chief. You cleared away all the red tape that might have tied up this flight. Oh, why, it was nothing, Mr. Dunlap. Uh, who is there? Bob Gilmore. Bob Gilmore. Gilmore. Well, I'll sure be glad to see him again. I'll open the door. Uh, very well, Speed. Hi, Bob. Hello. Why, Gene and Dr. Kingsley. Oh, well, Bob, how are you? <laughs> Doctor, I'm glad to see you. Say, this looks like old home week. Were you surprised, Barney? I'll say so. We was asking about you, Gene, but Chief Tipo didn't say you was coming to see us. Well, we wouldn't miss this for the world, boys. I knew you wouldn't have time to visit us, so uh, we came to you. Oh, well, this is great, Doctor. I'm sorry we can't stay longer. Oh, so am I. I have so much to tell Steve. And I've got plenty to tell you, Gene, but it'll have to wait until we rescue Miss Marcia. Marcia? You mean... You know where she is? Why, yes. Didn't you know? Uh, I said nothing about that, Speed. I did not know if you wanted Dr. Kingsley and the little girl to know. To raise their hopes needlessly, perhaps. Ah, oh, nonsense. Have you really had word of her, Clint? Yes, Doctor. We're not sure if it's the real thing or not, but we're going to find out. Is that the reason for this flight to Tangrenor, Clint? Yes, Bob. And while we're gone, I expect you to keep an eye on things here. Now, Barney will remain on the outskirts of Lhasa. And I'll leave his address with you. If you need his help or he should call on you, we'll stand ready. You bet. I've been aching to do something. Huh. You should have been with us. We was always doing something. Yeah. The octopus even kidnapped Barney, we think. What? You what? think? The... What do you mean? Barney couldn't remember anything when he came back. We found him wandering around the marketplace and lost in his pajamas. Oh. <laughs> uh, I still think it was a frame-up. Yeah, but tell us more of this uh, information concerning Marsha. Yes, that's the important thing. Well, all I know is that she's prisoner in a hut near the lake, Tengranor. And Speed and I are going to fly up there and get her. Shouldn't take long, since it's only a little over a hundred miles away. 
We're taking plenty of food, water, medicine in case she needs it, and ammunition in case we need it. Uh, you probably will. She will be closely guarded, more than likely. Yes, but we're pitting our surprise attack against their superior numbers, Chief Depot. If the story is straight, and this is not an octopus trap, they can have no idea of our coming. If possible, we shall try to get Marsha away secretly. And if we can't, then we'll fight our way out. Oh, but that's so dangerous, Steve. Yeah, but isn't it worth it to get Miss Marsha back? Y- yes. But... Oh, no, don't you worry about speed, Jean. I'll take good care of him. Well, tell me, how soon are you pulling out, Clint? Well, as soon as I clear up a few last-minute things, Bob, I want to cable Chief Riley for one thing, telling him uh, what we're about to do. Of course, the cable will be in code. Yeah, it'd never do for the octopus to know what we was going to do. Well, we better get started then, huh, Clint? If we can take off before the afternoon wind starts up, it'll be a lot better. Uh, true, true, a lot better. It is going to be very difficult flying, Mr. Ballow. Oh, we're used to flying under all sorts of conditions, aren't we, Speed? You bet. Yeah, well, if you're going to send that cable to Chief Riley, let's get going, Clint. The longer you hang around, the more I want to go along. Let's go to the plane and get it over with. Yeah. Come on, everybody. Let's step on it. Well, well. Say, yeah, your men have certainly taken good care of our plane, Chief Depot. It's in perfect shape. I hope so, Mr. Barlow. Should anything go wrong with the plane when you're over the Chang Tang, I fear for your lives. The brigands there are very fierce indeed. And we're not afraid of them, Chief Depot. Maybe we could get them to help us rescue Miss Marcia. Hey, now, don't depend on any brigands to side with you, Speed. If they help anybody besides themselves, it'd be the octopus. Climb into the plane, Clint. I think you ought to take a last look before taking her off, just to make doubly sure you got everything you want. Okay, Bonnie. You come along, too. When you find Marcia, will you bring her back here, Speed? I think so, Jean. Clint said he didn't know of better hands to put her in than Dr. Kingsley's. Yes, the uh, poor girl will probably need medical care. She'll be suffering from shock, if nothing else. I'd give anything to fly up to the lake with you, Speed, and dust off some of those gangsters myself. Larry Winfield was my best friend, and the welfare of his sister means a lot to me. I know it does, Bob. We'll bring her back, all right. And maybe we can find out something about Larry, too. Well, if we could find him... I think we'd learn plenty about the octopus. Yes, that boy contacted him long before we did. I think we're going to learn plenty as it is, Dr. Kingsley. It's been a long chase, but we've been gradually closing in on him all the time. Yesterday, Clint sent some telephoto pictures to Chief Riley that I took of the octopus. That you took? Sure. We got to see him in his Paul Mounier disguise, you know. Well, those pictures, and now maybe rescuing Miss Marsh ought to do some good. We ought to get some swell evidence against the octopus. If you find Marsha Speed, believe me, I'm going to waste no time in returning to America with Jean and that girl. Just waiting, not knowing her fate has been awful. And I've always had the fear that the octopus might try to kidnap Jean. I know, Dr. Kingsley. Well, everything seems to be all right. Well, everything's ship shape, Speed. We'll take off pretty soon now. Yes, and I shall go to Mr. Tsering's home as soon as I possibly can, Mr. Barlow. In that way, I shall know of your activities. Say, I've been thinking, Clint. Supposing the octopus happens to overhear one of them shortwave conversations between your plane and the Tsering house. He'll know why you're flying to Tengri North. But he won't overhear us, Barney, because he's going to think we're still at Mr. Tsering's house. That's up to you to make him think that. He'll have no reason to try to tune in on us then. Hey, I don't want to be the goat. Maybe he won't believe me. He's naturally suspicious. Maybe he'll go right home and turn on his radio set, and he'll hear you talking. Then what? Uh, Barney's right, Speed. We'll have to word our messages so that if the octopus should hear them, he'll not know our real purpose. Leave it to me, Barney. I'll watch that. Okay, and I'll do my part in trying to keep him away from his set. Don't worry. Can I go start up the motors, Clint? Oh, yes, Speed. Barney worked on them all night, but I kind of like to hear them turn over a few times. Can I come too, Speed? Sure. Come along. All right. right. Uh, Here. Uh, Now, you have taken plenty of warm clothes along, Mr. Barlow. It is going to be very cold on the edge of the Chang Tang. Uh, you bet we have, Chief Depot. Mr. C. Ring saw to that. Well, I wish you all the luck in the world, Clint. What you're about to do is something we've all been striving for for a long time. You said it. Ever since Marsha was carried off to Siang Dock in that box. Gee, it gets me sore to think how close we was to her and didn't know it until too late. Chief Depot! Chief Depot! What is it? It is one of the my aides from the office. An important message for you, sir. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh. Oh. 
This is bad. What is it, Tito? Uh, trouble in the U province near Lhasa. What kind of trouble? Uh, it seems that peasants are disappearing, yes, without leaving a trace. Good heavens, what can that mean? I do not know, Doctor. Only once before has such a thing happened, and that was years ago. The nomads of Golok, predatory as eagles and wolves, once swooped down from Derji and took many shepherds prisoner. They used them for slaves. Slaves? Oh, slaves. slaves. Say, don't blame the Goloks or whatever they are for this then. Well, what do you mean? It looks like the hand of the octopus, Doctor. Remember how he carried on the slave traffic in Hong Kong? Good heavens. And them torchbearers we saw coming down the mountain last night. I'll bet they was up to no good. I wish I could stay and help you on this, Chief Depot. But we've got to fly to Tengrinor. Won't take long. It's only a short hop. And with luck, we'll be back by the night. Ah, yes, Clint. Yes, you must go. And, and I am going to return to La Chotte Rings home with Mr. Dunlap immediately. You will? Yes. And this time, I shall take my men with me and station them around the province to see if they cannot catch these raiders. Swell. And I'll try to do some inside work meantime. Everything's ready, Clint. The motors sound great, don't they? Uh, yes, Pete, but we've heard some bad news. Shepherds are disappearing. And we think the octopus has begun his slave raids. Gee whiz, that's bad. Oh, dear. Ah, uh, but don't you worry, Gene. We'll catch that guy this time. Everything's happening at once. We ought to draw one winning card out of the pack. You bet. Well, better get started, Speed. Are you have full instructions, Barney? Yeah, Clint. And don't worry about me, but watch yourself. Good luck and happy landing. All right, thank you. So long, Barney. We'll keep in touch with you. So long, Jean. We'll bring back Miss Marcia. Oh, I hope so, Speed. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye, Clint. Goodbye. Bye, Clint. Goodbye. Bye, Clint. Goodbye. Bye. See, Barney, they are in the air. Yeah. Now let you and me hustle back to Lhasa, Chief Tipo. We've got work to do. Of the International Secret Police.
Speed and Clint have started their flight to Lake Tengrinor to trace down the story of Marsha Winfield, who is being held prisoner there. Just before the takeoff, Chief Tipo received word that shepherds are mysteriously disappearing from the vicinity of Lhasa. It sounds as if the octopus has begun his slave raids, and the chief decides to return to La Shotzi-Ring's home with Barney to see if they cannot check the slave traffic. Meanwhile, we find Speed and Clint in the secret police plane shortly after they have taken off from Nagchuka. Golly, it's great to be in the air again, Clint, isn't it? Yes, yeah, Speed, it's great, even if we don't know exactly what we're flying into. If it's only a hundred miles to Tengri North, it shouldn't take much long to get there. We're not flying directly to it, fella. I don't want to go within sight of the pass of the Iron Dagger, you know. The octopus would spot us in a minute. Well, will he know about the flight anyhow? Doesn't he have spies in Nagchuka that would tell him? Well, he may have spies in Nagchuka, but I don't think they'll recognize our plane speed. Chief Tipo kept it well hidden, you know, and only trusted men worked with Barney on it last night. I think we're safe on that score. I hope so. On the other hand, if the story about Marsha was told me to set a trap for us, well, then the octopus knows everything about our movements. All we can do is trust in our luck. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, it's getting cold. Even the heating system doesn't keep the betting cold out. Well, that's because we're heading north. It's higher there and naturally much colder. Say, look at those gigantic mountains ahead. We'll certainly have to climb for the ceiling to fly over them. I'll say. You think we'll need the oxygen tanks, Clint? Keep them handy, we might. I've been following our course on this map. You're pointing the nose almost due west now. Yes, I'm heading for the Shang Chu River speed. When we hit that, I'll follow her right into Lake Tingrino. Are you going to land on the lake or on the ground, Clint? Oh, it depends on where that hut is. If there is a hut. Now, if we spot it in time from a high altitude, I might be able to sneak in, cut the motors, spiral down, and make a dead stick land. And then our guards wouldn't know we were in the neighborhood. That'd be the best, all right. The higher we get, the better then. Yes, I'm just hoping those clouds to the north don't jam up on us and hide our landing field. It hide it from whoever was in the hut with Miss Marcia. Oh, yes, but don't you forget that this is a strange country to us, Speed. And it isn't healthy to make dead stick landings through a cloud ceiling. If you don't know just where you're going to set down. I'll say not. Gosh, look below us, Clint. The bed is sure different from every other place I've flown over. It looks sort of wild, doesn't it? Yeah. Look, there's a river ahead. Guess that's the Shang Chu, huh? It is if my calculations are right. And now I'll head north, and barring trouble, we'll be at Lake Tengrenor in no time. Should I try to get Barney over the short wave yet? No, I doubt if they've gotten back to the Tsi Ring country house yet, Speed. You know, the Tibetan roads don't allow fast driving. <laughs> oh, that's right. But Barney wishes he had a plane like this right now. Yes, and I wouldn't mind having Barney here right now either. He can do anything with a plane. We're beginning to hit the wind. I won't be so good over that mountain range ahead. Say, you can fly as good as Barney. <laughs> well, thanks. Better get out the oxygen tanks now, Steve. Put them where we can reach them quick. We may need them as I put this crate over the hurdle. <laughs> Now, you remember all my instructions, Kwan Wu? Yes, master. As soon as your plane comes from Black Pass, we shall fly to Tanganoa. Destroy Marsha Winfield and her brother. Drop them into the lake. Burn the hut. And then return here. That is correct. And waste no time there. I shall make haste. Have you noticed any activity from the secret police at the home of Lasho Tsiring? Not yet. The failure of their last visit here has taught them a lesson. And if they inquire about the torches and the trail last night? I have a story for them. A story that will satisfy even them. <laughs> I hear the thing. Ah, yes, yes, here it is. Now remember, keep in touch with me at 15 minute intervals during the flight, Kwan Wu. And if you see anything out of the way or unusual, report it to me instantly. We cannot slip up on this undertaking. I understand. Do not fear, Master. I do this sort of thing well, I believe. It is the type of undertaking that I take an interest in. Yes, I know your cold blood quickens when you have such work to do. Ah, the plane is landing. We'd better step back. Ah, ah, good. Now let us approach the plane. Ah, here comes the pilot. I have come, Master. So I see. Order the two workers to place the tanks of the sleep papers in the plane. Yes. You uh, have your flight orders, pilot. You are to fly directly to Lake Tengrino. Yes, I understand. I have plenty of fuel. 
We can take off immediately if the Honorable Wu is ready. I am ready. Everything is in the plane. Very well. And one last warning, Quan Wu. Do not fail. I shall not. You are now under Mr. Wu's command, pilot. Do as he says. Obey him without question. You're certain your shortwave set is in good working condition? Yes, I have made every test. Good. Then be off. And come back as soon as possible. Very well, master. This business should not take long. No, this should not take long. First, Marshal Winfield and her brother. Next, the secret police. Well, there's Sea Ring's house. Didn't take us long to get out here, Chief Tebo, in spite of the bum road. I drove as fast as I could, Mr. Dunlap. There is much work to be done. You said it. And much work is being done by the octopus. Dirty work. Yes. After we explain to Mr. Searing what has happened, I shall go to some of the families which have reported missing persons. I shall endeavor to learn under what circumstances they disappeared. Swell. I'll get on the short wave meantime and talk to Clinton Speed. They may have something interesting to tell by that time. When are your men coming in? Tonight, under cover of darkness. I do not think it advisable that the octopus should know the raids have been reported. My men shall be stationed at various points to watch his activities. Mm, They'll have to have extra good eyesight to catch the octopus in anything, Chief. We've been trying for a long time, and we generally arrive after it's all over. He's a slick customer. Well, here we are, and there's Dawa coming to meet us. Greetings, Mr. Dunlop. Hi, kid. Did you miss me? I should say so, Bonnie. Welcome, Chief Tipo. <laughs> I did not expect to have the pleasure of seeing you so soon again. We have had bad news, Dawa. Bad news? What has happened? Does it concern Speed and Mr. Barlow? Speed and Clint got away all right. Don't worry about that. But the chief here got a notice from his office that guys are disappearing around these parts. That sounds like octopus work. Slave raids and such stuff. So the chief came back with me to see what could be done about stopping the raids. Oh, that is terrible. My honored male parent will be most sorry to hear about this. Uh, Where is he, Dawa? In the house, testing the shortwave radio, Chief Tipo. Is it working already? Oh, yes. Say, they didn't waste any time in stalling it, did they? That's swell. Let's go to him, kid. Very well. Are you going to attempt to talk to Speed and Mr. Barlow then? You bet. Gee, I wonder where them guys are. Look, Clint, way, way below it, Lake King Grenor. Yes, Pete. We're too high to spot the hut, though. Take the field glasses and see if you can find it. Okay. Gee, that wild country around the lake. Never mind that. Do you see any signs of habitation? There's a cabin, but there can't be anyone living in it. One wall has fallen. Now, no doubt there are more than just one hut, Steve. Follow the lake shore. Hold on. I think I've spotted it, Clint. It's a kind of a large hut compared to the other one, and smoke's coming out of the chimney. You see any others? No, but there's some shepherd's tents way off. Now, those don't concern us. That hut is the one we're interested in. Now, listen carefully, Steve. Take that map of this territory. Yeah? And with the help of the glasses, I want you to mark the direction that hut is from that hill that you see just under our right wing to get the exact latitude and longitude if possible. Okay. What are you going to do, Clint? I'm going to land behind that hill if the wind allows. Looks like it's kicking up plenty of sand down there. It'll be tough flying, but it may help to hide our landing. And we'll go on foot from the hill to the cabin. And if the storm gets too thick, we'll use our pocket compass. All right, I'll cut the motor now for the landing. Whee! The plane bucks like a bronco in this wind. Can you still see the hut through the dust haze? Yeah, with these glasses. Okay, get to work then, fella. I'm going to see if I can talk to Barney. The set should be hot by now. Hello. Hello. Calling Dunlap. Hello. Standing by for two-way. Come in, please. Gosh, I sure hope the octopus doesn't happen to be twirling his dials right now. Well, that's why I'm not saying any more than I have to on this call, Speed. There is no answer. I'll try again. Hello? Hello? Calling Dunlap. Calling Dunlap. Hello? Calling Dunlap. Calling Dunlap. Here he comes. Hello? Boy, this is great. Hello? Calling Dunlap. Standing by for two-way. Come in, please. Hello, pal. Here I am. Without call letters or anything. Oh, hello, Bonnie. Everything okay? Yeah, as far as I can say now. How's it with you? Everything's shading up fine. Even the weather's with us. 
I uh, think the story was straight. That means it doesn't look like an octopus trap. Excellent. Now, there is one thing, though, Barney. Now, listen closely. I... What is it, Clint? Go on. What has happened? He moved the dial. Try another setting. Perhaps, perhaps that may bring him back. Yeah, that's an idea. You are nearing Penguin or Guanwu? Yes, Master. We have already taken it. Let me know what you find there. That is all. Panic. What does that mean? What does it mean? The octopus. Suffering wang doodles. Quan Wu is flying to the lake, too. And gosh only knows what made Clint go off the air so sudden. We gotta do something. Hello, Clint. Dunlap calling Barlow. Emergency. Dunlap calling Barlow. Emergency. Of the International Secret Police. Speed and Clint, flying to Lake Tangrenor to rescue Marsha Winfield, have sighted the hut which holds her prisoner and have cut the motor of their plane preparatory to a silent, dead stick landing. A rising sandstorm also helps to hide their descent from whomever might be guarding the hut. Clint is talking to Barney over shortwave radio when his voice suddenly ceases. Barney, in La Chaute Rings home, excitedly tries to get his partner back when he overhears a conversation over the set between the octopus and Quan Wu from which he learns that Wu is also flying to Tengrinor. In vain does Barney try to reach Clint to warn him, and has just about reached the limit of his endurance. Dunlap calling Barlow, emergency. Dunlap calling Barlow, emergency. Standing by, come in. No, it's no use, fellas. I've been trying to raise him for 20 minutes, and I haven't had a peep back. Barney... You don't think that the octopus may have had something to do with Mr. Barlow's sudden silence? Not personal, Dawa. Judging by that shortwave talk we heard, he's still in his castle in the pass of the Iron Dagger. But one of his gangsters may have gotten to Clint. That's what I'm afraid of. Uh, he did not say enough to let us know exactly what he was doing or where he was. That's the rub, Chief Tipo. If he was still in the air, nothing much could happen to him up there. Maybe the sending apparatus just went fluid. But if they'd landed and then was talking... Uh, not so good. Uh, may I make a suggestion that may help your peace of mind, Mr. Dunlap? May you? I wish you could, Mr. Tsering. But not knowing what's happening to Speed and Clint, and worse, not being able to do anything, help out in any way, nothing could help my peace of mind. Did it not occur to you that uh, Mr. Barlow may have fallen silent for a very good reason? Yeah, huh? 
Perhaps he knew the octopus was speaking over the shortwave radio. Perhaps he wanted to listen to him. Uh, sounds too good to be true, Mr. Searing. If that was his reason, he's had plenty of time since then to come back on the air and let me know everything's okay. That is true, honored male parent. Yes, thou art, my son. But it is also true that we can do nothing about the matter for the moment. I have learned that there is nothing that time will not solve. So if if you will ask the servants to bring us tea and cakes, we shall compose ourselves here by this radio set and await further word from Speed and Mr. Barlow. Is your safety belt fastened, Speed? We'll land in a minute. This wind doesn't toss us back up a thousand feet to crack us up in the teeth of a downdraft. Yeah, it's fastened, Clint. I never thought you'd be able to make a dead stick landing in this windstorm. I didn't either for a little while, but I think we've won. Hold tight now. I'm going to set her down. Okay. I'm ready. Wow. That was kind of bumpy. Yes. I thought we were going to nose up for a minute there. I slapped on the brakes a little too hard, I guess. But there's no way of judging in this sort of wind and on a strange landing field. Well, the main thing is we're down safely and didn't hurt the plane in any way. That's right. We're out of sight of the cabin, too, behind this hill. Just before we landed, I looked over there toward the lake. And I could hardly see the hut and all this dust. Good. Then they never saw us. That's a cinch. But before we do anything else, I'd better talk to Barney. He's probably wondering what happened to me. Yeah, Maybe he's worried. We'll soon find out. If he is, be prepared for a bawling out. Okay. Barlow, calling Dunlap from flight station. Barlow, calling Dunlap. Standing by. Come in, please. Say, you big palooka. What's the idea of dodging off in the airwaves all of a sudden like that? What happened? Where are you? <laughs> Didn't I tell you, Speed? <laughs> What's that? Talk loud. Oh, I was just talking to Steve. <laughs> I knew you'd ball us out for that. Well, it ain't funny, see? Here we all sit thinking maybe something terrible has happened to you and eating tea and cakes. What's that? Eating tea and cakes, huh? Yeah, I'll bet you were worried. Well, Mr. Searing said that was the best way to wait. Yes, I'm sorry, Barney. I knew we worried you there, but I had to get off the air and give all my attention to the plane. We've been bucking a 50-mile gale all the way, and we've just landed this minute. You don't know about Quan Wu, then? You didn't overhear the octopus talking to him over short wave? Huh? What's that? What do you mean? Juan Wu is flying to Tengrinor, too. Don't know why, but I'll bet it's for no good. Great, Scott. We'll have to step on it, then. I'll say so. Have you located the cabin that holds Marsha? I think so. We're behind a hill now, a short distance from the lake. We're going the rest of the way on foot. The dust storm that's raging here will protect in one way. If there are any guards, I don't think they'll be expecting visitors in this weather. Unless they're on the lookout for Quan Wu... Be careful. Don't you worry. We will, Barney. I'll sign off now. I want to find Marsha, if possible, and take off before Wu arrives. Smart idea. Since there's only two of you against I don't know how many octopus gangsters, but talk to us again the minute you can. Okay, Barney. And don't worry about us. Light station, signing off. Golly, I hope the octopus hasn't caught us over his shortwave set, Clint. He'll know just what we're trying to do if he's listened just now. I know, Steve, but Barney had to warn us. We had to talk plainly, too. No use trying to hide our whereabouts now. It's just a question of who gets to the cabin first. So come on, let's get started. We don't know when Wu will arrive. No, but it won't take him long, I bet. He'll fly here to wreck. Yes, well, got everything you need now? Yeah, I'm all ready, Clint. Let's go, then, and stay close to me. We all want to get separated in this storm. All right. Come on. I'm down. I'm going to lock her up. I don't want to take a chance on anyone getting inside and wrecking the control. Good idea. This hill protects the plane from the worst of the wind, too. Yeah. Well, all ready now. We'll run for it, Speed. And remember, stick close to me and drop on your face if you see anyone at the cabin. Okay. Let's go. Huh? We're running right into the wind. Save your breath. Tie your handkerchief over your mouth. No. Keep the dust out of your lungs. Yeah. Behind me when we go in, Speed. Keep your gun ready. You bet. Okay. Now, follow me. Look. Come 
Marsha. Marsha Winfield. Is that really her? It is, Clint. Oh, Miss Marsha, we're so glad to find you. Clint, she's looking right at us, and still she doesn't seem to know us. Marsha. Marsha. She just sits there, staring at us. And Clint, look, that fellow in the corner. Yes, he... Sleep, evidently. He looks enough like Marsha to be her... Speed, this must be her brother, Larry Winfield. Here, here, wake up. Wake up. Gee, looks like he's been knocked out, doesn't it? No, Speed. I think they're both under a deadening influence. Larry has had so much that he's unconscious. And Marsha, though awake, has no mind of her own. Gee, poor Miss Marsha. She's so thin, Clint. Look, her skin's been darkened and she's dressed to look like a Tibetan. Yes, in rags. Now, the octopus will pay for this. Thank heaven we came in time. Listen, a plane. Juan Wu has arrived. We haven't got time to get both March and Larry out of here, speed without being seen. And they might be shot as well as us. What do we do then? Let's see. What does this ladder lead to? Some sort of a loft. We can hide up there until we see just how many we have to deal with. And that way we can get the drop on them. Well, we better get up there quick, Clint. That plane sounds like it's landing. Yes, I hope they didn't spot ours from the air. But if they did, we'll soon hear about it. Now... Keep quiet and have your gun ready, Steve. And keep out of sight. Don't worry. I'd like to punch those fellas for what they've done to poor Miss Martha. All right, come on, come on. Up the ladder now. All right. Up you go. Yes. Come on. That's it. Up. Does the wind always blow like the breath of the dragon that Tenganoa splinters? No, but this ain't no health resort. It may not be a health resort, Spinters. But you are being well paid for your stay here. Yeah, money ain't everything. I used to think so, but... Well, I don't like this sort of racket. Picking on this girl... Is it possible that you are suddenly developing a conscience, Splinter? You, a deserter from the United States Navy? Right, go ahead, rub it in. But believe me, I'd rather go back and face the music like that Barlow guy once told me to do than go on another job like this. Too late, Splinter. You can never leave the service of the octopus. Alive. Where are the others? Yeah, when we heard over short wave you was flying here, they went hunting. We're low on supplies, need more meat. Since then, the wind came up. Maybe they got lost. No matter. There are enough of us to handle the girl and her brother. Marsha Winfield. Yeah, she don't hear you. I gave her and Larry a dose of the vapors of sleep every morning like the octopus wanted me to. At least they don't know what they're suffering. It appears that you gave Winfield an overdose. Maybe I did. You are more careful of the girl. Her brain sleeps, but to all appearances, she is awake. What do you care, so long as she don't make trouble and yell and scream? She comes to once in a while, but I can't stand her talking to me, so I put her under again. Have any strangers passed lately? Yeah, just one, a llama, about two weeks ago. He did not see Miss Winfield, of course. Yeah. What? Well, that don't mean nothing. I was out for a walk, and he was here when I come back. She couldn't talk. She was under the influence of the vapors of sleep. How did you explain the situation? I told him I happened to fly up here and set down for directions. I found this Tibetan girl and her brother sick, and I was trying to do what I could before leaving him. That was easy. Easy. He may not have believed. It is well I came when I did to destroy Marsha Winfield and her brother. You're going to give him the works? Yes. And I shall destroy... Of them in the middle of Lake Tanganoa. What was that sound? It sounded like it came from the loft. Come on, let's take a look.
of the International Secret Police. Zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Speed and Clint have flown to Lake Tangrenor to rescue Marsha Winfield. Shortly after their arrival, however, Barney warns them by shortwave radio that Quan Wu is also flying there. Speed and Clint hurry to the hut that is her prison, hoping to find her and leave before Wu's arrival. But they hear his plane while they are trying to arouse Marsha from her stupor and hide themselves in the loft above the room. Quan Wu and Splinters, the renegade aviator, enter the hut, and the boys overhear Quan Wu telling Splinters how he is going to destroy Marsha and her brother. Speed accidentally makes a sound, and Wu and Splinters, hearing it, look up towards the loft. It sounded like it came from up there, all right. That's probably this darn wind. I keep hearing things like that all the time when I'm alone. Are you sure it is only the wind? Well, what else could it be? Even rats are smarter than to hang around this place. Very well. I wish that the wind would die down. We cannot take the Winfield girl and her brother out on the lake in this storm. Here are the tanks of the vapors of sleep. Place them in the corner. Very well. Where are you going now? Back to plane. Must stay there while this wind blows so hard. I do not think we shall need those tanks after all. You seem to be well supplied with the sleep vapors. Uh, yeah, I got plenty of that stuff. Say, Quan Wu, after you do your job here, what happens then? Do I fly back to the pass of the Iron Dagger with you? That I do not know, Spenders. The transfer of the slave has begun. The master may want you to go to the meeting place at the foot of the Hamalyas. I get it. Well, my plane's all ready for either way. I've been working on it ever since I got word that you was coming here. Good. Is your short wave set ready for you? No, I'll have to warm it up. Do you want to talk to the octopus? Yes. I must tell him that the sandstorm is delaying us. Okay, I'll turn it on for you. Come on in here. gone into the other room. Golly, Clint. I sure thought we were goners for a while. Yeah, so did I. Whatever possessed you to make such a racket? I couldn't help it. And giving our presents away isn't going to help. I know. I thought we were going to have to shoot it out before I was ready. When are we going to tackle him, Clint? Right after Wu talks to the octopus. Give him a chance to tell that devil fish that everything's all right. And then we'll make our appearance. Yeah. I think we ought to get Miss Marsh and her brother out of here before those other fellas show up. The one Splinters was talking about that went hunting before the sandstorm came up. Yes, I know. And when we leave here, Speed, I want to take Splinters and Quan Wu with us, as well as the Winfield. I know that we can make Splinters talk. He'll be the witness we need to round up the octopus. What about Miss Marcia? Oh, uh, there's no telling when she'll be able to testify, Speed. I don't know how long she'll be in that stupor. Gee, this waiting is terrible. Seems like we're always waiting for something to happen. Yeah, uh, don't you worry. We won't have to wait long, Speed. That short wave set will warm up soon. Quan Wu will talk to the octopus, and then we can surprise him. And will we surprise Barney if we bring back Splinters and Quan Wu as prisoners? Gosh, wonder what Barney is doing right this minute. you heard anything more from Speed and Mr. Barlow, Barney? No, I ain't, kid. And I've been sitting right here by the set all the time. All we can do is hope for the best. Yes, I have been trying not to worry. But all I can think of is the Danes are at Lake Tingrenor. I know, kid. Where's Chief Tipo? With my honored male parent. They're checking over a list of the families who have reported the raids. The list has just arrived from Lhasa. I get it. Guess Chief Tipo wants to know where he should station his men tonight. Yes. Ah, 
I see you have not deserted your post, Mr. Dunlap. No siree, Mr. Searing. If any word comes through, I'll be here to get it. <laughs> well, Campo, old fellow, what is wrong? I brought the dog in to you, Dawa, because he seemed very upset. He kept pacing back and forth and whining while Chief Tipo and I were trying to concentrate. It disturbed us. I thought Campo might want to be with you. Do you think he may have a pain from that cloud on the bean the octopus guard gave him? I do not think so, Bonnie. He seemed to have recovered from that experience remarkably well. Well, he don't look so happy to me. What's the matter, fella? Something biting you? Something must be wrong. I have never seen Campo so disturbed before. Yeah, he's kept running from one to the other like he's trying to tell us something. <laughs> Quiet, Campo. Quiet. He's sure doing his best to talk. Animals can sense danger much quicker than humans. I wonder if such a premonition is troubling Campo. Danger? Campo, stop that. Hey, I don't like that. Something's wrong someplace. Yes, Barney. My people say that when a dog howls, he is mourning because there is death in the air. And so, Master, I am forced to wait until this cursed wind dies down. I see. Very well. Wait, then. But if the wind does not die by evening, then we must dispose of the windmills in some other way. I want you to return here as soon as possible. Yes, Master. And what are your orders for Splinters? Shall he return with me? Splinters? <laughs> I shall think that over and tell you what to do later. Where are the other guards? Out in the storm. We think they may have lost their way, so blinding is the dust. Perhaps they may have wandered into the Chang Tang. If that is the case, we shall probably never see them again. It is just as well. Just as well. There will be two less tongues to tell of Marsha Winfield's fate. That is true. So much for that. Keep me informed as to your activities, Kwan Ho. Signing off. So what's he got up his sleeve? What do you mean? He laughed when you asked him about me. I don't like that. Hey, maybe he's planning on having you kill me, too. Do not be ridiculous. I ain't. I'm just using my head. He was glad those other guys was lost in the storm, wasn't he? Well, if he got rid of me, there'd be three less tongues instead of two to talk about the Winfield. Be quiet. Your imagination is getting the better of you. Oh, no, it ain't. I know he hates me. You are wrong, Splinters. The master does not take enough interest in you to hate you. So long as you do your work well, you are safe. Your well-being is in your own hands. Oh, I wish I could believe you, but I ain't kidding myself. I know that he'll bump me off when he hasn't any more use for me. Hmm, you are in a gloomy mood. Please make some tea, will you? The cold at Tenganor is most penetrating, even with this fire. Okay, okay. Yeah, but speaking of the cold, now you know what I've been putting up with ever since I come here. I'd make as big a fire as I could, and still a cold would creep in and freeze my bones. Perhaps that was not cold, but conscience. You are a fool to allow it to bother you. No, it was the cold, I tell you. And Tangri is haunted. At night, when it's quiet and no wind is blowing, I hear things. Things like wailing voices. What of the other guards? Did they hear anything? Them Tibetans? Yeah, they slept through it all. They're used to this country, but I ain't. It's weird. No wonder they call it the Forbidden Land. I'll be glad to get out of it. We may not get out of it so soon, Spinters. The bat is rich in undeveloped resources. I believe the master plans to make this wealth his own. Someday he will rule the world from the bat. Ah, he's cracked. I met some tough customers in my time, but none of them can touch the octopus. For cold-blooded, calculating cruelty, he's got them all licked. Dangerous words, Spinters. Ah, what have I got to lose? I got a hunch I'll be rubbed out after this job anyhow. The octopus is crazy, Quan Wu. He must be to have done the things he's done. Crazy or not, he is master. Yeah. Gee, I wish I could get into my plane and fly out of the whole mess. You would not fly faster, Ted. And speaking of your plane, 
Do you not think it rather foolish to leave it in the open for anyone to see? Hmm? What's that? Your plane that you left sitting on the other side of the hill near here. We glimpsed it before we landed, in spite of the dust storm. Plane? Hey, what are you talking about? Woo, my plane's well hidden. I made a hangar out of the rocks. Keeps it safe, and it looks like any other pile of rocks. Hey, that ain't my plane you saw. No? Then whose is it? Somebody's wise to us. Maybe they're spying on us right now. That noise we heard before. Well, but the secret police. Uh, Up with your hands. Barlow and Speed Gibson. Yeah, remember us, Splinters? Toss whatever weapons you're carrying on the floor. Quick, don't try to use them. We've got you covered. You are very clever, Barlow. Never mind the compliments, Clon Wu. Hurry up with those weapons. Very well. Two guns and a knife, Clint. Just pick them up, Speed. So what are you going to do with this, Barlow? Whatever it is, it'll be better than you would have gotten from the octopus, Splinters. Get the handcuffs, Speed. Okay. You came just in time, Barlow. A little longer, and you would never have seen Martha Winfield again. Yes, and for what you were going to do to Marsha and her brother, I should shoot you down without a chance. I'm going to spare your life so that you can turn witness against the octopus. You think I will talk? I know you'll talk. Let the cuffs be. Yeah, Clint. And now, Wu, you and Splinters put your hands behind you. And Speed, keep away from them. Don't give them a chance of grabbing you as you snap the cuffs on them. Don't worry, I won't. Just to make sure, I'll come around with you. And don't either of you make a false move. That would be very foolish, Barlow, since you have the guns. I've got the cuffs on splinters. Okay, and now we'll... And be sure they're locked. Yeah. Gee, Clint, won't Barney be surprised when we bring back not only Miss Marsh and her brother, but Wu and splinters, too? Yes, I... Quick, men, these are secret police. Hold them! Clint, look out! Look out! Look out! Look of the International Secret Police. and Clint, hidden in the hut that is Marsha Winfield's prison, surprise Quan Wu and Splinters when they enter. This saves Marsha's life since the octopus sent Wu to Lake Tangrenor to destroy the girl and her brother. As Speed is placing the handcuffs on Splinters and Wu, the two guards who were thought to be lost in the sandstorm enter and a fight follows. We find Speed and Clint fighting for their very lives, while the handcuffed Splinters, surprisingly enough, Shouts encouragement. Get it to him, Barlow. Look out, Speed. I want to back of you. Stand back, Rob. Shoot. Stand back now. Can you, you got to your gun just in time, Speed. When those two guards jumped at me, they knocked the gun out of my hand. Yeah, I saw that. I... Clint, where's Quan Wu? Well, he was here just a minute ago. He's giving you the slip. He's gotten away. Quick, let me get to this door. Here he goes. Come 
on inside. He got away. See, that's uh, bad, Clint. He'll tell the octopus what's happened over his short wave set in the plane. I know. We've got to get away from Tengrenor as soon as possible, Speed. Hey, you said it, Barlow. That octopus guy might send for more aviators from Black Pass to come and get you. Golly, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to put handcuffs on Kwon Wu. He couldn't have gotten away so easy then. Well, at least we found Marsha. That's something to be thankful for. Yeah, I don't mind telling you, Barlow. I'm mighty glad you arrived in time to save that gal. I didn't like what Wu was going to do. I thought as much from the conversation we overheard while we were in the loft. You'd do a lot to be free of the octopus now, wouldn't you? Would I? Barlow, I'd do anything. All right. I'll give you a chance to prove that. Speed, remove his handcuffs. Huh? Yes. I want Splinters to help us. Marsha and her brother will have to be carried out of here. I can't trust these two guards to do it, so I want you to keep them covered while Splinters and I carry out Marsha and Larry. Oh, all right. I'll unlock the cuffs then. Ah, thanks, kid. That feels better. All right, but don't you try any tricks, Splinters. If you do, Speed has orders to shoot. We've come too far in this game to run any chances now. Oh, don't worry, Paulo. I learned my lesson. And how? Well, don't think that we're going to let you off easy, fella. You'll have to go back and face the music with the rest. But I think we've saved your life. I believe Wu had orders to kill you before leaving Tengner North. Yeah, I had that hunch, too. Very well. You can repay us by telling what you know about the octopus when we return to Lhasa. I'll tell you all I know. I got it in for that guy. Good. Now let's get ready to leave. Yeah, it's getting dark, Clint, and the wind's blowing hard as ever. It's going to be tough flying. Well, bad as the air may be, I think it'll be safer in Tengra Noor once the octopus learns what's happened. Come on, let's get started. <laughs> Master, this is Fan Wu. Speed Gibson and Barlow were hidden in the loft above us. So we were helpless when they appeared with their guns. You fool! Did you not suspect their presence when you sighted the plane you mentioned? No. I thought it was Cinder's plane. I could not see it clearly. The dust was thick. But how did Barlow learn of Marshall Winfield's presence at Tengri That is what I cannot understand. That I cannot say. And Splinters is their presence? Splinters and the other two guards. Uh. It is most unfortunate. Do you think they will talk? Of course. Fortunately, they know nothing of my threat plan. But wait. Did you discuss the slave transfer to the foot of the Himalayas? I did say something about it, but I mentioned no names. You did not have to. Barlow needs no names. Only the slightest clue. Splinters knows the names. You tell all he knows. What is to be done? I do not know now, but I shall by the time you arrive here. Not only Splinters, but Marsha and her brother must be destroyed before they get a chance to tell what they know. The Winfields are particularly dangerous for us. Yes, but it will be some time before they will be able to think clearly enough to be of any help to the secret police. They have been under the influence of the vapors of sleep too long to recover from its effects quickly. By the time they do, we shall have reached them. And Splinters? I still must figure that out, Wu. But whatever his face. We shall strike tonight. Here it is, night already, and still no word from Clinton Speed. I'm getting really worried now, Dawa. That dog of yours howled for a reason, and I bet that reason was them guys are in trouble. I hope not, Bonnie, but we should have some word soon. Or else they should return. Yeah, the landing feels all ready for them. That was smart of you, Dawa, having your servants stick torches all around that big field beside the house. They throw plenty of light for a landing. I hope so. It is the best we can do. wonder how your dad and chief Tipo are getting along. I imagine they are very busy stationing the men at their various places to surprise the slave raiders if they come tonight. It's swell of your dad to help us and the chief like this. I never thought he'd help to this extent. My honored male parent will do anything to aid Tibet and to war on crime and criminals. Yeah, yeah. Oh, boy, I'm tired of sitting around doing nothing. Won't you eat something, Barney? You have not tasted food since Kampo howled. Yeah, he sort of killed my appetite, I guess. I can't eat when I'm worried, kid. And I'm plenty worried this time. 
Mr. Barlow and Speed have been in danger before and come out safely, have they not? Yeah, but this is different. You see, we've been on the trail of the octopus for a long time, Dawa. Clint and me have followed that guy long before Speed came into the secret police. But we've never been as close to catching him as we are now. Then why should that be more dangerous? Because anybody will fight harder when their back's against the wall. And the octopus is no different from any other crook in that respect. He's played an undercover game all along, doing his dirty work in the dark. But if it comes to a pinch, he'll come out in the open and fight with everything he's got, which is plenty. You mean he would throw off his Paul Mounier disguise? Say, he'd throw that off so hard you'd hear it around the world. Dawa, the octopus, has got an army of aviators stationed up at Black Pass. All he has to do is say the word and they'd come flying down and Tibet would have a war on its hands before it knew it. How horrible. I never no, dreamed. That's the trouble. Nobody ever dreamed the octopus would do the things he's done. That's how he's gotten so strong. Why, if we didn't stop him now, Dawa, that guy'd rule the world in another ten years. His crime organization is worldwide. Is it not possible to end that? We can end it if we get the brains behind the whole thing. And that's the octopus. But why am I telling you all this when I don't even know if he's gotten Clinton's speed? Gee, kid, I gotta do something soon. This waiting is getting me. Listen. It's a plane. It's a secret police plane. I'd know them motors any place. Let's go outside where we can see the landing field. Just try to keep me inside, kid. Come on. Where is it, Barney? Uh, can you see the plane? Yeah. yeah, there it is. See it? Looks like it's over the pass of the Iron Dagger now. Oh, yes. Now I see it. Uh, let us go to the landing field. Say, look at your servants. They're all excited. <laughs> Many of them have never seen a plane before, Barney. They think it is a giant bird. I'll bet they do. Golly, I wonder what Clint found up at Lake Tangri North. I wish my honored male parents were here to witness this event. It is most exciting. Yeah. Boy, look at that baby fishtail. <laughs> I beg your pardon? Huh? Oh, I keep forgetting you don't know Sky Talk, Dawa. Fishtailing means that Clint is skidding the tail of his plane back and forth sideways. That kills speed when you come in too fast for a landing. Oh, I understand. But how can you tell from the ground, Barney? By watching his wing lights, kid. And by being a flyer myself. Look, he's getting ready to land. No wind to worry him either. He's down, Barney. Let's go to meet them. I couldn't have made a better landing myself. But don't tell Clint that. Hi, Barney. Go off. Hey. Welcome, Mr. Barlow. What'd you find up there, Speed? Here's some prisoners for you, Barney. Hey, who are those guys? They appear to be Tibetans. Now, hurry up there, you two. These are octopus gangsters, Dawa. They are. Is that Splinters? Yeah. And he's carrying Larry Winfield. Larry? You mean Marsha's brother? You bet. And here comes Clint with Miss Marsha. Marsha. Marsha Winfield. Yes, it's Marsha, all right, Barney. Will you carry her into the house? I'll give Speed a hand with his prisoners. You bet I will. What happened? Tell me. Uh, when did we get inside? Oh, do you need a hand with Winfield splinters? No, I can manage him, Barlow. Then you accomplished what you wanted, Speed. Yeah, Dawa. We found Miss Marsha and her brother, too. Boy, he'll be able to tell us plenty when he can talk. Looks like that'll be a long time yet, Speed. Well, Splinters can help us, Barney. Yeah, where'd you pick him up? He was guarding Miss Marsha, along with these others. Quan Wu came in, too, and we would have arrested him when he got away. Hey, wait a minute. What's your kid talking about, Clint? I'll tell you the whole story once we're inside, Barney. I don't feel safe out here somehow. Wu escaped, as Speed said, and I don't know what the octopus will try next. Oh, uh, where's Mr. C. Ring and Chief Tipo? Out spotting the chief's men. Uh, I think we'll need them here more than scattered all over the province. I don't want to lose the Winfield and Splinters now that we've found them. The octopus will not dare attack us here, Mr. Barlow. The servants will fight for us if need be. The octopus will dare anything, Dawa. That's the whole trouble. Well, we're almost at the house. Once we're inside, we won't have so much to worry about. I shall go ahead and hold the door open. Oh, thank you, Dawa. <laughs> down, everyone! Someone's sniping at us. Was anyone hit? Oh. Splinters. They got splinters. Look, he's down. He's the one witness that could talk. And now they shot him.
Gibson of the International Secret Police. Zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Speed and Clint return to La Chaute Ring's country home with Marsha Winfield and her brother. With them also is Splinters, the renegade aviator from whom they hope to learn much concerning the octopus. As they are all about to go into the house, however, a shot rings out and Splinters drops to the ground wounded. We find the boys bringing him into the house now. All right, fellas. Have you seen? Uh, 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 all right. Oh, Speed, open yeah. the door, will you please? All right. That's it. I got it back. Uh, that's it. Easy here, That's it, Speed. Thank you. All right. Uh, Bring him right this way, Mr. Barlow. All right. There is a couch in this room. Uh, you can place him on that. Oh, thank you, Dawa. Here, help me with him, Speed. Uh, it's pretty heavy. Okay, Clint. Good. Here he goes on the couch. All right. Easy. Easy now. There we are. I don't know just how badly he's wounded. Say, Clint, do you want me to go out and see if I can find the guy that sniped him? No, Bonnie. He might get a bullet in your back for your pains. But you keep your eyes open in case they should try some target practice inside the house. Don't worry, pal. Is there anything I can do, sir? Uh, yes, there is, though. Uh, get me some hot water and a clean cloth we can use for bandages, will you? Uh, yes, I shall get them immediately. Is he hurt bad, Clint? Well, no, wait a minute. Let's see. Yes, he's got a nasty wound on the side of his head here, but I think they just creased him. Creased? Yes, that sharpshooter wasn't as accurate as he might have been. He meant that bullet to go into Splinter's brain. But instead, it just clipped some of his hair off and gave him a deep scalp wound. You mean he's going to live? Sure he's going to live, kid. But he may have a headache for a while. I still don't see how anybody could have shot him without some of the servants noticing the gun. They were all around it. Yes, perhaps a few of C-Ring's servants are in the pay of the octopus. Do you really think so, Clint? He told us they've been with him for years. Well, that doesn't always make for loyalty speed. Oh, well, I may be misjudging them. Perhaps whoever fired that shot was nowhere near the servants. He may have been using a high-powered rifle. Yeah. I'm going to look for that bullet tomorrow, as soon as it's daylight. It must be in the wall somewhere. Once I find that, we'll soon know what direction it came from. Is Splinter's coming, too? Uh, maybe. See, I wish I had some iodine handy, but our medicine case is still on the plane. Say, mine's here. Oh, it is? Yeah. Well, then hop to it and bring me some iodine, Bonnie. Splinter's has got to stay healthy for all our sakes. You bet. I'll be back in a jiffy. Oh, you think he might be hurt worse than your figure, Clint? And I don't believe so, Speed. A wound like this is very painful, but it isn't very serious. That's good. Boy, the octopus didn't waste any time in trying to keep Splinters quiet, did he? I'll say not. Evidently, Splinters can tell us plenty, Speed. Otherwise, the octopus wouldn't have bothered with him. Here is the hot water, Mr. Barlow. Oh, yes, the water, thank you. Just put it right down here. All right. And here are the bandages. Oh, Where do you want them? Fine, thank you. Just give me the bandages. All right, sir. Here you go. That's it. Thank you. Well, I think that Splinters will be conscious again by the time I get his wound dressed. Oh, that is excellent. Where is Barney? He's going to get some iodine out of his medicine kit. We have been missing some excitement. And how? Speed and Clint no sooner landed and got these folks out of the plane and somebody started shooting. And those two Tibetans standing in the corner, who are they? More octopus gangsters, Chief Tipo. They were guarding Miss Marcia, too. Golly, we've got a lot to tell you all after we bring splinters around. And now the iodines. Here you are, Clint. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, give me a piece of cotton there, will you? Yeah. Right. All right. Thank you. Now, just hold his head over this way, please. All right. Oh. Uh, oh. Uh, oh. I'll bet that stuff hurts. 
Not our room torture me out the put I'll do anything you say. Anything only don't torture me, no. Uh, uh, I didn't let him get away. Hey, wait, wait. Hold, hold him down. Hold him, fellas. Uh, don't let him get up. All right. Uh, you think the octopus has got him? Yes, I get this. Fellas had plenty of suffering at his hands. Look. Look. Splinters is opening his eyes. Where, where am I? You're safe enough now, Splinters. Well, what happened? Well, oh... Oh, my head hurts. Well, you were shot, Splinters. Yeah, one of your pals wanted to rub you out, but he missed by about an inch. The octopus. He won't rest until he does kill me. Then he won't get much rest, Splinters, because we're not going to let him kill you. I wish you'd station your men around the house, Chief Depot, as a guard against another attack. I did so before we came in, Mr. Barlow. I did not know we would find inside, so I placed a cordon of men around the house. No one can go in or out without being stopped by my men for questioning. We're good. Now I'll just bandage this wound, Splinters, and you'll be almost as good as new. What about Miss Marsh and Larry? Well, we can't do much about them, Steve, until Dr. Kingsley makes the diagnosis. I want to take them to Nagchuka as soon as possible. They'll be safer there than they are here. You mean that the octopus may try to destroy them here? In my house? Sure, they can talk plenty when they get back to normal. Oh, uh, have you more cots like this when Splinters is on, Mr. Searing? Yes, we have several. Well, will you have them brought in here, please? Yes. I'll need enough for Miss Winfield and her brother, and for Speed, Barney, and myself. I don't want to let them out of my sight. What about the other two, the octopus gangsters? I'll put them in your charge, Chief Tipo, and don't let them try anything. I shall not, do not fear. How do you feel now, Splinters? Oh, a little better. Thanks, Ken. Think you can talk? Sure, why not? All right, then. Now, we heard Quan Wu mention something about the transfer of the slaves to a meeting place at the foot of the Himalayas. Where is that place? Mardak. Uh, Mardak? Yeah, it's a village near Lake Tigotso. Tigotso? Uh-huh. All the slaves that was picked up around here and hidden in the lower rooms of the octopus's castle are... Slaves? The... In the castle? Sure. Well, I'll be darned. They're giving the vapors a sleep there... Packed in gunny sacks and then sent to this village of Marty. Clint, maybe that's what those torches meant on the foot trail. Remember when we saw him? Yes, Speed. And I never dreamed the octopus would attempt such a bold transfer. That's how he gets away with it. If he tried to sneak him across the country, the Tibetan government would be on his neck in a minute. But I do not understand. For what reason are the slaves being taken to Marty? A caravan will be formed there. A caravan that will go over the Himalayas into India. Over the Himalayas? Rup, right over Kula Kangri Pass. In India, they'll be transferred to boats on the Brahmaputra River and carried to the coast and out into the Bay of Bengal. Gee, what a setup. And a successful one, too. Splinters hasn't told us about it. We've got the octopus right where we want him now. Yeah, but you might have trouble in convincing him of that, Dunlap. Don't forget those planes he has stationed at Black Pass. I don't think he'll dare use them, Splinters. They'd reveal his game too completely. No, the octopus thinks he's going to win, and because of that... Won't send for those planes. Well, save as a last resort. Do you think I should call my men back, Mr. Barlow? No. Leave them stationed where they are, Chief Depot. But send word for them to prepare for an attack. When we give the word, they can advance on the pass of the Iron Dagger. And there'll be no way for the octopus and his gangsters to escape. Unless they fly out. Uh, we won't give them time for that speed. You mean you're going to attack the castle tonight? No, Bonnie. We'll lay low tonight and tomorrow, and perhaps longer. You see, Quan Wu escaped from us to warn the octopus that we had Marsh and the others. And he'll be ready for us now. I want to wait until he thinks that he's safe, that Splinters was killed by that shot from out of the dark. And then we'll pay him a visit, probably while those mysterious gunny sacks are being carried down the foot trail. Say, just who is the octopus, Splinters? I don't know, Speed. I never saw him. You know, we should be hearing the result of those telephoto pictures from Chief Riley soon, Speed. But, however, we don't need that now. We've got splitters to identify the octopus. Yeah, I'll identify him, all right. I'd know that voice in a million. I don't know if you'd recognize him as Paul Mounier, Splinters. He's disguised as an old man. I'll know him. Don't worry. Say, Clint, let's try to make Marsha talk again, huh? Yeah, you can try, Barney, but I'm afraid it's no use. Marsha? Marsha? Remember me? Old Barney? She just stares at him. I feel so sorry for her speed. I believe the young lady and her brother need good food and care more than anything else. Yeah, Poor Miss Marsh has been through an awful lot, I bet. And Larry looks bad, too. Yes, he's suffered more than Marsh's speed. It may take him longer to come out of it. But if anyone can cure them, it's Dr. Kingsley. I shall have one of the serving women care for the young lady, now that the excitement is over for the time being. 
clean clothes and good hot soup would do wonders for her. Say, that reminds me, I'm hungry too. But me haven't eaten anything since we left here. I haven't done much better sitting here with one ear glued to the short wave set. I was afraid to take time out to eat. Why didn't you let us know you was all right, Clint? Well, I didn't have a chance, Barney. We flew out of a sandstorm, you know, and I had my hands full handling the plane, while Speed was watching over Marsha and Larry and also keeping an eye on our prisoners. Uh, those two over there were handcuffed, but they could have done a lot of damage had they broken loose while we were in the plane. They're mighty quiet. They ain't said a word all the time they've been here. Yeah, but they look plenty tough, all right. Maybe we can get them to talk when the time comes. And right now, I think we'd better turn in for the night, huh? Yes, you must be exhausted from the day's happenings, Mr. Barlow. Yes, I am tired, Doa. I shall order some food for you all and the cot. And I can help you in that, Mr. Searing. Boy, I'm tired, too. But am I glad that we found Miss Marsh again, and her brother, too. Yeah, and this time I hope we keep him. What do you mean, Barney? Uh-oh. Something tells me this night ain't going to be as restful as we hope. Not with splinters in the windfields in the house and octopus gangsters in the neighborhood. The International Secret Police. Barney expects the worst, the night passes quietly enough at the house of La Chotzi Ring. Marsha Winfield and her brother Larry sleep, while Speed and Clint take turns at standing watch. Barney and Chief Tipo keep their eyes on splinters and the other two octopus gangsters that Speed and Clint arrested at Lake Tengrinor. The octopus does not make another attempt to silence splinters or the others, however, and next morning we find the boys, refreshed by their sleep, making plans as to their next move. Well, fellas... Marsh and Larry are still in the same condition as we found them. They know nothing of what's going on around them and don't seem to recognize any of us. So I think the best thing to do is to get them to Dr. Kingsley at Nag Chukar. Gene will sure be glad to see Miss Marsh again. Yeah, I'll say so, Speed. And will Bob Gilmore be glad to see his old pal Larry? Yes, indeed. In just the moment the Winfields are themselves again, then we can talk to them. I imagine Larry alone can tell us enough to send the octopus where he belongs. I bet he can. Who's going to take Miss Marsh and Larry to Nog Chukar, Clint? They'll have to be well guarded so the octopus can't reach him. Yes, I know, Speed. I think all three of us will be in the escort. What? How about the slave transfer that's going on? I said before we'd have to lay low for a little while, Barney. The octopus expects trouble now. But if we wait, he'll get a little careless again. 
think that we have nothing on him and continue his smuggling to Mardock. Uh, maybe. Where's Chief Tipo? He's questioning Splinters and the other two guards again. The last I heard, he wasn't getting very far. Splinters has told us everything he knows. The other two won't talk. Uh-huh. Oh, say, Speed, uh, will you go and bring Splinters here, please? You bet, Clint. Right away. What do you want with Splinters? Nothing. Nothing right now. But I wanted to get Speed out of hearing distance for a few minutes, Barney. Sounds like you have something up your sleeve. I don't know, Barney, but I've got a hunch that we're getting close to a showdown with the octopus. You mean we're really smoking that old devil fish out of his hole this time, huh? Yes, and he's not going to come out easy. It's going to be a big fight, fella, and I don't want Speed anywhere near when it happens. Keep that kid out? I don't know how you're going to do it. You know he's as determined as you are once he starts a thing. I don't think you'll be able to keep him out at the finish. Well, that's why I want your help. Now, after we come back from Nagjukov, you and I, with Chief Tipo and his men, are going to the Pass of the Iron Dagger and search for slaves. Proof of guilt or no proof of guilt. But Speed's going to stay here with Dawa and La Chaute Sirin. You'll have to tie him down. Yeah, never mind that. I just wanted to warn you so that you can follow my lead no matter what reason I give him. Now, you and I are used to this rough going, Barney. We're old campaigners, but Speed isn't. It's going to be too dangerous, and I don't want him to risk his life. Don't worry. You can count on me. Oh, uh, good. I knew I could. There's Splinters, fellas. And Da Wa, too. I was afraid he was missing something. Yes, indeed. When Speed came to bring Splinters here, I thought I had better come as well, since Chief Tipo was learning nothing from the other two prisoners. And you thought we might get some more out of Splinters, huh, Da Wa? Well, I... I had rather hoped that you might, Barney. <laughs> Oh, the kid kills me. The way he reels off that high sound and talk. Oh, yeah? Well, you'd do better to follow his example and to laugh at him. Yeah, I do. Uh, huh? Now, Splinters, have you any more information to give us this morning? Oh, I told you all I knew last night. How does your head feel? Oh, fair to Midland. Hey, what are you going to do with me, Barlow? Eventually, you'll go to Nagchukar, Splinters. I'll turn you over to Chief Tipo, however, until we leave Tibet. You, you mean I'll be in jail? What are you kicking about? That's better than being in the octopus torture room, ain't it? Yeah, you said it. Well, I think we'll start for Nagchukar with Marsh and Larry, boys. I want the doctor to see them as soon as possible. The sooner they're cured, the sooner they'll talk. Mr. Barlow! Mr. Barlow! Uh, oh, yes? What's wrong, Chief Tipo? Paul Mounier is coming here. What? I just saw his car approaching Paul swiftly. Mounier. Paul Mounier! Coming the here? octopus. He's coming here to see what we're going to do, Clint. Oh, don't let him find me, fellas. He'll kill me. He'll kill me this time for now, sure. Quiet, quiet. There's no need to get all excited. Yeah, no, but if he he's... He's coming here to spy, all right, but we can play him at his own game and maybe force him to show his hand. Yeah, but you'll keep... Barney! Me. Barney, take Marsh and Larry into the next room. Help him, Splinters, and then you stay in there, too, so he won't see you. And you won't tell him I'm here? No. Now, Dawa... Yes, sir? Here's where you can help a lot. I want you to stay in that other room, too, and if Splinters makes one false move or tries to escape, I want you to shout for help. You understand? I certainly do. By trying to escape, Splinters would reveal his presence to the octopus which would be a very foolish thing for him to do. The kid's catching on quick. Well, you needn't worry about me trying to escape. I'm safer here than I would be any other place. Well, see that you don't forget that, Splinters. And now then help Barney with the windfields. And Barney, you come out here as soon as you have them comfortable. Okay, Clint. Come along, Splinters. You take Larry and I'll carry Miss Winfield. Okay. Now, come on. <laughs> but what will we do, Mr. Barlow? What are you going to tell Mounier? We'll see what he has to say first, Chief Tipo. Then we'll follow his lead. I'll smooth all these cots, Clint, so it won't look like anybody's been on him. That's a good boy, Speed. I'll help you. The octopus will be here any minute now. Uh, but how shall I explain the presence of my men, Mr. Barlow? Do you still wish to keep our investigation of the slave raid secret? No, no, that'll be impossible. But don't you worry, Chief Tipo. I'll explain their presence here. Yep. There we are now. Everything looks all right now. <clears throat> I finally got Marsha and Larry settled, Clint. Splinters is scared to death. The octopus will get him, and Dawa's guarding all three of them as if his life depended on it. I don't blame him. I know how I feel when there's an octopus gangster around. Mr. Paul Mounier calling. Oh, uh... uh... Well, bring him in here, please. Gosh, I'm sick of all this smiling and fancy talk when I want to knock the guy down and jump on him. Ah, don't you worry. You'll soon have your chance, Barney. But right now, take it easy. Okay. Mr. Paul Mounier. Ah, good morning, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Mr. Mr. Mounier. You seem mighty happy about something this morning, Mr. Mounier. I have good reason to be happy, Mr. Dunlap. I am on the verge of completing my greatest scientific experiment. Yeah? And what might that be? Well, uh, 
<laughs> I'm afraid it is too technical and involved to go into detail now. Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm sure of that. What are you doing down here, Mr. Mounier? Well, I just happened to be out for a drive speed. Past near here, I thought I'd drop in for a short visit. We're always glad to see you. I was sure of that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, by the way, I noticed torchlight down here last night. It could even be seen from the pass of the Iron Dagger. Was it in the celebration of the picnic day, the incense of the whole world? No, we was lighting the field for our speed and Clint's landing. They flew up to Lake Tengri Noor. But of course, you wouldn't know about that. Oh, uh, we heard a rumor concerning some friends of ours that have been missing for a long time. Ah, and uh, did you find your friend? Uh, yes, yes, but they're very ill. Uh, may I ask uh, where they are now? We uh, sent them to Lhasa for medical care. You see, the Tibetan government has assumed responsibility for them. Ah, I see. Yeah. If anybody tried to hurt them now, it'd be just too bad. Yes, yes. I understand that the government is concerned about these strange disappearances in this province. Shepherds and peasants are dropping out of sight mysteriously. Have uh, you heard anything about this? Yeah, yeah, we heard a little. Hmm. And I noticed many of your men around the house as I came in, Chief Depot. It appeared almost as uh, as if the place were guarded. Guarded? Oh, no, Mr. Mounier. Well, as a matter of fact, the chief has had a report on these disappearances, Mr. Mounier, and brought some of his men here to investigate the stories. But uh, after questioning the families of the missing men, however, he believes that the shepherds were not kidnapped, but uh, just left because of their own accord. Ah, very interesting. Uh, then you will have no reason to remain in this neighborhood long, eh, Chief Depot? No, I think not, Mr. Mounier. Mm. Of course, it depends upon what word I receive from Nagchuka. It may be that I must return there today, eh, for a little while at least. Are you looking for something, Mr. Mounier? Uh, I? Uh, what? No, no. What makes you ask that? Oh, I just wondered. You looked like you was. Mm. Barney's always wondering things like that. Don't mind him, Mr. Mounier. Ah, yes, yes. Well, I, I must be keeping you from your duties, gentlemen. I think I shall continue my ride. Please give my regards to Mr. Tsiring. We sure will. Drop in any time. Yeah. We want to come up and see that new experiment of yours soon, too. Ah, I shall be more than delighted, Speed. And you shall not have long to wait. Uh, Mr. Barlow, I... Uh, I trust you are progressing in your pursuit of uh, the octopus. Uh, not as fast as we'd hoped, Mr. Mounier, but uh, we'll get him sooner or later. And I shall aid in his capture. You may depend on that. I hope so, Chief Depot. That is your duty. However, I still think that Mr. Barlow and Mr. Dunlap are mistaken. I do not believe that this criminal is anywhere in Tibet. Oh, yes. Well, you go right on believing but we'll surprise you one of these days. <laughs> yes? <laughs> well, goodbye. Mm. Goodbye, goodbye eh? Mr. Meunier. Oh, pardon me. You say these friends of yours are in Lhasa? Uh, yes. I see. Mm. <laughs> well, goodbye. Look, goodbye. Look, 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 you are among friends, Mr. What is that? Why, uh, nothing. Goodbye, Mr. Mounier. But I distinctly heard someone mention Marsha Winfield and splinters. What do you know about splinters? I? Nothing. But it is uh, an odd name. You seem mighty concerned about something you know nothing about. I am concerned because you did not tell me the truth, gentlemen. Why should you lie to me? Marsha Winfield is here. That girl is one of your friends. One of the friends you rescued from Tengrino. How do you know that, Mr. Mounier? Never mind how I know, Speed. I demand to see her. You demand? By what right? Get out of here! Someone's having trouble. Quick, let's get in there.
Dixon of the International Secret Police. and the guise of Paul Mounier calls on speed Clinton Barney the morning following Marsh's rescue. Wishing to halay his suspicion that they are nearer trapping him than ever before, Clint tells the criminal that Marsha and her brother have been sent to Laza for medical treatment. Instead, they are in the next room with Splinters guarded by Dawa. Just as the octopus is about to leave, Splinters cries out in terror and attempts to escape through the window. Speed and Barney dash to Dawa's aid, but Clint remains behind to keep an eye on the octopus. <laughs> Why did you not tell me the truth, Paolo? Why did you say you had sent your friends to Lasso when obviously they are here? I did not tell you the truth, Mounier, because I didn't want the octopus to know that they were still in this house. What do you mean? Rumors get about, you know. I don't know what you mean. Well, I haven't time to explain now, Mounier. Come, I'll show you to the door. But I should like to see your friends. Not now. I'll see you to the door. Barney, Miss Marcia knows me. You're all right, Miss Marcia. Look, it's me, Speed Gibson. We rescued you. Oh, Speed, Speed. You'll never know how glad I am to be. Hey, help me hold Splinters down, Chief Chief. He's acting like a crazy man. Yes, Mr. Dunlap, quiet, quiet. Nothing will harm you, but you will just remain quiet. Don't let him get me. The octopus knows I'm here now. Splinters tried to escape, Barney. He tried to get through the window. I did my best to hold him, but... He would have escaped had you not made your timely entrance. Yeah, well, he's quieting down now. Oh, Barney, your face looks so good to me. You're the first person that's ever said that, Marcia. But seriously, we're sure glad we found you. We never thought you'd snap out of your stupor so soon. Oh, it's been horrible, Barney. Every time I regained consciousness, splinters would give me more of the vapors of sleep. Now, as I look back, it seems like an awful nightmare. Well, you can relax now, Miss Marcia. You're safe. But my brother, where is... Oh, he's okay. He's still asleep. See, he's right over here. Oh, thank heaven. I wonder how Mr. Barlow explained this sudden outburst to the octopus in the other room. The octopus here? Now, don't get excited all over again, Marcia. He's harmless, for the time being, at least. You see, he's disguised himself as a scientist. Paul Mounier, he calls himself. He can't act like anything but a scientist while he's around us. Yeah, the only time we have to worry about him is when he's not around us. You said it, kid. Shall I go into the next room and see what Mr. Barlow is doing? No, I got a hunch he'll be along pretty soon. Why, Marshal. Marshal Winfield. Why, oh, you're yourself again. Oh, yes, Clint. And it seems like heaven to wake up and see friendly faces again. I've lived in such terror. Oh, it wasn't that bad. I treated you all right, didn't I? But you were a member of the octopus band, Spinders. I knew that you meant to kill us eventually. Oh, I did not. That was Quan Wu's idea. Where's the octopus, Clint? Well, I made sure that he left speed. I took him to the door myself and then luckily ran into Mr. Tsi Ring. He was coming in to see what all the noise was about. But when I said Mr. Meunier was leaving, uh, <laughs> he took the hint and said that he would see him to the car. <laughs> I bet the octopus didn't like that a bit. He would have given anything to get into this room. Yeah, no, he wanted to kill me. Uh, by the way, were you the cause of all that commotion, Splinters? I'll say he was. When we came in, Splinters was trying to fly out the window like a cuckoo bird, and Dawa was hanging on to him like a bulldog. But I could not have held him much longer. He is very strong. Now, Marsha, you feel like telling us a little of what has happened? Evidence is piling up against the octopus. But what you can tell us will be conclusive proof of his guilt. Of that, I'm sure. Oh, yes, I'll tell you everything I can, Clint. But the vapors of sleep so deadened my mind that I may be very vague on certain things. Don't worry about that, Miss Marsha. Just tell us what you can remember. Well, I remember very little of the actual kidnapping speed. The last I knew, I was safe in Hong Kong. And when I next became conscious, I was in a plane with splinters. Yeah, we almost caught up with you before you left Hong Kong. If we'd only known you was in that box. Box? What box? Uh, We'll tell you our side of the story later, Marsha. What happened next? Well, we flew directly to Tengri Noor. There were two Tibetans awaiting us. 
octopus men, I learned later, and also my brother Larry. I was so happy to find him alive that I forgot for the time that we were octopus prisoners. Did Larry know you when he saw you? Oh, yes. And he almost went crazy when he realized that I was the victim of the octopus, too. Yeah, I'll say he did. First thing I knew, he punched me on his jaw, and I hadn't done a thing. Poor Larry. Of course, he never had a chance, and had we both managed to escape, I doubt if we ever would have reached civilization alive. Probably not, Miss Winfield. The great plains of the Chang Tang are bitter cold, and you probably would have escaped from the octopus men only to fall into the hands of the brigands that infest that region. Who is this boy? Oh, this is Dawat Siring, Marsha, the son of our host, La Shout Siring, who has done much to make your rescue possible. Oh, I'm so grateful. How can I ever express my thanks to them? Your presence here is thanks enough, Miss Winfield. Say, the kid's doing all right. Wish I had a line like that with a lady. Uh, and quietly. Now, uh, continue, Marsha. Well, right after Larry's outbreak, they started giving him unusually heavy doses of the vapors of sleep so that I had no more opportunity to question him as to what happened. I had to sit there day after day watching Larry grow thinner and thinner. They dressed us both as Tibetans and stained our skins darker so that if anyone should see us, they would not wonder at us. The dirty dogs. Well, how did you ever manage to tell that holy man your troubles, Miss Marcia, so he could give your message to Clint? I prayed for that opportunity, Speed. What? You mean you talked to that llama? I thought you was asleep. I know you did, Splinters. You see, Clint, sometimes Splinters would let a day or so pass without giving me any of the sleep papers so that he could talk to me. Yeah, I had to talk to somebody. I was going crazy up there. The other two guards didn't know much English. If you were so desperate, why did you not take Miss Winfield and our brother and put them in your plane and fly to Lhasa and safety? Yeah, Lhasa ain't safe when the octopus is after you. No place is safe. This is Chief Tipo, Miss Marcia. Chief of the peace officers of this province. You've made good friends in Tibet, Speed. Uh, we of Tibet are grateful to the secret police, Miss Winfield. At first, their story of Paul Mounier being the octopus was not believed. I could do nothing to help them officially, but within the last few days, slave raids have begun. Slave raids? Splinters has given us evidence enough to stop that. And now you bring us all that we need to capture this monster and end his criminal activities once and for all. Oh, I hope so, Chief Tipo. Uh, you were about to tell us how you got the message to us. Oh, yes. Well, when I was not under the influence of the sleep vapors, I could think of nothing but escape. Even when I was talking to Splinters, I was thinking of that. So that's why you was always absent-minded when I tried to talk to you. Yes, Splinters. And I finally hit upon the idea of pretending to be under the influence of the vapors when I wasn't at all. I'd pretend to be asleep or else just stare straight ahead. And Splinters took it for granted that the dose of vapors lasted longer on me than on my brother. That was very clever of you. I was desperate, Dawa. I knew it was our only chance. Well... Weeks passed, and no one ever passed the hut, at least while I was conscious to see them. And then, one day, Splinters and the other two guards went out hunting. Both Larry and I had had a heavy dose of the vapors the night before. Poor Larry had had so much that he didn't even wake up. But I did, though I pretended to sleep on. I saw Splinters and the others leave, and then I got up and went to the window. Somehow I knew that a traveler would pass that day. You had a hunch. Clint often has them and plays them. Yes, Speed. Well, I waited eagerly, and I almost cried with joy when I glimpsed the holy man approaching. Splinters and the others were out of sight by that time, so I ran out of the hut to attract his attention. I'll bet he was surprised. He was. At first, he thought me a Tibetan woman in need of help. I was afraid he might not understand English, but fortunately he did, and he listened to my story intently. I do not wonder... Our holy men are ever ready to help the unfortunate. I have learned that, Dawa. And when I told the Lama everything, I asked him to get in touch with you somehow. You see, I thought you might still be in China. I didn't know how he could reach you. I merely hoped for the best. Well, he reached me all right. It was very strange. Yes. You see, after I had told him your name and that you were in the secret police, he walked away a few steps and seemed lost in the deepest concentration. When he returned to me... He said that you all were in Tibet and that he would contact you the day he arrived in Lhasa. But how could he know that? That's what I asked him, Speed. But he merely smiled at me gently and said, My mind directs me, my child, and it has never failed me yet. Then I tried to describe Clint to him, 
But he shook his head and said that he already knew how you would look. Suffering wang doodles. It is nothing to be wondered at, Barney. We see instances of this same thing almost every day in Tibet. We have learned and recognized the power of the mind. It was then that Splinters and the others returned. I saw them in time and warned the Lama. He seemed to understand and suggested that I appear asleep so as not to arouse their suspicions. He talked to them a while, and then he left. And since you rescued us, Clint, I gather that the Lama found you as he said he would. Well, he certainly did. He met me on the turquoise roof bridge that leads to the Portala. Called me by my name and gave me your message. Yeah, I give up. It's bad enough fighting things you can see and feel, but you can't fight magic. It is not magic, Splinters, but a simple truth. Well, you've told us enough to finish the activities of the Octopus Marshal. Can I help you any more, Clint? Well, first, we're going to take you and your brother to Nag Chukar, where Dr. Kingsley and Jean are awaiting news of you. The doctor will restore you to health in no time. Little Jean and the doctor. Oh, it all seems too good to be true. Bob Gilmore's there, too, Miss Marcia. He was your brother's pal. We swore him into the secret police because he was so anxious to find you and Larry. Oh, how kind of you. I hope that your brother may regain consciousness while we're in Nagchukar, Marsha. He'll be able to tell us a lot about the octopus, I'm sure of that. Meantime, I'll swear out a warrant for Paul Mounier's arrest, Chief Tipo. We have the necessary proof now. Uh, yes, and I am most happy that we are able to stop this criminal in time. Well, I... I hope we'll be in time, Chief Tipo. Huh? What do you mean, Clint? We got all the proof we need Yes, but the octopus has a fleet of dangerous fighting planes stationed at Black Pass, Barney. Don't forget that. We'll have to keep them grounded before we can make a move to arrest the octopus. Otherwise, we'll have an open war on our hands. Well, how do you do that, Clint? Well, that's up to Chief Tipo. Have your men authority at the Black Pass, Chief? Yes, Mr. Barlow. We can go anywhere in Tibet. Good. Then send a strong detachment of them to Black Pass for a friendly inspection. And see that they're well armed. With Tibetan authorities on the ground... The octopus pilots don't dare take off for the pass of the Iron Dagger. The International Secret Police. Marsha Winfield, rescued from a hut at Lake Tengrinor by Speed and Clint, has recovered from the effects of the vapors of sleep. She tells the boys all she can remember concerning her kidnapping and imprisonment at the lake, while Splinters, the renegade aviator, tells of the octopus slave traffic and of his base of operations at the foot of the Himalayas. Now, Speed, Clint, and Barney have the positive proof they needed to arrest the octopus. But they must first make sure that he cannot send for his fleet of fighting planes stationed at Black Pass. We find them fast approaching Nagchuka with Marsha, her brother Larry, who is still unconscious, and Chief Tipo. 
Well, nobody's tried to stop us yet and take Miss Marsh and her brother away from us, Clint. Yeah, we've moved too fast for the octopus this time, Steen. When he discovered that we had Marsh over this yet, he lost his head completely. Why, well, almost gave himself away in his anxiety to see her and perhaps silence her forever. Even the very mention of that criminal frightens me. Don't blame your bet, Marsha, but you needn't worry. He can't touch her now. Not with us around. Is the second car still following us, Mr. Barrow? Mm, yes, Chief Depot. <laughs> the Tibetans that see us pass stop and stare. I, I imagine they haven't seen two automobiles at a time go along this road. Especially now with such important people in them. Ain't every day a Tibetan can take a squint at the secret police. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wonder what Spinners is thinking, riding back there with those other two octopus gangsters. I bet he wishes he was in our car. Would they harm him for telling you what he knows? They'd like to, I guess, Miss Marcia. But they can't hurt him. Not with Chief Tipo's men in the car with him. What are you so quiet about, Clint? You've been thinking about something ever since we left Mr. Searing's house. And I'm thinking about those planes at Black Pass, Bonnie. The octopus knows we may learn a lot from Marsha and Splinters now, so I imagine he's already ordered them to stand ready for a takeoff. And then they'll attack anybody who bothers the octopus, huh? Absolutely. And it won't be any halfway measures either. With the modern fighting equipment he has, the octopus could gain control of Tibet by striking now. And if he did this... He would be a serious threat to the peace of the world. Does he actually dare think that he might someday rule the entire world, Mr. Barlow? Yes, I believe so, Chief Tipo. The octopus has a brilliant brain. It's a little too brilliant. From what he has done in the past, I think he's crossed the borderline between sanity and insanity. You mean he's cracked? I'm sure of it. That would explain a lot of things. I don't think anybody, no matter how much of a criminal he was, would even try to do the things the octopus has. Unless he was kind of off his base. Ah, there is Nike Chuka just ahead, Miss Winfield. Soon we shall be with your friends and your brother shall have the correct medical care. Oh, I'm so glad, Chief Tipo. Poor Larry. He's all right, Miss Marcia. Barney and I have got him propped up between us. He's plenty comfortable. Can you send some of your men to Black Pass right away, Chief Tipo? I'll feel a lot happier when I know them octopus flyers are grounded by red tape. Uh, I shall send my men there as soon as I reach my office, Mr. Dunlap. In fact, if you do not need me for the next 24 hours, I may go with them to Black Pass. We must be certain that those aviators do not take off. Say, that's a swell idea. What do you think, Clint? It sounds good to me. Knowing the danger as he does, Chief Tipo will allow nothing to escape his notice. And that's important. The smallest thing might wreck our plans now, even though we're holding the right weapons in our hands at last. I'll say so. Look, we're in Nagchuka. How do you like it, Miss Marcia? It's so quaint, isn't it, Steve? I'll say. Quaint but severe, Marcia. Nobody can pass through Nagchuka without being questioned as to who they are and what their business is in Lhasa or any place else in Tibet. Of course they're more careful of who goes into Lhasa because it's their holy city. Dawa was telling me all about it. Dawa is very interesting, isn't he? Yeah. I wish he could have come with us to Nagchuka. I wanted him to meet Gene. But we had too much business to finish to bother with meetings. You said it. All I'm interested in meeting now is the octopus. Well, say, isn't that the hotel where Dr. Kingsley and the others are staying, Chief Tipo? Ah, yes, Mr. Barlow. I shall leave you all there and then continue to my office. I must take care of our prisoners and make arrangement for the journey to Black Pass, as well as make a report to my superiors concerning what we have learned. Will you get us that warrant for the arrest of the octopus at the same time? I certainly will. Good. We'll hold it until we hear from you that all is safe at Black Pass. And then we'll go after our enemy at the Pass of the Iron Dagger. Life is just one pass after another in Tibet. <laughs> and people making passes at you, Barney. This ain't no time to make jokes, kid. Look, here we are at the hotel now. Instead of joking, help us with Larry Winfield. Sure I will. Uh, are you going to your office now, Chief Tipo? Uh, yes, I shall come back here as soon as possible for last-minute orders, Mr. Barlow. Good. And now, Marsha, in a few minutes you'll be safe with Dr. Kingsley and Jean again. After all this time, safe at last. OC4 calling the Black Pass. OC4 calling the Black Pass. Standing by. Come in. Black Pass replying to OC4. Black Pass standing by for two-way conversation. Is this Chen? Yes, Octopus. You fool! Do you not know better than to mention my name over the air like that? I am sorry, Master. But since we are using this ultra shortwave set you have perfected, I thought it impossible for anyone else to be able to listen to us. The secret police are able to do anything, Chen. However, I do not think they are listening at this moment. I have called you as my chief pilot to prepare to leave Black Pass as soon as I give you the word. Leave the pass? 
I shall be most happy to do that. It is becoming colder and colder here. <laughs> you will find it warm enough where you will be going. What do you mean, Master? I want you to prepare the planes for attack. Mount all the machine guns, give the pilots plenty of ammunition, and get ready to for open war. War? On the secret police? On the secret police and all of Tibet, if necessary. They are not prepared for attack. They believe in peace in this country. <laughs> that is good. Good for me. They shall be easily conquered. But what has brought all this about? I knew that you would summon us to you, but I did not know we would attack Tibet. I did not know that either, at least that the attack would come at this time. But it is necessary. Clint Barlow rescued the Winfields from Lake Tengreno and took Splinters and the other two guards prisoners. By my honored ancestors, then we are lost. The prisoners will tell off everything concerning your activities. We are not lost because of you and the others at Black Pass, Chan. But now you understand why you must get the men and the planes ready for action. I do, Master. I go. Give me 24 hours and we shall be ready for any deeds that you wish. Good. <laughs> I knew I could depend on you, Chan. The foolish secret police think that they have beaten me because they have a few witnesses. <laughs> But they forget my army of planes. It will be a pleasure to reawaken their memories with machine gun bullets. But meantime, I have another little surprise for them. Oh, Marsha. Marsha, I'm so glad to see you again. I'm so glad. There, there, Jean, honey. <laughs> Don't cry. Oh, I can't understand girls. They cry when they're unhappy, and then they cry when they ought to be happy, too. That's just it, Speed. I'm so happy, I'm crying. Beats me. And when you get as old as me, Speed, you'll know even less about women than you do now. <laughs> I wonder what Dr. Kingsley is learning about Larry's condition. Uh, now, don't you worry, Marsha. Larry's going to be all right. Between the doc and Clint, they'll find out what's wrong with him in no time. Yeah, they've been in the other room with him a long time. Ought to be coming out pretty soon. It was so thrilling to see Marsha's brother. I've heard so much about him. He always seemed sort of like Prince Charming to me. As thin and sick looking as he is, Jean? Do you really think he looks like Prince Charming? Yes, I do, Barney. If you were a prince and were held captive by an ogre, you'd be thin, too, wouldn't you? Well, you got something there, Jean. Guess I would at that. What do you mean, ogre? Why, the octopus, of course. There you go again, still talking in riddles. Why don't you call things by their right names? Oh, I try to, Speed. So it's a miracle that he came through his experience alive, Glenn. Well, I can readily understand that, Dr. Kingsley. Oh, Doctor, how is Larry? Well, he's suffering mostly from malnutrition. They almost starved him to death, Marsha. Rest, care, and plenty of good nourishing food will fix him up in no time. Oh, thank heaven. Then he's not unconscious from the vapors of sleep, huh? Yes, they affect him so strongly, Speed, because he's so weak. It's fortunate for Marsha that Splinters had a shiverous streak in his nature. She was fed a little better. If I'd known that Larry wasn't getting enough... Oh, you would have given him your food, eh? Then Speed and Clint would never have brought you back alive from Tengrenor, Marshal. No, and as long as it all came out in the wash, we ought to be glad. Too bad Bob Gilmore isn't here to be on the welcoming committee, too. He went out just about half an hour before you came, Barney. Was going to the police office, he said, to see if they'd heard anything more from you. Well, he'll probably see Chief Tipo there and learn that we're here. Say, that reminds me. Chief ought to be getting here pretty soon, shouldn't ah, he? Ah, no, wait a minute. Hold on, Speed. Don't be so impatient. The chief has a lot to accomplish in a short time, you know. I'm so anxious to learn the details of all that's happened since we last saw you, Speed. But I think I better look after Marsha now. Her strength is about gone. Yeah, she's been swell, Dr. Kingsley. She was real weak and scared when she came to, but she told us all she knew about the octopus. Well, uh, the reaction must be setting in now. I'll depend on you, Doctor, to take care of Marsha and Larry. You need have no fear in that respect, Clint. Come, Marsha. I'll take you to your room. And, uh, Jean, you come along. You'll be able to help Marsha a lot. All right, Daddy. You won't go while I'm helping Marsha, will you, Speed? No, Jean. We'll wait. Goodbye for now, then. And thank you from the bottom of my heart. Don't thank us, Marsha. Rescuing people like you isn't work. It's a pleasure. <laughs> goodbye. Yeah, goodbye. 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 We'll see you later, then. Well, that's that, Clint. It's a big relief to have Miss Marsha and Larry safe, isn't it? 
Yes, Speed. Now we have nothing to think about but the capture of the octopus. And we'll go after him as soon as Chief Depot gives us the word that all's quiet at Black Pass? Yes. Meanwhile, we'd better go back to Mr. Searing's home. We can keep a careful watch on the pass of the Iron Dagger from there. Yeah. Before we go, maybe Larry Winfield will come, too, enough to talk. Or maybe Splinters can tell us some more. Suffering wang doodles. Who's trying to break down the door? I'll see who it is. Chief Chief Mr. Barlow! Mr. Barlow! Splinter and the two other guards! What, what about Splinters? A band of men rushed us just as we were about to go into my office, and Splinters and the others were shot! Shot! You mean. He means that Splinters will never talk again! <laughs> The International Secret Police. Clint and Barney take Marsha Winfield and her brother to Dr. Kingsley in Nagchuka. Chief Tipo accompanies them with splinters and the other two octopus guards as his prisoners. Just as he is about to take them into his office, they are shot by octopus gangsters who make their escape in the ensuing excitement. The octopus thus begins his destruction of those who may bear witness against him and also orders his chief pilot, stationed at Black Pass with a large fleet of planes, to stand ready for an attack when he gives the command. Suspicioning this... Clint sends Chief Tipo and his men to Black Pass to halt the takeoff. We find the boys talking over last-minute plans before returning to the house of La Chaute Ring. No, I told Bob Gilmore to stand ready with as many men of Nag Chukar's police as could come with him. When we attack the octopus, we're going to need all the manpower we can get. I'll say so, Clint. Before he left for Black Pass, Chief Tipo left orders that this office should help us in every possible way. Yes, I know. And Bob is getting lined up now. You know, he's glad to really get in and fight. He's been hanging around Nagchuka for so long, unable to really do anything. But he's ready to go now. Yeah, seeing Marsha Winfield's condition and Larry's, that was the last straw. He sure liked Miss Marsha, didn't he? Who wouldn't? Marsha has plenty of spunk, all right. And good looks, too. Uh, ahem. Now to get back to the attack, Barney. I told Bob I'd send word as soon as he should join us. Is Chief Tebow going to come back right after he's grounded the octopus aviators at Black Pass, Clint? No, Barney. He took a portable shortwave set along with him. He'll let us know if everything's quiet over that way. No, you're wrong, Speed. Tebow took the shortwave set along to use only in case of trouble. If he and his men arrive too late, if the planes have already taken off, then he'll immediately let me know by shortwave so that we can be ready for them. Otherwise, he'll leave most of his men at the pass and return to Lhasa to aid us in our attack on the octopus himself. Oh, I see. Hey, what about Mardak? Huh? What are you talking about, Speed? Mardak. 
The village at the foot of the Himalayas, where the octopus sends the slaves before they start over the mountains to India. Remember Splinter's telling us about that? Yeah, poor guy. Lucky for us, he talked when he did. I'll say so. Splinter's made a lot of mistakes, but I think he paid for them by giving us so much information about the octopus. Don't you, Clint? Yes, he certainly did, Speed. And had Splinter's lived, I think he would have changed his ideas of right and wrong. Uh, but that's all past now. Uh, what's this about Mardek? Well, why don't we send some of Chief Tipo's men there to keep an eye on things? Hey, you got something there, kid. Then when we give the word, we'll have two important octopus outposts tied up solid. Black Pass and Marduk. And we'll take him ourselves. Say, that's a great idea, Speed. Why the dickens did I let that slip by? Oh, gee, you've got so much to think about, Clint. You've got the whole responsibility of this case. Well, I just help out where I can. <laughs> I don't think the kid will ever get the big head, Clint. No, he's got more sense than that. But let's get to this work on the Marduk idea. With Tibetan peace officers there, those slaves won't start over the Himalayas. Nor will the octopus be able to recall his men from Mardak. By that time, they'll be our prisoners. Swell. Are we about ready to start back to Sea Ring's house now? Uh, as soon as we send off a detachment of men to Mardak. Oh, and I want to send a cable to Chief Riley, too, saying that the case is about to break. Clint? Uh, yes, Bean. Suppose, in spite of all these plans, we won't catch the octopus. What then? Well, then we'll have to think of other plans, Bean. But I have a hunch that we've got him in a corner this time. We've got too much on him. Marsh's story, Splinter's testimony, and if Larry Winfield is well enough to talk soon, he'll be able to tell us a lot as well. You said it. No matter what hole he tries to slip out of, the octopus will find it guarded by secret police. Boy, it's going to be a big thrill. It sure will be, Speed. Well, are we ready to start? Yes, the Kingsleys and Marsh and her brother will be safe here. Since the attack on Splinters and the others, Tipo stationed a special guard for them. Let's get that detachment off for Mardak and then hit for T Ring's house. I got a hunch that things are going to start popping pretty soon. And when they do, I want to be in the front row. So, splinters and the other two are silent forever, huh? Yes, master. Your orders were carried out to perfection. <laughs> Good. Now, if I could only reach the Winfields as well. They are even more dangerous than Splinters. Lawrence Winfield in particular. Our spies have learned that he is still unconscious. It will probably be many days before he can speak. And by that time, I will have struck a blow at Tibet that will make her mine. Then let the secret police run for their lives. What do you think they may be up to now, Master? Were they not in Nagchuka, according to the last report? Yes. But Chief Tipo and some of his men had left the city a little previously. Their destination was unknown. Bah! These Tibetan spies are stupid. They learn only half of what they should. They are not used to spying, Master. I shall teach them, never fear. You say a guard has been stationed around Dr. Kingsley and the others? Yes, and a very strong one. Ah. <laughs> Clint Barlow fears he may lose his witnesses, and well he might. I shall not attempt to silence their tongues now when they are on the lookout for an attack. I shall bide my time and strike when they do not expect me to. Meanwhile, I shall start the slave caravan from Mardak. Master, do you think it's safe at this time? Would it not be better to wait a while? Safe? Of course it is safe. No one would dream of a slave traffic through such a small village as Mardak. Perhaps Splinter has mentioned that name. Before he was shot? I think not. Remember, he was badly wounded shortly after he left Tengrino. He was in no condition to talk, and my men silenced him at Nagchuka, just as he was entering the police office. <laughs> no, Splinters had no time to talk of that, I'm sure. You are not as cautious as you once were, Master. You are growing careless with overconfidence. You question my wisdom? Master, my life depends on your wisdom. And my goodwill. Do not forget that, Kwan Wu. No, I never shall. Very well. I expect to have enough slaves at Mardak within the next week to make it worthwhile to start a caravan over the Himalayas. Have you made all arrangements in India? Of course. Boats will be awaiting the caravan at an isolated spot. Slave traffic is a safe business, Kwan Wu, and it pays well. If you are not discovered. Master? Yes? Another message has just come from Nagchuka. The secret police have left. They are returning to Lashot Tsigring's house. It is increasingly hard to learn anything about their activities. 
All Nagchuka seems to be on their side. Mm, very well. That is all. Yes, master. Does all this not arouse your suspicion, master? The secret police are accomplishing things. Yes, yes, they must be stopped. I do not like this mysterious journey of Chief Depot's either. Something has gone wrong, and whatever it is, I must check it. What do you intend to do? I'm going to contact Chen, my chief pilot of Black Pass again. Tell him to bring all my planes here. Here? So that the secret police and the Tibetan authorities will know? Know what? That I have planes? I can explain that as a scientist. I can say that I needed certain supplies immediately, that they were flown here by plane. That will satisfy the Tibetan authorities. As for the secret police, let them think what they will. So long as they cannot prove anything, they are helpless. But the slaves in the rooms below or on the road to Matak, if they are discovered by Barlow and the others, they will have all the proof they need to end our activities. Yes, Wu, if they discover the slaves. But by that time, I will have my planes here from Black Pass. <laughs> This is the end of our ride. There is the Black Pass just ahead. Now remember, keep your men ready for action if I have trouble. But I do not expect any. Yes, sir. I see planes, but no men. Uh, they must be in those crude buildings that have been erected. Yes, Chief Tipo. It appears so. Uh, Black Pass is bitter cold. Yes. The horse's breath freezes in this icy wind. Uh, that larger building must belong to the head of the company. Is everyone prepared? Yes, all are prepared. Very well. Halt the men. Yes, Chief Tipo. Oh, are you? I am Chief Tipo of the Tibetan peace officers. Word has been brought to us that the planes were here. So we have come to make the customary inspection. Inspection? But why? It is the rule. No one may enter or leave Tibet without declaring themselves. Did you do that at the border? No. We flew over and did not stop. I know. And that is why we have come, to learn who you are and why you have come to Tibet. But I have no time to give you this information now. I have just had orders from my commander to leave back pass immediately. I have relayed these orders to my pilot. That is why we saw no men, Chief Tipo. They must be already in the planes. We are just in time. Wait, wait. Yes. What does he mean, just in time? Simply that if we had come an hour later, you would not have been here. Who is your commander? I told you I have no time to talk now. Later, I... I... have full authority to force you to talk, Mr. Chan. Uh, you are Chinese, of course. Yes. Who is your commander? He has... Keep the... your hands away from that gun. Uh, why did you fire into the air? That was a signal. Yes, Chief Tipo. The planes are going to take off. Quick, spin up. Get every one of those planes and bring their pilots here. Yes, bring them if you have to drag them out of the plane. You cannot do this. We are merely testing the planes. They are about to take off on a test flight. They shall not take off, Mr. Chan. You have gone against the command of the Tibetan government. And as long as you are on Tibetan ground, you must obey those commands. But we mean no harm. I do not know what you mean. Giving that signal to start when you knew we had come to inspect your camp is most suspicious. But I do not understand this inspection. You do not need to understand it. It is the law. Drop that gun. Don't move. I've got you covered. The law is it. We'll see how much good your law is going to do you in black pass.
Gibson of the International Secret Police. Feeling zero. Feeling zero. Feeling zero. Feeling zero. With the aid of Chief Tipo, the secret police are slowly but surely closing in on the octopus and his gang, sending a detail of men to Mardak, a tiny village from where the slave caravan will start over the Himalayas. Speed, Clint, and Barney return to Tsering's home, leaving Bob Gilmore with orders to collect another band of police and stand prepared to leave Nagchuka at a moment's notice. Meanwhile, Tipo and his men have arrived at Black Pass and find the octopus aviators just about to take off. When Chan, the chief pilot, attempts to fight his way out of the raid, a general free-for-all follows, and we find ourselves at Black Pass, where the tide of battle is slowly receding. Yeah. Ah, you're going. Ah, ah. All right, stand back. All right, stand where you are. Stand back. Chief Tipo, Chief Tipo, we have arrested all the pilots. The camp is ours. Excellent, and here is another prisoner for you. Chan, the chief pilot. Oh, Tipo, you are wounded. Uh, just a flesh wound. Chan attempted to kill me, but I sprang on him in time to spoil his aim. Where are the rest of the men? They are cutting off the plane motor. Good. Now, Chan, let us go into your office. You still have not answered my questions. Do you wish me to accompany you? No, you remain here. I leave you in charge of the prisoners. Disarm them and search the camp. And see that no one enters or leaves Black Pass. Yes, Chief Tipo. His house appears to be strongly built. You made sure that you would not suffer from cold, Chan, did you not? I did not know how long we would have to stay in this forsaken pass. I see you have a short wave set. Do you contact your commander over that? You have little wisdom, Chan, if you seek to withhold anything from me now. You have revealed that you and your pilots are in Tibet for some evil purpose. Else, why did you attempt to escape when you knew there was to be an inspection? I do not know why we are in Tibet. I swear that. The commander issues orders only at the time they are to be carried out. But evidently you must have received an order from him to leave Black Pass. Else, why were the planes ready for a takeoff? And why did your pilot start the motors at your signal? I told you before, it was a test flight. Do not be a fool. Would interference with a test flight cause you and your men to attack us? To risk your lives in such a manner? We... We thought you were bandits. They infest Tibet. You knew better than that. You knew we were police. You feared an investigation. Who is your commander? I, I do not know his name. Tell me his name or I will have you beaten within an inch of your life, Chan. No, no I do not know. Tell me. Mm, very well. He has nothing to hide. He is Paul Mounier. Paul Mounier, the scientist? Yes. You know him? Who does not? But why does he command a fleet of fighting planes? Why? Many of his inventions are wanted by foreign countries to use for war instead of peace. My commander has to protect those inventions for the good of the world. Uh, for the good of the world, huh? Have you an axe? Axe? Yes. Uh, yes. It should be over here. Uh, yes. Here it is. Very well. Now, this short wave set of yours. What are you going to do? I am going to destroy it for the good of the world. Stop. Do not destroy it. Uh, too late, Chan. Uh, I feel better now that you cannot tell your commander what has happened. You have ruined our only communication with outside world. We shall perish. Oh, no. I have brought along a portable short wave set, Chan. But for our use only. Your use? Yes. I am going to call Clint Barlow of the secret police and tell him what has happened. What's that, Chief Tipo? You say you're wounded? Uh, yes, Mr. Barlow, but not seriously. Everything is in order here. Good. How soon will you return here? Immediately. As soon as my men are stationed here, I shall come back to you. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Hey, Barney, how would you like to fly to the Black Pass and pick up Chief Tipo? Yeah, uh, huh? Me? Yes, you. Gee, Clint, can I go too? Ah, uh, wait a minute, Speed. Let me get this settled. 
It's necessary that Tipo get back here as quickly as possible. And there's only one answer to that. By flying. Yeah, but why am I the goat? Flash out C-Ring's house is the only comfortable place I've seen since coming to Tibet. And you're all the time wanting me to leave here. Are you going or aren't you? Yeah, yeah, sure, I'll go. Tell him I'll be up there in an hour or so. Yeah, I'll make it four to be safe. Oh, Chief Tipo. Yes, Mr. Barlow? Barney is flying up to the Black Pass to get you. Stay there until he comes. Excellent. There's a great deal of work to be done here. And bring all papers you can find. They may give us more clues as to future plans. I understand. Shall I bring Chan as well? Uh, oh, the chief pilot? Oh, yes, yes. The more witnesses, the better. Very well. I shall see you shortly then. Signing off. Well, Barney, better dress warmly. It's cold up at the Black Pass, according to the chief. Thanks, pal. And so they had their orders to take off, and Tipo stopped them just in time, huh? Looks like the octopus knows what we're up to, Clint. Either that, or he's about to spring his biggest job, Speen. What's that? For a long time, he's been toying with the idea of ruling the world. That's another proof of his madness. However, succeeding as he has in criminal activity, the octopus now believes that he can succeed in anything. And for all we know, he may. We don't know how many men he's got behind him here. We can only guess. But with Black Pass and Mardak bottled up, his movements are going to be greatly hampered, Barney. Supposing he tries to get away, Clint. Leave to bed like he left Hong Kong. We'll stop that before he knows what's happened at the Black Pass. That's why I'm so anxious for Tipo to return here as soon as possible. With him on the ground, we can advance to the Pass of the Iron Dagger and nab our man once and for all. Sounds easy, but doing it's another thing. What's the matter with you all of a sudden, Grandma? You getting cold feet? Just when we're about to spring the trap? No, I ain't getting cold feet. But somebody's got to think things out around here. <laughs> Remember, Barney, Clint's the brains, you're the brawn. Now, you keep out of this, kid. This is between me and Clint. Ah, uh, talk less and do more, Barney. That plane should be checked over before your flight. Ah, that's where I'm one up on you. It's already been checked. You knew you were going someplace? Of course not, but I believe in being prepared, kid. Gee, it's going to be a swell flight. Can't I go along, Clint? No. No, I'll need you here, Speed. We've got to make plans for the attack on the Pass of the Iron Dagger. I want to have everything ready as soon as Barney and the chief return. Now listen, you have to work it out. Listen to this, Guan Wu. Speed and Barlow may give us some leads. Well, what can I do? I want you to find Mr. C. Reed Speed and tell him that you want to go to Nam Chukar again. Now, he'll take you there in his car. Go directly to Bob Gilmore and tell hey, him... Hey, the to... radio's still on. What? what? Sure, the set's wide open. You forgot to turn it off after Chief Tipo tuned out. Golly, that's right, Clint. Anybody could have been listening to what we've been saying. Even the octopus. No, I don't think so, Stephen. But we won't run any more chances of being overheard. <laughs> you may as well turn off our set, too, Quan Wu. We shall hear nothing more for the time being. It is too bad that the secret police discovered their set was open. I wonder what Speed Gibson was to tell Gilmore in Nogtuka. That matters little to me just now. I'm more interested in the plight of my aviators at Black Pass. Yes. Yes, that is a calamity. Tipo, the fool, destroys my ultra-short wave set there and then reveals all that he has accomplished over his portable set. <laughs> it was most fortunate that you tuned in on that conversation between him and the secret police. I knew that something was afoot. Your instinct for danger has saved our lives many a time, Master. Given us enough time to flee to safety. Yes, yes. <laughs> but we shall not flee from the secret police this time, Quan Wu. You cannot mean that, Master. They are closing in on every hand. Closing in, yes. But when I meet them, I shall destroy them completely. Clint Barlow spoke truly when he said I planned to rule the world. And I could find no better place to rule it from than isolated Tibet. Here I can build my organization to such proportions that no one will dare question my authority. I shall go on and on, long after Speed Gibson and the others are forgotten. But, Master, is such a course wise at this time? Would it not be better to fly away and return when the secret police have given up the search? No. Barlow drove me out of Hong Kong, but I shall meet him here. He shall learn who is the stronger. But Tipo is on his side. And once we start fighting, the Tibetan government will also aid him. That will avail nothing against me. Many men will answer my call, Quan Wu. My spies have done their work well. Gold speaks loudly in the ears of these ignorant peasants. 
They will work for whoever pays them. I am not so sure. Tibetans are very honorable. Ah, human beings are alike the world over. Every man has his price. Then what are we to do? How can we stop the attack on the pass of the Iron Dagger? If Barlow comes here tonight or tomorrow, the lower rooms will be filled with slaves. We cannot get rid of them immediately. Barlow will not leave Searing's house until Dunlap returns with Chief Depot. Yes? Dunlap is never going to return. How can you prevent that? You are going to fly there with the pilot who flew you to Tengrino. After Dunlap has picked up Tipo and is well on his way back, your pilot will attack the secret police plane and, under your directions, cause it to crash. But must I be there, Master? In such a fight, perhaps our plane will be the one to crash. <laughs> that is why I want you in it, Quan Wu. You'll be careful that such a thing will not happen if your life is involved. And Dunlap must never return from Black Pass. Yes. Master, I understand. I shall prepare to leave immediately. I shall order the pilot to time his departure so that you will meet Dunlap on his return flight. Very well. And what of the slave transfer here? I shall take care of that. Shall go on as usual. Meanwhile, I'm going to send out a call for all my operators in this province. A call? You mean they will gather here? Yes. And when Clint Barlow tires of waiting for Dunlap's return and decides to attack the castle without him, he and his friends will find a hearty welcome awaiting them. <laughs> My hospitality shall be so great that they shall never leave the pass of the Iron Dagger again. <laughs> of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Octopus listens in on the shortwave radio conversation between Chief Tipo at Black Pass and Clint Barlow at La Chaux Ring's home. He learns that his aviators have been grounded by Tipo's men and that Barney is going to fly to the pass and pick up Tipo and Chan, the chief pilot of the octopus. Speed, Clint, and the others will wait where they are until Barney returns. Then they will advance on the pass of the Iron Dagger to arrest the octopus. But the octopus has other plans. Meanwhile, we find the boys in Dawat Ziring and his father standing near the secret police plane. Gee, you've got swell weather for your flight, Barney. Yeah, but from what Chief Tipo said, it ain't so hot in Black Pass. In fact, it's freezing. Oh, Please. stop worrying and get going, Barney. I want Tipo back here as soon as possible. So that we can get ready to attack the pass of the Iron Dagger. Yeah, as soon as you take off, Mr. Ziring and me are going to Nogchuka to tell Bob Gilmore to gather his men and start for Lhasa. 
so that they'll be close to us when Clint gives the word to start for the pass. Okay, Speed. Supposing you climb into the plane and wind up the motors. Okay, Barney. Come along, Dawa. I shall be most pleased to enter uh, the You plane. must be on your guard in our chew car, Mr. Tsiring. I wouldn't dare send Speed there alone, and I feel I must stay here. Your mind may be at peace, Mr. Barlow. Speed is a second son to me. I shall guard him with my life. Yeah, sometimes he gets too anxious about doing his duty. He has to give the order to Bob. It has to come from a member of the secret police before it can be official. But other than that, it's up to you. Do not worry, Mr. Dunlap. Uh, there go the motors. Hope the octopus doesn't happen to be watching this takeoff. It might give him ideas. I don't think you have to worry about any trouble from the octopus. That is, just now. Thanks. That's a comfort. You are well armed, Mr. Dunlop? Oh, yeah. I saw to that. Maybe Chief Tipo has got everything under control at Black Pass, but I'm taking no chance. Uh, see that you waste no time there. Oh, here comes Speed and Dawa back. So it's all ready for you, fellow. Okay. We will walk over with you. Dawar, make a good fire, Clint. He got real excited when he saw the instrument board and controls. That's just the time you shouldn't get excited, Dawar. Supposing you got that way in the air. You'd go into a spin so quick it'd make your hair curl. But it is most wonderful, Barney. Speed pointed out the various things on the instrument board. The artificial horizon, the airspeed, the compass, the altimeter, turn and back indicator. Hey, hey, I know all the names, kid, and we haven't got time for a flying lesson now. I gotta take off. Oh, I am sorry. You needn't be. I'll give you a real lesson someday when we catch this doggone octopus. Well, so long, fellas. Uh, so oh, long, Barney. Bye, Barney. And be sure and check with me over short way when you arrive at Black Pass, Barney. And again, before you leave there. Okay, Clint. Goodbye. Again. Goodbye, and good luck to you. Good luck to you. I wish I was going with him. So do I, Steve. What a beautiful takeoff. The plane is like a bird. That's all in how you fly it, Dawa. Well, there she goes. Yes, and may he return safely. Now, Steve, shall we go to Nachuka? You bet. If we hurry, maybe Bob can get his men to Lhasa by the time Barney comes back. May I accompany you, honored male parent? No, Dawa. Perhaps you can help Mr. Barlow during our absence. Oh, can I? Uh, yes, Dawa. I'm going to formulate plans for the attack while we have the house to ourselves. And you can stay by the short wave set while I'm doing this. You know, Barney may talk to us any time now. Oh, excellent. I shall like that. Okay, we'll get going then, Clint. We'll be back in no time. Very well, Speed. But see that Bob Gilmore gets his orders straight. We've reached the point now where there can't be a slip-up. The secret police plane has disappeared in the distance at last. I cannot see it, even with these field glasses, Quan Wu. Then it is time for my departure, Master? Yes. Our plane is fully prepared for an attack. There will be no danger to you. I hope not, Master. I assure you, your pilot has no more wish to die than you. Is that not so, pilot? Yes, Master. It will be easy to destroy the secret police plane, since they will have no idea that they are being followed. Climb high with your plane, and then once Dunlap has left Black Pass with his passengers, rip the wings and body of their plane with your machine gun. And the Honorable Wu is to fire the machine gun? <laughs> yes, he's uh, very clever at that. Very. You will have enough to do, pilot, to keep our plane out of their line of fire, should they return any. I shall elude them. I have fought like this before. Stay behind the backbone of this mountain range until you draw close to Black Pass. Do not allow Dunlap to see your plane. He will immediately suspect something and be on his guard. But cheering seven? They will notice nothing. Besides, the pilot knows how to take off from the field behind this castle so as to barely skim over the mountain's crest. No one will see the takeoff. Very well. We may as well be off then. I have no liking for this flight and shall be glad when we have accomplished our business safely and land here again. <laughs> and I shall be most happy to see you, Kwan Wu. For then I shall know that one of the secret police, Barney Dunlap, will never interfere with my business again. I hear right this way, Mr. Dunlap. Uh, this is the main building of the Black Pass camp. Suffering wang doodles, but you got a mess of bad weather up here, Chief Tipo. 
My crate bucked like a bronc when I started to land in the pass. The downdrafts here are terrific. Ah, the Black Pass is horrible. Even worse than the pass of the Iron Dagger concerning the weather. Yeah, the octopus sure picks the right places for his headquarters. Well, what do we got here? Papers. Let me get these gloves off and my hands thawed out so that I can look them over. Ah, these are all I could find in the camp. We made a thorough search of all the quarters and the men as well. Swell. Ah, looks like some important stuff here, maps and all. But we ain't got time to study them now. I got to get you back to Clint as soon as possible. Where's Chan, your prisoner? Uh, one of my lieutenants has charge of him. I thought you might not want him to overhear what we say. I don't think it'll do him much good now. He'll never talk to the octopus again if we can help it. Has he changed his story any since you told us what he said over the short wave? No, as a matter of fact, he will not talk at all now. Oh, he won't, huh? I got a way of dealing with guys like that. It ain't exactly gentle, but it always works. Excellent. These men need such treatment. Yeah, so I judge by that arm of yours. Does it hurt much? It is nothing to speak of, Mr. Dunlap. Chan's bullet just creased the arm, but it, it left quite a hole in my coat sleeve. I'll say it did. Has the wound been treated? Uh, yes, and bandaged. Please think no more about it. Okay. Just let me put all these papers in my case, and then we'll be ready for the return flight. That is, if you're all set for the takeoff. Uh, yes, my men all have their orders. The octopus pilots, you know, are not very troublesome once they have been disarmed. Ah, they're yellow or they wouldn't be in with that guy in the first place. Well, let's go. I'm anxious to get away from this freezing place. Very well, I am ready. We can pick up Chan on the way. Ooh. Wow, there's snow in this wind. Hope we don't have a blizzard or something. Don't like ice on my wings, no how. Uh, I should think not. Oh, uh, my lieutenant has Chan waiting by the plane. Say, he doesn't waste any time, does he? No, my men are well trained. We have little trouble here in Tibet, save for the brigands, and even they are easily handled compared with the octopus and his criminal band. You said it, Chief. A Tibetan brigand is a little white kitten compared to the octopus. Well, here we are. Is this Chan? Uh, yes, yes. I see you got him handcuffed and everything. Into the plane with him. Uh, I shall follow, Mr. Dunlap. I want a last word with my men. Okay. Shut the door after you when you come in. I want to start up the motors before they freeze solid on me. Now, let's see, Chan. You sit here where Tipo can keep his eye on you. And don't try no funny business when we're in the air, see? Oh, won't we'll talk, huh? Okay, I don't think I'd like the sound of your voice if it matches that ugly map of yours. So you just sit real quiet and nice now while I turn over the motors. Boy, listen to those sweet babies run smooth as silk, even in this gosh awful weather. Uh, everything is ready, Mr. Dunlap. Good. I got Chan settled, I think, but you'd better keep an eye on him just in case. I want to let Clint know we're taking off now. Very well. Flight station Colin Barlow. Flight station Colin Barlow. Standing by. Come in, pal. Hello. Hello, Barney. Hello. Yeah, Clint. Everything's okay but the weather. A little snow. I'd say about a 200-foot broken ceiling. But I've got Tebow and Chan with me, and I'm about to leave Black Pass. Okay, we'll be looking for you. Check. So long. And now, Chief Tebow, let's go. Why, Mr. Dunlap, we are in the air. Sure. Are you surprised? And I fear we would not get away in the teeth of that wind. Yeah, but I've flown in worse breezes. I'm going to climb now, Chief. Maybe we can get above this wind. I hope so. I feel we may be dashed to the earth by its force at any moment. Not a chance with Dunlap at the stick. How's about it, Chan? Would you like to be flying this crate? Gabby guy, ain't he? Ah, he is very stubborn. I fear we shall learn little from him. Yeah, we will, all right. But even if we didn't, we have enough on the octopus now to send him, send him up for all of his eight lives. And then some. Hey, we're getting above the wind, all right. The riding's much easier. Yes, it's much better. Wait a minute, I hear something. Hear something? It's another plane. Where in heck is it? Look, I can see it from this window. It's right above us. It will crash into us. I see it. It's an octopus plane. A machine gun. Hang on, people. They ain't going to crash into us. They're just trying to blow us out of the sky.
Greg Gibson of the International Secret Police. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Ceiling zero. Speed has gone to Nagchuka to summon Bob Gilmore and his men to gather in Lhasa preparatory to an advance on the headquarters of the octopus in the pass of the Iron Dagger. His uncle Clint has remained at the house of La Chotzi Ring to formulate the best method of attack and also listen for word from Barney, who has flown to Black Pass for Chief Tipo and his prisoner Chen, chief pilot of the octopus squadron of planes. Meantime, another octopus plane containing Quan Wu has been waiting for Barney to start his return flight. The moment he gets in the air, the enemy plane drops like a hawk, spitting machine gun bullets at the plane piloted by the surprised Barney. The two planes are engaging in an aerial dogfight, and Barney is hard put to outmaneuver his enemy. What are you doing, then? I'm trying to dive out of his way. Then if we can play hide and seek in these clouds, I'm going to try and get above him and give him some of his own medicine. Get on our machine gun, Chief Keepo. Can you work one? Uh, yes, but how can I from a plane like this? Oh, it's a special job. Here, slide back that hatch. This? Yeah. That's right. Wait a minute now. We're in a cloud. I'm going to climb again. Now we're out of the storm. Can you see anything of the octopus plane? Not yet. He must have followed you into the clouds. You're telling me? That babe was on my tail every minute. We got enough holes in our wings to make a swell sieve. I only hope they hold up in this dogfight. Otherwise, you may learn how it feels to make a parachute jump. I hope not. Me too. Now, turn that crank by the machine gun, and you and the gun will rise a little. You'll be a better target for the other gunner. But you can get in some good licks yourself if you're smart. Can you work it? Uh, Yes, this is wonderful. Yeah. But when I bear down on this guy, if we ever find him, shoot. Shoot through the propeller? Yeah. It's time to a split second to miss it. Hey, there's that plane again. Uh, This time we have the advantage. We have if I can climb faster than he can. This crate is larger than his and not quite so fast. But I think I got a good enough start on him to turn and dive back on him when we gain enough altitude. (laughs) Ha, ha, ha. Look at Chan. He's scared stiff. You can laugh at a time like this, Dunlap? Sure, Tipo. I can always laugh if I got half a chance in a fight. And we got more than half a chance now. That other pilot never thought we'd live through his first attack. He's kind of worried now. And listen, he's gone again. How can he hope to hit us at this distance? I told you he was worried. He's wasting his ammunition. But I'm going to bear down on him now. So get ready to use that machine gun, Tebo. I'll give you the word when we're within range. I shall be ready. Let her go. Add up, boy, Tebo. You wink. They're bearing off. They'll escape. Not with me after them, they won't. They started something, and I'm going to finish it. And them. Okay, start shooting. You got him. You punctured the fuel tank. The ship's afire. There they go. Poor guys. But it was either them or us. Come on inside now, chief people, and we'll hit for home. And her brother. What an exciting life they have had. Well, excitement has its bad points as well as good, Dawa. <laughs> I guess you've learned that during our stay here. Huh? You mean uh, the episode concerning the arrow in the garden? Yes. <laughs> yes, that was very bad. 
Both Speed and I would have lost our lives had he not sensed the peril in time. Uh-huh, well, see, that sounds like a car. Must be your father and Speed. I shall see. It is, Mr. Barlow, and they have someone else with them. Someone else? Let me see. You see? They are helping him out of the car. Oh, yeah. What? Why, it's Larry Winfield. How could he have recovered as quickly as that? Oh, I don't know, Darwin. Those vapors of sleep that the octopus used on him were unknown to Dr. Kingsley. Without added doses, the recovery must be rapid. A little food and rest, and Larry seems to be well on the way to recovery. He is still very weak. Speed and my honored male parent are supporting him. Yes, so I see. Let's go to meet them, huh? They must have brought him here for a very important reason. <laughs> Speed is beaming like a plane beacon. Oh, here we are. Hi, Clint. Hi, Dalwan. Well, well how Steve. are you? <laughs> well, so, Lawrence Winfield is himself again, huh? You bet. As soon as he gets strong again. Larry, this is my uncle, Clint Barlow. Oh, Barlow. Words can never express my gratitude for what you've done for Marsha and me. Oh, now don't think about things like that, Larry. Here, here. Sit over here in this easy chair. <sighs> there. Does that feel better? Yes, thanks, Mr. Tearing. I believe some hot tea would be welcome to all of us. If you'll excuse me a moment, I shall order some. Oh, of course, Mr. Searing. I know you have much to tell your uncle, Speed, and this will give you an opportunity. He's right, Clint. Oh, but first, Larry, this is Dawa Searing, Mr. Searing's son. Oh, glad to meet you, Dawa. And I am most honored, Mr. Winfield. I've heard a great deal about you from Speed, and since seeing you when you were brought... Hi, Dawa. Well, well how Steve. are you? <laughs> well, so... Lawrence Winfield is himself again, huh? You bet. As soon as he gets strong again. Larry, this is my uncle, Clint Barlow. Oh, Barlow. Words can never express my gratitude for what you've done for Marsha and me. Oh, now don't think about things like that, Larry. Here, here. Sit over here in this easy chair. <sighs> there. Does that feel better? Yes, thanks, Mr. Tearing. I believe some hot tea would be welcome to all of us. If you'll excuse me a moment, I shall order some. Oh, of course, Mr. Tearing. I know you have much to tell your uncle, Speed. And this will give you an opportunity. He's right, Clint. Oh, but first, Larry, this is Dawa Searing, Mr. Searing's son. Oh, glad to meet you, Dawa. And I am most honored, Mr. Winfield. I've heard a great deal about you from Speed. And since seeing you when you were brought from Lake Tengrenor, I've been most anxious concerning your welfare. Yes, I guess I've been more trouble than I'm worth. Oh, now here, that's no way to talk. Oh, but it's true, Barlow. If I hadn't gotten mixed up with the octopus in the beginning, Marsha would never have come to China to risk her life looking for me. Now, that word if plays an important part in every life, Larry. But what's done is done. Now then, if you're strong enough, I want you to tell me everything you know about this criminal. How you first met him. What caused you to get involved with him. And what happened after that? Can I tell you something important first, Clint? Well, oh, yes, yes. What is it, Speed? When Dr. Kingsley said that Larry could come back home with us if we took good care of him, we left Nogchuk and stopped off at Lhasa as we passed through it. Well, see, by the way, did you give Bob his orders to bring back the men to Lhasa immediately? Yeah, and as he raring to go, he'll come here as soon as he gets them settled in Lhasa. Good. While we were in Lhasa, Mr. C. Ring stopped off at the government building to see if anything new had been reported. And I went to see if any word had come from Chief Riley yet. And it had. What? You mean that we have an answer on those pictures of Paul Mounier that we telephoned to New York? You bet. And here it is. Well, wait a minute. Now. Let's see. Can discover no resemblance in telephoto pictures of Mounier to pictures in rogues gallery. This proves we have no photographic record of octopus. Well, that's a disappointment. Not such a big one, Clint. It was just a shot in the dark anyhow. You thought it might not match up with any of them? Yes, I know, Speed, but... But those pictures I took are going to be valuable anyhow. Larry Winfield knew the real Paul Mounier. What? Yes, I met him in Hong Kong. Well, then you could identify him from a picture? Yes, it was three years ago when I saw him, but he had such a striking face, I'd know him anywhere. And even if you saw another face made up to look like him? Well, what do you mean? Shall I get the pictures, Clint? I have them in my room. Oh, yes, Speed, and hurry. This may be the turning point of the whole case. Okay, I'll be right back. May I see that cable from Chief Riley, Mr. Barlow? I have never seen one before. Hmm? Oh, yes, of course, Dollar. Here you are. But, uh, but this is not the message you just read to us. This one says, weather unfavorable for scientific expedition. Supplies low. Stand by. <laughs> well, the International Secret Police have a code, Dollar. We send all our important messages in code. Oh, now I understand. <laughs> Your organization is wonderful. I hate to think of what would happen to us if it hadn't been for the secret police. We operate to capture such criminals as the octopus, Larry. And then law-abiding citizens won't be in such deadly danger. Yeah, here is the tea, gentlemen. Dawa will pass the bowls and pour the tea. It'll taste mighty good to me. The weather's very cold. Yes, night is drawing on. 
I do hope that Barney and Chief Tipo return before darkness. Yes, I hope so too, Darwa. They should, if everything has gone right. But now that we have our tea, suppose you begin your story, Larry. All right. Well, Marsha has already told you that I came to China as engineer for an oil company. Now, this company was interested in the possibilities of oil in Tibet as well as in China. Yes. I was making a good salary and decided to experience as much as I could of the Far East. While we were planning the expedition, I had my nights to myself, so I fell into the habit of gambling. Is that when you met Bob Gilmore? No, I met him a little later, Dawa. I thought I was having a fine time, even though I kept losing steadily. Didn't want to borrow on my salary. So a wealthy Chinese gentleman, Quan Wu, told me that he'd lend me the money to pay my gambling debts. I could settle with him as I was paid. Quan Wu? I have heard you mention that name in connection with the octopus. Why, certainly. Wu's the right-hand man of the octopus. Why, I knew nothing of this. Wu was welcomed everywhere, highly thought of. Here are the pictures, Clint. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, hey, wait a minute. That sounds like a plane. Barney's coming in. Has he enough light to land, Mr. Barlow? Yes, Dawa. Let's go out into the field, huh? Oh, will you please stay here with Larry, Mr. Searing? Of course. I shall be most happy to. I don't want to let him out of our sight for a minute. The octopus may have spies in the neighborhood. You'll have to wait for a few minutes, Larry. All right, Barlow. I'll drink some more tea while you're gone. Yeah, boy. Come along, you two kids. It sure is cold. I'll say it is. Hi, Barney. Hi. Hi, kid. Boy, oh boy, Clint, have the fireworks started. Huh? What do you mean? Well, well, you've been fired upon. By an octopus plane, no less. But I crashed him. It means open war, old pal. So it does, Barney. We won't wait any longer. We're going to take the octopus tonight. Before he has a chance to gather his forces in the past. Come on. Of the International Secret Police. Barney flies to Black Pass to pick up Chief Tipo and his prisoner, the chief pilot of the octopus squadron of planes. He is attacked by another octopus plane, which has followed him there expressly to destroy him. Barney, being the better aviator, outmaneuvers the enemy pilot and sends his plane hurtling to earth in flames. Meantime, Speed has brought Larry Winfield back from Nagchuka to tell his story to Clint. He has just begun when Barney lands, and when Clint learns of the attack near Black Pass, he determines to go after the octopus that very night. Larry got as far in his story as telling us about Quan Wu loaning him money for his gambling, Barney. And then you landed, so we still have to hear the rest of what happened. Well, I'm glad I came in time to hear it. Glad to see you're up and around, too, Larry. Well, thanks, Dunlap. Marsha's told me a lot about you. I'll bet she has. Will you have some hot tea, Barney? Don't mind if I do, Dawa. Thanks. Clint, 
Black Pass is the coldest place in the world, bar none. Uh, never mind the weather report, Barney. We've got a lot to do tonight. Where's Chief Depot? <laughs> Probably trying to get his breath back from that flight from Black Pass. I had to do a lot of aerobatics to get out of the way of them machine gun bullets. They didn't miss you, though, Barney. That plane needs plenty of repair work. Lots of holes in the wings and the fuselage. Kid, all I was interested in was that I wouldn't get any holes in me. Praise heaven that you escaped. Thanks, Searing. And Chief Tipo wins some of that praise, too. He'd never flown before, but he handled that machine gun like a veteran. And I was really putting that ship through her paces. Ah, uh, supposing you hold your story and let Larry tell his. Sure, go ahead, Larry. Well, let me see. Where was I? Quan Mu was paying your gambling debt. Oh, yes. Well, one evening at the casino, he spoke about my work, saying that he'd heard excellent reports about it and that I would be a credit to any company I chose to work for. Same old banana oil. Banana oil, Barney? Yeah, never mind that, kid. We won't go into that now. Well, I laughed his compliments off at first, but as he continued, I glimpsed a more sinister meaning behind them. He began talking about the money I owed him, and I... Well, I finally lost my temper, I guess, and asked him the amount. It was probably staggering. Yes, Mr. Searing. I couldn't see how I had possibly lost that much. But he insisted and reminded me that I had given him a note covering all my gambling debts. Uh, a blank note, huh? And you were as foolish as to do that. I told you I was riding high in those days, Barlow. Overconfident, that was me. But I sure got over it. What happened next, Larry? I told Wu I couldn't possibly pay up. It'd take me the rest of my life unless somebody suddenly left me a million. To my surprise, he agreed and suggested that I work the debt off by coming in with a company that he was forming. I smell an octopus. You mean the new company really belonged to the octopus? Sure, that guy's got a tentacle in everybody's pie. Right, but I didn't know the real owner of the company then, and wasn't interested in either. I told Wu that I couldn't pay it off that way because my employer would be set back for many months if I left. He trusted me completely, and I had data on the territory that only I could decipher. I see. Well, go on, Larry. Well, he... He said that that's why I would be valuable to his company, that they wanted my data. Is that modern business? Not real business, Mr. Searing. Octopus gangsters are much worse than Tibetan brigands. What'd you say to that, Larry? Well, I couldn't believe him at first. Thought he was joking because he had such a good reputation around Hong Kong. But he soon convinced me differently. And all the while, he had a smile on his face. Yes, beware of the man who smiles constantly. Check, Barlow. That smile covered plenty of trouble. Wu told me that I must leave my present connections, bringing my statistics and data with me. If I did not, he would reveal my gambling debt to my employer and all Hong Kong. But gee, Larry, that would have been better than getting hooked up with the octopus. Yes, Speed, if I had known then what I know now. But I'd never heard of the octopus. I thought Wu's company was just a competitor trying to get ahead of my employer. What did you do then, Mr. Winfield? Well, I, I asked him to give me that night to think it over. I'd met Bob Gilmore by that time and was with him that evening. He noticed that I was low about something and kept questioning me. But of course, I couldn't tell him anything. It might have saved you a lot of trouble if you had. I know. I'd been trying to get him a job with my outfit ever since I first met him, and now I thought maybe he could step into my shoes. You mean you double-crossed your company on purpose? No, I, I just left them, Speed. Resigned. I worked all that night on my notes, explaining them in writing, deciphering my findings for whoever might get my job. Then I took the packet of papers around to my employer's hotel and left them there for him. I, I couldn't face him. You mean you gave up your job to throw in with Quan Wu, but you didn't take any of your findings with you? Yes. Of course, I didn't tell Wu that at first. He took it for granted that I had done what he demanded and took me to his home. Huh? There he said we'd hear the voice of the real owner of the new company, but we could not see him because of his political connections. Political connections, my foot. Just the old octopus runaround. His voice came through a loudspeaker. He asked me for my data... And then I told him that I had brought nothing from my old company. That I would work for him, but that it would have to be from scratch. I would not betray my old employer. I see. And what did the octopus say to that? Plenty. Things happened fast and furious after that. I was slugged and woke up in a cell. Had nothing but bread and water for days while they tried to make me reveal my... Wu brought me newspapers which told of my disappearance under... Later, I learned that in spite of the data I had left behind... My old company had failed. Failed? But how could they? You left them everything they needed to work on. I left at speed, but it was stolen by an octopus operator who made it appear that I had been the thief. A price was set on my head, and the octopus laughingly offered to set me free now that he had accomplished what he wanted. The dirty dog. You couldn't have left him, no matter how much you wanted to. No. It was all like some crazy dream. 
One minute I'd been getting along fine, a good job and a promising future. Then, overnight, everything was changed. I figured my life was ruined, but I wanted to save Marsha from disgrace. I hadn't told her anything about it in the beginning, and later, of course, my letters were held by the octopus. But it was just as well. I wanted her to think me dead. Better that way than believing I had disgraced our name. Mm -hmm. Anything more? Nothing of vital importance, Barlow. They made me work in my capacity as engineer, but it was just routine. Well, that just about ends the octopus case, boys. We've got all the evidence we need for his arrest. And now we can start for the path of the Iron Dagger? Uh, you're not going, Speed. What? No, you've come a long way with Barney and me, but from now on, we've got to go on alone. That is, without you. It's far too dangerous, the actual arrest. But, Clint, I've gone to his castle before, and alone, with Thawwater. Get those pictures. Pictures? Oh, the ones we telephoned to the chief. Well, see, that reminds me. We never did show them to Larry Speed. Remember, Barney landed just as you came back with him. That is right. We were so elated over Barney's return that we completely forgot about the pictures. And since then, Mr. Winfield's story has claimed our attention. But why all the excitement? Well, Larry met the real Mounier in Hong Kong. He did? Boy, then he'll be able to tell in a minute if the octopus disguise is a phony. Of course, we know it is, but when you come after a guy in strange territory, the more proof of guilt, the better. I've got them right here in my pocket, Larry. Yeah, here they are. These? Yeah. Does his disguise look anything like the real thing? But these pictures are of Paul Mounier. Oh, uh -huh. You can't mean that, Larry. Examine them more carefully. If you identify those pictures as being Mounier, then we lose most of the ground we've gained. Oh, I'm sorry, Barlow, but it is exactly as I remember him. No, wait. What is it, Larry? The eyes. I remember now. Mounier had vivid blue eyes. These pictures show the eyes to be brown or black. And you can't disguise eyes. That's it, boys. Come on, let's get ready for the attack. And I can come too, Clint. Please, I've done everything else with you. Let me be there when you arrest the octopus. Mm, well, I The don't kid's think... right, Clint. It'll be dangerous, but he's earned the right to be in at the catch. Oh, all right then, Speed. Go tell Chief Keeper to round up as many of his men as he can. We start from here within an hour. May I not accompany you, Mr. Barlow? No, no, Dawa. Your place is here. In case we should, uh, well, fail, you and your father must remain here to get word to our headquarters in New York, telling Chief Riley the whole story. And he'll send other operators to do the job. Uh, would it not be more wise to wait for Gilmore and his men, Mr. Barlow? No, the octopus has already had too much time to gather an armed force. We must strike tonight. And I'll depend on you, Mr. Searing, to see that Bob follows us as soon as possible. I'll say so. Something tells me for once there's going to be a hot time in that pass tonight. <laughs> Who is it? It is I, Master. Quan Wu. Quan Wu? Quan Wu! What has happened to you? You look as if you had come through fire. I have, Master. Dunlap shot our plane down in the Black Pass attack. I knew something had happened. You were so long overdue. The plane burst into flames, but they did not reach the pilot's compartment until just before we landed. The pilot managed to level off and land. I flung the door open and escaped just as the gasoline tank exploded. You lead a charmed life. No. I feel I was spared only to warn you, Master. We have come to the end of our road. What do you mean, you fool? Has your recent danger made you mad? No. But Barlow and the others will be here at any moment. Uh, why? Because Dan Lapp lived through his flight and returned with Chief Tipo and Chan? Bah! It will take them uh, time to attack this part. No. I heard whispers as I came here. They thought me a wandering beggar. My clothes were so torn and blackened. They talked freely. Gilmore is bringing a force of men from Nagchuka. Other, another detail of police has already arrived at Mardak. They have discovered our slave headquarters here. What? At Mardak? Then we did not silence Splinter soon enough. No. The secret police have control of our vital spots. They are closing in on us. What chance have we to escape? What chance? None, because I have no wish to escape. You mean you will die here? We are to be trapped in this windy path like that? No, but the secret police will be trapped. Pranu, I have not been idle during your absence. My call has been answered. Instead of slaves in the room below, an army awaits my command. You will fight the secret police? And all Tibet if I must. But there will be no need. Tibetans are a peaceful lot and will bow to my will. But now I will station my army in the pass and in the surrounding hills. 
Let the secret police take me. If they dare. Of the International Secret Police. and Barney now have all the proof they need for the arrest of the octopus and plan to advance on the pass of the Iron Dagger this very night and capture their enemy. Meanwhile, however, Quan Wu has managed to live through the plane crash and has returned to the octopus castle. He tells his master what he has heard of the advance, that Bob Gilmore is bringing a band of men from Nagchuka, while still more police are stationed in Mardak, the slave headquarters at the foot of the Himalayas. He urges the octopus to flee for his life, but the criminal merely laughs. He has an army of his own hidden in the lower rooms of the castle and now sets ordering them to their stations in the surrounding hills to await the attack and destroy the secret police once and for all. Clint and the others, however, are not waiting for Bob Gilmore to join them, but have gone ahead, alone, hoping to thus surprise the octopus. We now find them crouched in the cold and windy pass watching the castle. Hey, how much longer do we have to park here watching that big barn while our tootsies freeze? Just as long as there's activity around the castle, Barney. The octopus is evidently stationing his men for defense. You mean he knows we're going to come after him, Clint? He must have gotten wind of it somehow, Speed. Gotten wind of it is right. This wind would carry it to anybody. Well, stop talking foolishness, Barney. I resent that. I'm just trying to make the time pass quicker. We may be waiting out here in the cold for the rest of the night. I don't think so, Barney. I haven't seen any fellas come out of the castle within the last ten minutes. Maybe they're all out by now. Yes, you're right, Speed. And once we're sure they're all out, then we'll go in. And no matter what we run into inside the castle, it won't be half as bad as this wind and cold out, sir. How are we going to go in, Clint? By the front door? No, we're running enough danger coming here alone without letting the octopus know we're here before we can surprise him. And how? If he finds us now or any of his men find us, we'll never fly another plane. Oh, I'm not worried about the octopus getting a drop on Clint. But I'm sure anxious to get inside and get it over with. Yeah, don't you worry, fella. Things are liable to happen fast enough once we're inside that castle. I think we'll try and enter through that basement door we got through once before. And if that's locked, I knew a window at the back of the place. Don't want me went through it when I took the pictures. I'd rather stay away from the rear of the castle, Steve. There's too many guards back there. Funny he didn't station any here in front of the castle, ain't it? No, I believe he set a trap for us, Barney. He expects us to attack in force. Thinks we might come up the foot trail and attempt to surround the house. 
He'd allow us to do that, and then his men would surround us on every side. Gee, what about Bob Gilmore and his men, Clint? Well, by the time they get here, we'll either have the situation well in hand, or else we will have failed entirely, Speed. Hmm, happy thought. Well, I ain't seen anybody go in or out of that castle lately. How about us getting a move on? Yeah, might as well, Bonnie. Now, we'll all stay pretty well together at first. And in case they spot us, break up, scatter. There's less chance of them getting all of us then. Okay, Clint. Yes, and keep your guns ready. You bet. Right now, this little gun is the best friend I have. What about that moon? Well, we won't move until one of those clouds passes over its face. And keep an eye on the cloud, too. When the moon breaks through again, make sure you're hidden in some shadow. How many eyes do you think I've got? What with watching out for octopus gangsters and clouds over the moon, I'd have to have eyes in the top of my head. Oh, well, maybe you'd rather stay here, Grandma. Nothing doing. What do you think I am, anyhow? <laughs> well, okay. Now, now watch it. There's a big cloud being blown over the moon. Get ready to run for it. Okay, Clint. There it goes. And here we go. <laughs> The moon's going to come through. Yes. Uh, quick, quick, duck in here. Yeah, not a minute too soon. Gee, that moon's like a searchlight. Yes, it, it's none too good for us. But it helped us in one way. We know just about where our enemies are stationed. I wish we knew if they was watching us play hide-and-seek. Yes, we only have a little way to go to that door there. Uh, now, look, the moon's covered again. Come on. That's it. Come on, Barney. Take it easy. Here we are. Uh, uh, fine. fine. And now, let's hope the door's unlocked. Yeah, it ought to be. After all them fellas came out, what I hope is that they're all out. Yeah. It's all clear. Follow me. <whistles> Boy, what a relief. Say, that door's been oiled. Squeak like the Dickens the last time we used it. Last time? Yeah. The time Clint and me came up here looking for you, Barney, when you were missing. Hmm. I'll get to the bottom of that yet someday. Uh -huh. You will if we get out of this. Now, come on. We better get going before somebody finds us. Yeah. The lights are on in these lower rooms. I don't like that so much. It doesn't give us a chance to hide if anybody should come through here. No, I don't think the octopus dreams were anywhere near him yet, Speed. Now, what we've got to do is find the passage that leads to the laboratory. He's probably in there. I think I can find it, Clint. I used it when I was here with Da Wa. Oh, you did? Well, then lead on, Speed. Yeah, and make sure you lead us to the right place. This is no time for guesses. I'm sure, Bonnie. Come on. Gosh, these rooms sure look different from the last time I was here. They were bare as could be. Well, they look as if they'd been lived in plenty. What with slaves and octopus gangsters, I guess they have. I guess the octopus got all the slaves out of here. Yes, but Chief Tipo's men will nab him at Mardak. Tipo's been swell. He sure wanted to come along with us. Yes, but I wanted him to keep an eye on Larry Winfield until Bob Gilmore arrived with his men from Nagchuka. See, you sure you're leading us in the right direction, Speed? I'm sure of it, Clint. Yeah, see that door up ahead there? Yes. That goes into a passage that leads right to the laboratory. I hope you're right, kid. Yes, I... I only wish we could open that secret passage that Quan Wu used. Oh, well, this will have to do, I guess. You bet. This will take you right to the octopus if he's in the laboratory. Lead on, kid. And from now on, hold your hand. I believe everything is ready for the attack of the secret police, Quan Wu. I hope we have overlooked nothing, Master. You do not seem very happy over the situation. I still believe that we should have left the past of the Iron Dagger. Bah! If I listened to you, Kwan Wu, I would never accomplish anything. Never become master of the entire world. I think only of your best interest. And your life. You're not fooling me, Wu. By the way, has the door leading from the lower rooms been barred? I do not know. You would better go and see. I do not want any visitors coming in without our knowing it. Visitors? You mean the secret police? Yes. I expect them to attack in force this time. But I shall take no chances. Go and make sure that all doors are barred now, and that all the men have left the lower rooms. Yes. Very well, Master. Very well. <laughs> the cowardly fool. He has outgrown his usefulness. <laughs> I believe it would be better to destroy him after I have destroyed the secret police. 
With Tibet at my mercy, I shall have plenty of men to obey my commands. No need for such cowards as Kwan Wu. Ah, you back already, Kwan Wu? Did you forget that? Yes, Octopus. It's me, Barlow. And so we've caught up with you at last. And don't move or I'll blow you higher than a kite. I shouldn't think of moving with such clever men as the secret police in the room. Particularly since you have three guns and I have none. Don't give us any of that stuff, Octopus. Many's the time you were going to do away with us without giving us a chance. True, Speed Gibson. And I see now that I should have worked harder toward your destruction. What'll I do, Clint? Wipe up the floor with no, him? No, no, Bonnie. Put the handcuffs on him. Can I take just one punch at no. him? No. Uh... What do you think you're going to do, Barlow? Capture me while my men are surrounding the castle? Put the cuffs on him, Bonnie. But stay clear of him. You bet. I hate to touch this devil fish, but I guess I have to put the cuffs on him. Hmm. You uh, refuse to answer my question, Barlow? I have little to say to you, Octopus. I thought I would have when the time came and we actually faced one another. But now that it has come, there seems little to say. That's right, Clint. All you have to do is deliver the octopus to Chief Riley now. <laughs> that is all. Wipe that smile off your face. Supposing you do. I'm handcuffed. You are armed. You should have no trouble, Dunlap. Clint, let me take the cuffs off for just a minute, will you? Let me have just one minute with this guy and you won't have to take him back to Chief Riley. Pipe down, Bonnie. You've got a job to do yet. We've captured the octopus, but there's going to be something else again to get him out of the pass. So? You have thought of that, Barlow? Yes, I've thought of that. And more, octopus. And you're going to solve the problem for us. So? You're going to send word to your men to disband, to return their weapons to the lower rooms. Then after disarming them, it will be a simple matter to arrest them. That's the general idea? Yeah. We're not like you, octopus. We try to save lives. Very thoughtful of you, Speedy Gibson. Are you going to give that order? Mm, no. What? No. Why should I give an order that will place me entirely at your mercy when I can destroy you simply by remaining silent? Because if you remain silent, Octopus, you will also destroy yourself. And knowing your ego as I do, I don't think you'd like to do that. What do you mean, destroy myself? If you don't give the orders to your men to disarm, we'll shoot you down without any further delay. You wouldn't dare. They'd be on you like a pack of wolves. Do you think you could escape them? No. But we came here to do one thing, Octopus. Get you. We knew you might get us. We took that chance, so that don't worry us none. The only thing we wouldn't like is to not get rid of you. And believe me, we won't take that chance. But it's suicide. Stop stalling, Octopus. Are you going to give that order, or aren't you? And mind you, don't try to give the alarm at the same time, or I'll shoot. But don't you realize... Juan Wu, the boy! Free, look out! Let me go! Let me go! Master, what are your orders? You have your gun, Wu? Yes! <laughs> now the tables are reversed, Clint Barlow. What do you mean? You ordered me to disarm my men to save my life. Now I demand that you give me your guns to save the life of your nephew. What? You mean you... Unless you follow my order immediately, Kwan Wu has orders to shoot. <laughs> and he has no chance of missing. Of the International Secret Police.
plenty of evidence to arrest and convict the octopus, the secret police plan to advance on the pass of the Iron Dagger and capture the criminal and his gang. Bob Gilmore is bringing a large band of Tibetan police from Nagchuka, but, hoping to surprise their enemy, Speed, Clint, and Barney go on ahead to the castle. And after the octopus gangsters have been stationed in the surrounding hills by their master, the boys walk in on the octopus in his laboratory. Clint orders the criminal to disarm his men to save his own life. Meanwhile, Quan Wu enters through a secret passage and, holding speed before him, turns the tables on Clint and Barney. The octopus says that they must now hand over their guns, else Speed's life will be forfeit. Don't you do it, Clint. Maybe you'll never get another chance to capture the octopus. Don't give up just because of me. Well, Balo, what is your decision, my life or your nephew? How can I make such a decision? By surrendering to you to save Speed's life, I break every vow I've made to the secret police. I dishonored the service. And yet I... Please, Clint, don't let him get away with it. Get the octopus no matter what else happens. <laughs> Your nephew has courage. I'm surprised you know courage when you see it, you dirty yellow rat. Master, why do you bandy words with these fools? Shall I shoot the boy? I shall give Barlow one more minute to hand over his gun. Why, you... Hey, hey, what's that? It's Bob, Bob Gilmore and his gang. He must have come right after we left, and people sent him right up here. Gilmore? Quick, get Tom Wu, Barney. Speed! Are you hurt? No, Clint, but I think Quan Wu was Barney tackling like his life depended on it. Not my life, but yours, kid. Now, just let me get another pair of handcuffs on this baby. Here's a pair, Barney. Thanks, kid. There we are, all trussed up like a prize turkey. Get him over there with the octopus, Barney. Okay, Clint. You intend to line us up and shoot us, Barlow? Shooting's too good for you, octopus. Your worst punishment will come when you realize that your plans have failed, that your vast criminal organization is destroyed, and that you'll never be master of the world. <laughs> You may be a little ahead of yourself. I do not think that Gilmore's Tibetan police will stand a chance against my men. That's why you're wrong, Octopus. Tibetan's getting fed up with all this trouble. They've never had a fellow like you in the country before, and they're going to make sure of getting rid of you. Hey, sounds like somebody's winning. Get to that window and take a look, Barney. But look out for stray bullets. Yeah, bullets are the least of my troubles after what I've just been through. Why... <laughs> What do you see, Barty? And what's funny? <laughs> Looks like Bob Gilmore and his gang have mopped up the pass of the Iron Dagger with the Octopus Gangsters. They got them all corralled over to one side, and Bob and a cordon of men are advancing toward the castle with drawn guns. Hi, Bob! <laughs> hey! Oh, for the duck, you big ox! I told you to watch out for bullets. Yeah, but whoever thought one of my best friends would take a shot at me? Fine thing. Probably thought you were the octopus or Quan Wu, Barney. With us coming up here alone, maybe he figures he has to shoot us while you're in to rescue us. Yeah? Well, let's open the front door and identify ourselves to him then. And quick. Right now, Bob Gilmore's more dangerous than the octopus. <laughs> So that's the story of our capture of the octopus, Mr. Searing. We brought him here to your home so that Larry Winfield could see him and positively identify him as not being the man he knew as Paul Mounier. It is an amazing story, Mr. Barlow. You have been trailing this criminal for many months. Years, Mr. Searing. Clint and me was after him long before the Chinese case. And yet his capture was amazingly easy. Well, easy if you discount those seconds that Speed's life hung in the balance, Mr. Searing. I was faced with the choice of betraying my chief's trust and the training of a lifetime for the sake of Speed's life. And you wouldn't have hesitated much longer, either. Speed means more to him than anything else, Searing. Boy, then I'm sure glad Bob Gilmore came when he did. I should think you would be. Uh, by the way, where is Mr. Gilmore? He and Chief Tipo are taking care of the prisoners. We made a big haul tonight. I think we got every octopus gangster in Tibet because this guy had sent out a call for all his men to rub us out. Uh, rub you out? Uh, <clears throat> Barney has rather an odd way of expressing himself at times. When is Larry going to see the octopus? Dawa is bringing him now, Speed. In spite of his great excitement, he fell asleep an hour after Gilmore and his men left here. The poor fellow is exhausted by his experiences. I bet you're tired too, Mr. Searing, with us arriving here at dawn with the octopus and his gang. Did you stay up all night? Certainly, Speed. Sleep is vastly unimportant when life and death hang in the balance. I feared you would never come back. Oh, we always turn up, Searing, like bad pennies or something. What do you think of the octopus? It is still hard to realize that this silent man, whom I knew as a kindly scientist, 
is the world's greatest criminal. Was the world's greatest criminal, Mr. Tsering. He's all washed up now. You said it. What have you got to say for yourself, Octopus? What is there to say, Dunlap? That's right. But you might tell us who you really are. I leave that for you to find out. After all, you are in the secret police and must be used to such things. Oh, still cocky, huh? Let me smack him. I'll please. smack you if you do. Haven't you had enough fight for one night, Bonnie? No, I'm just getting warmed up. Oh, here come Larry and Dawa. Gee, Larry does look all done up, doesn't he? The reaction has set in. Uh, here, Mr. Winfield, uh, please sit here. Thank you, Mr. C. Ring. I had a difficult time in awakening him. But once he knew that Quan Wu and the octopus had been arrested and brought here, he could scarcely restrain his impatience. Well, I don't wonder at that, considering what has happened in the past. Well, Larry, is this the man you knew as Paul Mounier? I notice you've been studying him very closely. Yes. I wanted to make sure, Barlow, that seeing this man in person satisfies me that he is not Paul Mounier. He looks even less like him now than... He did in his pictures. Maybe his disguise is wearing thin. No, no, it's an excellent disguise. A very true likeness. But Mounier was kindly. I felt that by merely meeting him. This man throws out an aura of evil. That's because he's not trying to pretend anymore, Larry. He knows we've got him at last. Mm, now that you got me, as you put it, what are you going to do with me, Barlow? I'm going to fly you to the coast of India as soon as I possibly can, Octopus. Not taking any chances on losing you again. You and Quan Wu will be able to tell Chief Riley plenty when we get you back to New York. You think I will talk? If you don't, Quan Wu will. Wu had better not. Master, do not look at me like that. I will never betray you. Then he'll be the only man you've never betrayed, Quan Wu. Because of you, I've lost reputation, health, and four years out of my life. For that and the suffering you caused, Marsha, I'd like to strangle you. There are probably thousands of people who feel as strongly against the octopus and his organization as you do, Larry. But but have no fear. The law will mete out just punishment. What are you staring at, Dawa? This octopus. I still cannot understand how a man can be so cruel, so inhuman. Fortunately, there are not many men like the octopus, Dawa. And the few that are generally destroy themselves in the end. Like the octopus... They become blind with power, too sure of their own success and and themselves. Then they become careless, and that's fatal to them. Yep. If this guy hadn't been careless, we never would have got in the castle through that side door. Are you going to question the octopus and woo here, Clint? No, no, Speed. It'd be a waste of time for one thing, and I want to get to the coast and get started for home with our prisoners as soon as possible. Uh, what about the other prisoners? Well, Chief Teeper will know how to take care of them, Mr. Searing. After all, they are Tibetans, and I think it best that their own government should punish them. Yeah, we never get all them guys in our plane. When do you plan to leave, Mr. Barlow? Just as soon as I can make my, my report at Lhasa, Dawa. Turn all the prisoners over to Chief Tipo. Get Larry back to Dr. Kingsley at Nog Chuka, And then say goodbye to all our friends. Oh, I should say we'll be leaving here within, oh, six hours. What? But we had planned on a feast in your honor, Mr. Barlow. You and the others have done Tibet a great service. Only a feast can show our appreciation. You mean one of them spreads like we had at your townhouse? Yes. Only far greater. You, greater? Look, Tsering, we got to get our prisoners to the coast. And if we stayed for that feast, we'd never be able to lift the plane off the ground. Uh, thanks, just the same. Then you mean our friendship has begun only to end, Speed? End? Of course not, Dawa. Well, you're one of my pals. I'll write you letters and you answer them. You tell me everything that happens over here in Tibet, and I'll do the same. Then maybe you'll get a chance to come to America, and we'll show you all around. Won't we, Clint? Well, I should say we will. It is a bargain, then. But meantime, we shall miss you very much. You have given me a glimpse of a country that is even more wonderful than I dreamed. If all Americans are like you, Speed, and like Mr. Barlow and Barney... Then I must visit there someday. Sure you will, kid. And we'll have a brass band waiting to greet you. Well, when do we get started for Lhasa, Clint? Well, we're not all going together, Barney. I want you to take Larry, fly the plane to Nagchuka, and wait for us there. What about the octopus and who? Uh, they'll stay with us. I want an armed force around us until we can get them into the plane and take off. Won't take me long to finish my business at Lhasa. Now I'll ask Chief Tipo to choose a special guard to accompany us to Nagchuka. 
I'll expect you to have the plane filled up and ready for the flight over the Himalayas to the Indian coast. Don't worry about that. The crate will be ready. Just see that you have something to put in it as passengers. Oh, the octopus won't get away from us now, Barney. Listen, kid, I won't feel absolutely safe until I see that guy behind bars in New York. <laughs> thank you, Dunlap. Don't thank me, octopus. I just know that rats can squeeze through many small holes. Yeah, now you better get started for Nug too, Barney. You think you can stay awake for the flight? Me? Say, I'm so used to going without sleep that it makes me nervous just to shut my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> well, go on, then get started. And have the plane service before you bother Dr. Kingsley and the others. It's pretty early yet, you know. I bet they've been awake all night, too, Clint. May we go to Nakjuka, too, Mr. Barlow? Well, I believe it best not to, Dawa. Your father will accompany me as a material witness on this case. But I think we'd better say goodbye to you here in your own home. I think it'll be easier. I do not like... Goodbyes. It isn't really goodbye, Dawa. We'll be seeing one another again. More trouble. Can someone be trying to rescue the octopus? Don't know. Didn't know there was anyone left to rescue him. But bullets mean goodbye in any language. Let's see what's happened. Maybe it's an attack. <laughs> and you thought you had me cornered, you fools. Of the International Secret Police. After capturing the octopus and his band of gangsters, Speed, Clint, and Barney stop off at the house of La Chaux Ring to call for Larry Winfield and to also bid their friends farewell. Clint tells Barney to fly the secret police plane to Nagchuka and await him there while he settles last-minute affairs in Lhasa. Just as they are about to leave, shots are heard in the garden where Bob Gilmore and Chief Tipo are guarding the prisoners. It turns out that the octopus gangsters try to escape, but the Tibetan police overpower them. And now... Leaving Speed and Clint to attend to the octopus and official business in Lhasa, Barney flies on to Nagchuka with Larry Winfield. We find him with Dr. Kingsley and little Jean. And I tell you, Doc, I've had plenty of adventures and exciting times in my day, but I've never seen anything to equal when Clint had to make the choice of giving up our chances of capturing the octopus or risking Speed's life. Must have been terrible. Would Kwan Wu have really shot Speed, Barney? Sure he would, Jane. Them guys have no more conscience than a tadpole. Oh. Hey. <laughs> well, what are you crying for, Jane? Speed's safe now. I know, but I get so scared when I think of what might have happened if Bob hadn't come in time. <laughs> ah, that's what I call real friendship, honey. I'd like to know of somebody that'd cry when they thought of what almost happened to me. Only they'd be crying most of the time. <laughs> ah, that's better. Don't want Speed and Clint to see you crying when they come. You think they'll be here soon, Barney? Any minute. 
I know Clint isn't going to waste any time in getting the octopus safe behind bars. We cleaned up his gang here in Tibet, but that don't mean a thing in India, on the high seas, or any other place in the world. He's got headquarters in every country, you know. And the minute we're out of Tibet, they'll all be trying to rescue him because he's the brains of the mob. Without the octopus, they're sunk. I'm more thankful than I can say to know that you boys have captured him at last. When I see what he's done to Marsha and Larry Winfield, two innocent people, I can easily imagine the ruin he has caused in other lives. Yeah, that guy has plenty to answer for. Look at your own case, for instance. You was doing fine in Hong Kong until you got mixed up with the octopus. And mostly because of helping us. The secret police won't forget what you've done, Doc. Great heaven, Barney. I only wish I could have done much more. I was so helpless. Oh, there's a car driving up outside. Oh, Barney, is it... Is it... Yeah, Gene, looks like Speed, Clint, and the gang, all right. Boy, they sure didn't waste any time. Who's that elderly man getting out of the car, Barney? That, Dr. Kingsley, is world enemy number one. You mean the octopus? And not an imitation. The octopus in the flesh. And, of course, you recognize Quan Wu with him. Yes. Here, here what's the matter, Gene? Do, do you mind if I hold on to your hand and Daddy's, Barney? I'm kind of afraid. You bet I mind. Gene, I love it. But you needn't be afraid of the octopus anymore. No, sir, Ray. Right this way, Speed. Hi, Clint. Hello, Hello. 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 How are you? I think this corner's the best place for the octopus and Wu. We'll just need two guards inside. Very well, Mr. Barlow. Hunger. Hunger. Well, it's good to see you all safe and sound, Clint. Well, thanks, Doctor. And I don't mind telling you we're glad to be here. Oh, I'd like you to meet La Chaux C. Ring, who's helped me more than I can say. Well, how, how do you, you do? do? How do you do? What do you think of the octopus, Dr. Kingsley? Well, it's hard to say, Speed. It's hard to believe that this elderly man is the octopus. Oh, we have plenty of proof as to that, Doc. What I want to know is who the octopus is. You mean you don't know, even after arresting him? Not unless Speed or Clint got more out of him on the way coming here. No, Barney, he didn't say a word. Why don't you take his disguise off, Speed? Haven't got time to even do that, Gene. We're going to wait with everything until we get him back to Chief Riley in New York. Yes, we came here mainly to say goodbye, Dr. Kingsley. Uh, are Larry and Marsha all right? Yes, they were asleep when we left the hotel. That's all those kids need. Plenty of rest and good care. I would have liked to have said goodbye to Miss Marsha and Larry, but we'll see him back in America pretty soon. Well, that reminds me, Clint. What arrangements have been made for getting us out of Tibet? Well, I've given full instructions to Bob Gilmore, Doctor, and Chief Tipo. I left them in Lhasa to clear up things that we didn't want to wait for. But they'll come here as soon as possible. Bob's going to bring you and Gene and the Winfields out of Tibet just as soon as Miss Marsh and Larry are strong enough to travel, Dr. Kingsley. Oh, I'll be so glad to get back to America. I am sorry that your visit to Tibet has been such an unhappy one, Miss Kingsley. I hope that you will not judge our country by the circumstances which were caused by the octopus. Oh, no, Mr. Seawing. I think Tibet is wonderful. Yes, indeed. Someday we'll come back when we have more time to see the wonders of Lhasa and similar cities. I hope so. Well, and now I think we'd better be on our way. The plane already, Barney? Yep, she's waiting over at the landing field outside Nogchuka. we better get going, then. Y'all coming to see us off? Oh, I should say so, Steve. Well, you'll soon be following us, Gene. You'll see us off now, but when you return to America, we'll be there to welcome you. <laughs> well, come along, everybody. Huh? Come along, Gene. Oh, hi. You Bye. too, Speed. Yeah, let's get going. Have you and Speed got your parachutes fastened on, Barney? Yeah, Clint. Well, then I guess everything's set. Oh, Mr. C. Ring. Uh, yes, Mr. Barlow. On behalf of the International Secret Police, I, I want to thank you for aiding us in our pursuit of the octopus. If there's any way in which we can ever cooperate with you or your government, I hope that you will call on us immediately. Thank you, Mr. Barlow. It has been a great pleasure to know all of you. My government is sorry that you must leave so quickly. We hope to honor you and Speed and Mr. Dunlap as you deserve. But that will have to wait. We understand the need for haste. Gee, thanks, Mr. Searing. I hope you can come to America someday. Thank you, Speed. I shall try my best. And now, Octopus, you and Quan Wu climb inside the plane. You better go along too, Barney. It's a pleasure. Well, and now, goodbye, Jean, Dr. Kingsley... Goodbye until we meet again. So long, Gene. So long, Doctor. Oh, goodbye, goodbye, Gene. Goodbye, Glenn. Goodbye. 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 
How are Quan Wu and the octopus enjoying the flight, Speed? They're quiet enough, Barney. I'm keeping an eye on them while you and Tim take the plane over these mountains. Yeah, it's no cinch hopping over these babies. These are the Himalayas. Better climb even higher, Barney. We're still below those peaks ahead. I'd better fly around them then, don't you think? Otherwise, you'll have to drag out the oxygen tank. All right, then fly around them. If you want to risk yourself in the downdrafts. Ah, uh, they won't bother me none. We're so high that even a downdraft wouldn't do any more damage than scare me to death. Clint, the octopus has fallen asleep. Oh, good. If he's asleep, he won't be figuring out a way of escape. Don't kid yourself. That devil fish figures even in his sleep. No use now. Golly, just think, fellas. We've really caught the octopus. It's almost too good to be true. <laughs> Well, you glad it's all over, Speed? Well, I'm glad we caught him, Clint. But, gee, I liked all the adventures we had in doing it, even the real dangerous ones. Yeah, I suppose you'll never get tired of adventures, Speed. Clint and me never do. Oh, we talk a lot about vacations and stuff, but we're always restless until we're on another case. Say, do I hear right? (laughs) Grandma is really breaking down and admitting that he likes adventure. Ah, nobody ever takes me seriously. (laughs) <laughs> Quan Wu. Quan Wu. Yes, Master? Are the secret police watching us? Only the boy. And now even he is not watching. They are laughing. They believe you to be asleep. That is exactly what I wanted them to believe. Uh, what do you mean? Have you some plan? Quan Wu. I swore a long time ago that the secret police would never catch me alive. You do not mean... Do not waste words. Let me know if the boy turns his head. Nothing must interfere with my plan. They are paying no attention to us now. They are watching the mountain below. One move. We are near the door? Yes. Handcuffed as you are, can you open it without attracting attention? I believe so. Yes, I am sure of it. Can you do it quickly? Yes. Then listen carefully. When the opportune moment arrives, I want you to open the door, then stand beside. I am going to jump from the plane. Jump? But you will be killed. Better this way than the slower death at the hands of the secret police. But what will happen to me? If you do not talk, Quan Wu, my band will find a way of freeing you from whatever prison you may be in. If you do betray the organization, you will be found in your prison and destroyed most unpleasantly. I would never talk, never. Good. I thought you would see wisdom. Wait, the boy is looking. Now it is safe once more. It will be a little while before he turns again. Now is the time to open the door. But, Master, you have no chance of coming through this alive. Open the door. Yes, Master. Farewell. Goodbye. And remember, do not turn traitor. No. The octopus, he's jumping! Quick, get back there before Wu jumps, too! Here, what are you doing? Gee, gee whiz! Have no fear, Speed Gibson. I love life better than to jump from a plane over the Himalayas. Clint, Barney, can you see the octopus? Yes, from this window. He's falling fast. Come up here, Speed. So he'd rather go out that way than have us take him alive. Yes, and we'd never be able to find his body in this section of the Himalayas. Gosh... Makes you feel kind of funny inside, doesn't it? Yeah, the end of the octopus. Look, he's disappeared through that cloud bank. Yes. As mysterious in death as he was in life. I wonder if we'll ever learn his real identity. Maybe from Wu. I don't think even he knew that speed. Well, all we can do is continue on with our flight and make our report in New York. What sort of report, Clint? Case of world versus the octopus. Closed by sudden death of defendant. That devil fish didn't need no defense. I should say not. Gee, octopuses are funny creatures. Well, in our report to New York, I'll close the case. I don't mind telling you we're all lucky to we'll come out of it alive. Well, Speed, this is the end of your first case with the International Secret Police. <laughs>
Reed Gibson of the International Secret Police. Speed Gibson and his uncle, Clint Barlow, ace operator of the International Secret Police, have returned to police headquarters in New York with an official report of the death of the octopus, world criminal number one. Rather than be taken alive, the octopus jumped from the plane when they were over the Himalayas and disappeared in the clouds banked below. Speed and Clint brought back his right-hand man, Quan Wu, as prisoner, and delivered him to Chief Riley. We find the boys in his office now telling the chief of their many adventures in China and Tibet and also explaining the absence of Barney Dunlap, the third member of the trio. You see, Chief Riley, Barney got the feeling kind of sick right after the octopus jumped out of our plane. At first, we thought it was seeing him fall like that that made Barney feel funny. Yes, Speed, I can understand how Barney felt. It's not a pleasant thing to see a man fall to certain death even though he is the most dangerous criminal in the world. But it wasn't that after all, Chief Riley. You see, sir, the weeks previous to that last flight had been a tough one. We didn't get much sleep and didn't eat regularly while we were on the trail of the octopus. And it just got to be too much for Barney. When we landed in India, he picked up this native fever somewhere, and first thing we knew, we had a mighty sick man on our hands. Gee, I'll say so. He was delirious. Didn't even know Clint, and they've been pals for years. We called him the first doctor we could find, and he hustled Barney off to an English hospital. It was a swell place. Yes, those English hospitals have saved many a life in India. The doctor said that Barney must stay absolutely quiet for several weeks. This native fever was dangerous to a white man, and even during his convalescence, he should be near medical aid in case of relapse. Well, we had to get back here with our report and prisoner immediately. So there was only one thing to do. Leave Barney in India and fly back here. Which is exactly what we did. And that finishes our report, Chief Riley. You have all details of the case in the written report I've turned in. Yes, Clint. And I want to congratulate you, Spade, and the absent Barney, on the splendid job you did of driving the octopus out of Asia. Not only out of Asia, sir, but the whole world. He's dead, you know. Yes. It seems impossible that a man could jump from a plane high over such mountains as the Himalayas and still live. Well, I, for one, was never so glad to see a case closed as that one, Chief. I've been on the trail of the octopus for a long time. Almost seems too good to be true that we finally know he's done for. <laughs> Will Barney be mad when he gets out of his delirium and finds we went off without him? He wanted to be here with us to make a report to Chief Riley. Well, he'll be over, as soon as his health permits me. <laughs> but he's probably making life miserable for his doctors and nurses in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give you another good assistant, Clint. Smiley Preston. Smiley? I'll say he's a good man. Why, he... But wait a minute. Why do I need an assistant right now? Speed and I are going on that long postponed vacation. No, Clint, I can't let you go just yet, even though you've certainly earned a good rest. What? what? Well, I'll explain everything as soon as Smiley gets here. I've sent for him. He should be here any minute. Who is this Smiley, Clint? Oh, you heard me mention him often, Speed. <laughs> he's the laugh of the service. Comes from Alabama and looks half asleep most of the time, but but he's deadly as a cobra when he goes into action. Yes, and he knows Africa like a book. Uh, Africa? You mean you're sending us down there? Oh, this must be Smiley now. Come in. Hello, Smiley. Uh, did you all want me, Chief? Yes, uh, you know Clint here. Uh, Clint? <laughs> <laughs> Why, Clint Barlow, you old razorback. I thought you were leaping around somewhere in China or Tibet. <laughs> I just got back yesterday, Smiley. <laughs> uh huh. And this is your nephew, that speed boy? Say, fella, the whole service is talking about you and what you've done. <laughs> this is Smiley Preston, Speed. We went through training together. He's one of the best. And uh, don't let that grin of his fool you. He's always doing some pretty serious thinking behind it. Oh, don't let that man tell you things like that, Speed. <laughs> well, I'm mighty glad to meet you all. Me too, Smiley. But, Chief, what's this all about now? 
Yeah, what's this about sending us to Africa on some crazy Atlantean business? Huh? Atlantean? Well, suppose we begin at the beginning, boys. You see this briefcase on my desk? Well, it's full of data concerning a business enterprise that calls itself the Atlantean Syndicate. Well, surely this concern has no connection with Atlantis. Yes. The lost continent of fabulous wealth and supermen? Well, it claims to have, Clint. This syndicate has offered positive proof of the existence and exact location of Atlantis. Mm-hmm. But who'd believe him, Chief? Adventurers have been hunting for Atlantis for centuries and centuries, and nobody's been able to prove anything about it yet. Ten of the wealthiest men in the world believe the syndicate. Believe them so well that they've invested enormous sums of money in the syndicate to finance the expedition that is to uncover the lost continent in the Sahara Desert. Sahara Desert? In Africa? But I always thought that Atlantis was supposed to have disappeared beneath the ocean. Well, that's the general supposition, Speed. But persistent rumors have been coming out of the Sahara. The Atlantean Syndicate sent out a small expedition a year ago to trace down a story told by a French explorer who died before he could return to his discovery. Gosh. Now, this expedition brought back three items. A peculiar helmet, a cup of pure gold studded with precious stones, and a strangely shaped piece of granite which bore the name of a famous queen of Atlantis. See, that sounds like they found the real thing, all right. That's exactly what our clients thought, Clint. They're all hard-headed businessmen, but the Atlantean proposition rang so true that they unhesitatingly backed it. That was a year ago. Since then, they have been approached again and again for additional funds to carry on the work and have received nothing in return but vague promises. Mm -hmm, I see. Consequently, they have begun to suspect a gigantic swindle. They have asked the International Secret Police to begin a quiet investigation. Now, I want you to take charge, Clint. And go to Africa? Yes. The Atlantean Syndicate headquarters is located there. Why, we've just returned from Asia, sir. Can't someone else handle this Atlantean investigation? It sounds like a routine job on the surface. But, Clint, don't you realize the enormity of the thing? The story of Atlantis is almost a legend. It would take almost positive proof to interest such men as our clients in the expedition at all. Now, if it is a swindle, it has been planned by a mastermind. Yes. If I hadn't seen the octopus jump from the plane with my own eyes, I'd almost believe he was in back of the syndicate. The octopus? Man, I thought you said he was done for. <laughs> What's the matter, Smiley? Don't you want to go after him? No, sir. Not me, boy. I'll track anything from lions to dinosaurs, but not the octopus. No, sir. He's not you. I don't think you have to worry about him, Smiley. But, Clint. Yes, Speed? The octopus was wearing a parachute like the rest of us on that flight. Do you think he might have pulled the cord after he went through that cloud bank? Do you think that might have saved his life? Oh, not a chance, Speed. Even if he had used his chute, where could he find a safe landing in those mountains? And even if he did land safely, how could he live long enough through the wind and snow of those altitudes to reach civilization? Yeah, but we saw him do lots of other things that nobody else could do. Oh, forget it, Speed. No matter who's behind the Atlantean Syndicate, it isn't the octopus. But can't we take the investigation anyhow, Clint... Gee, I've always wanted to see Africa. Well, it won't be no pleasure trip, boy. I'll tell you that right now. It's mighty hot down there. And once you get out of town, you're always dodging snakes and crocodiles or animals of some sort. But that's all adventure, Smiley. I'd go for it in a big way. And if this Atlantean syndicate is on the level, golly, just think, we'll be in on the biggest discovery in ages. Well, don't try to sell the idea to me, Speed. Clint's the fellow that don't cotton to it. Gee, Clint... Won't you accept the investigation? Gosh, I've read so much about Africa, its jungles, belts, and in the Sahara. Golly, it'd be great. But if you've read all about it, Speed, you must know that Africa is dangerous for white men. Even now, in this modern age, it's still the dark continent once you leave the coast. Mm, that's right, Speed. Central Africa, where I've spent most of my time, is known as the white man's grave. Yeah, but we made out fine in Tibet, and that's known as the forbidden country... What's Africa got that Tibet hasn't? Well, just to mention two things. Black magic and cannibals. Oh. Ask Smiley. He's lived down there. That's right, Speed. You can still find cannibals if you look careful. And black magic? Well, you don't have to look hard for that. It's all around you in Africa. But don't let me talk you out of going. After all, I just work here. Well, after listening to all your talk, I'm wondering if you want to work here, Smiley. Oh, now, Chief, you know better than that. But you picked me for this detail because I knew Africa, so I have to tell him the truth, don't I? <laughs> yes. Well, now, Clint, you're my ace operator, and you've just come off one of the hardest assignments that I could give a man. Consequently, I'm not ordering you to take charge of this Atlantean investigation, because I know 
If you don't honestly feel you want to tackle it, you have a good reason. But I wish you would see your way clear to go to Africa. Well, that isn't exactly my idea of a vacation spot, sir. I see. Well, if that's your answer, I'll have to assign it to someone else. Oh, gee, Clint. I was going to send you over in the new plane, too. Uh, new plane, sir? Yes, we've just completed testing it. You'd be the first one to use it. It's larger than our pursuit planes, carries six passengers, has a wider cruising radius and enormous fuel tanks, a bimotored amphibian. Boy, that sounds like a honey. And you ought to see the super shortwave equipment she carries, boy. It's so powerful that, well, I'm figuring I'm picking up Mars or maybe the moon any day now. Changed your mind, Clint? Mm, no, no, I'm sorry, Chief, but I'm tired and... Oh, just uh... a minute. Hello? Yeah? A cable from Africa. Uh, from Africa? Yeah, no, save time and read it to me now. Yeah. 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 What? No, no, hold the reply until I call you back. Uh, what is it, Chief? Anything, huh? anything wrong, Chief? Yeah, that cable is from our operator in Morocco. In code, of course. Buchanan has disappeared. Who's Buchanan? One of the largest stockholders in the Atlantean Syndicate. He went down to Africa a few months ago to do some investigating on his own, in spite of my warning. Now he's gone. And the last trace they've had of his appearance was in White Man's Grave, Smiley. Central Africa. Oh, me. Evidently, he'd located some information in the interior. A scrap of paper was found in his belongings, and on it was the mark of the octopus. Oh, the octopus? Well, he's dead. Yeah, well, perhaps one of his lieutenants is carrying on the work. Remember, Speed, his criminal organization is worldwide. Perhaps his disappearance has nothing to do with the Atlantean Syndicate, but it looks mighty suspicious. I'll say it is. When do we leave, Chief? Clint, you mean you'll go to Africa? I can't rest until every tentacle of the octopus is destroyed, Speed. Yes, we'll go to Africa. Whoopee! Africa, jungles, the Sahara, lost Atlantis, and maybe the octopus again. Gosh, what are we waiting for, fellas? Let's go! of the International Secret Police. When Speed Gibson and Clint Barlow return from Asia after ending the activities there of the octopus and his infamous gang, they learn that Chief Riley, head of the International Secret Police, has another job for them. A syndicate located in Africa claims to have located the long-lost continent of Atlantis in the midst of the Sahara Desert. They have secured the financial backing of ten of the world's richest men, but since receiving the money, have accomplished nothing tangible. The investors, suspecting a gigantic swindle, have asked the secret police to begin a quiet investigation. And Speed and Clint are assigned to this duty when Buchanan, one of the heaviest stockholders, disappears in Central Africa. And a scrap of paper bearing the mark of the octopus 
is found among his belongings. We find the boys and Smiley Preston, who is replacing Barney, getting ready for the takeoff from New York. Oh, is everything packed, Speed? Yes, Clint. It was easy. Most of the big stuff wasn't unpacked yet. <laughs> we hardly stay in one place long enough to get our washing done. <laughs> you said it. You don't have to worry about washing down in Africa, boy. Too hot to wear many clothes. Is it really as hot as I've heard, Smiley? Is it hot? Once you all get inland, all you'll be thinking about is a nice, tall glass of ice water. And you'll have to take it out and thinking, because if there's one thing they haven't got in that country, it's ice water. Well, I'm hoping we won't have to go inland, Smiley. Mm. You're going to look for Buchanan, and he was last seen in Central Africa. I know, but by the time we reach there, the whole picture may have changed. I've been studying these reports on the syndicate, and most of their activity seems to have started in Morocco. Since we're landing there, we'll probably lay over for a little while until we get our bearings. What route have you finally decided to take, Clint? Well, from here we go to Bermuda, and then make our longest hop between there and the Azores. Man, that is a hop. 2,200 miles, I think. It'll be a cinch in that plane they've got for us. Gee, it's a deli. From the Azores, we could go right on to Morocco. But we better play safe and set down on the island of Madeira, and then go on to the African coast. How long will it take us to reach Bermuda? Mm, about five hours, I should say. Mm, say, we don't get down to the dock, we'll never get away from New York. I told Chief Riley we'd meet him there at ten, and it's 9.30 already. What was that he said about giving us a crew, Clint? Oh, yes, uh, Leeds and Davis, a mechanic and a navigator. Navigator? We don't need him. Well, you've always done that job, Clint. Mm, the chief wants us to concentrate on the job ahead of us, feet, and not so much on the flying. I'll handle the controls, and Smiley can relieve me. Other than that, we'll be free to think of the African setup. Oh, that new ship almost flies itself. But we're supposed to be working on the quiet. Are these other fellows in on the investigation? No, no, they're not members of the secret police, but merely employees. Now, they've been told that we're going over to check up on our agencies in Africa. So, uh, be careful what you say in front of them. Don't mention the Atlantean syndicate. I get it. Well, we're all ready. Let's go. Yeah, I... Wait a minute. What's the matter, Smiley? My rabbit's foot. I ain't got it. Rabbit's foot? <laughs> if you think Barney was superstitious, wait till you're around Smiley a while, Speed. He wasn't born in Alabama for nothing. <laughs> now, I ain't superstitious, but Barney Pete have just helped me, and it's been lucky to me, that's all, and I... Ah, here it is. This little old piece of fluff has saved my life many a time. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't do much for the rabbit it belonged to. Huh? Now, wouldn't you know he'd think of something like that, Clint? Come on. Let's get along the dock or he'll have me losing faith in this here bunny's foot. <laughs> oh, kind of busy down here at the dock. Gee, this is a swell land and the secret police have, isn't it, Clint? Special police launches and a pier and a float where the planes can be boarded? Yes, we got just about everything here in our New York headquarters, Speed. But we need it. Never know what sort of a call we're going to get from what corner of the earth. Yeah. Look, isn't that Chief Riley waiting for us there ahead? Hmm? Oh, yes. Those two fellows with him are Leeds and Davis. You know them very well, Clint? No, just by sight. I've never worked with them. Have you, Smiley? No, Speed. They stay right here in New York, and most of my time has been spent in Africa, you know. Oh. Hmm? Why? What's on your mind, Speed? Well, I guess I'm just used to working with secret police operators... Somehow I'm not so keen on having anybody else along on an important flight like this. Uh, the kid's smart, Clint. Yeah, uh, smart, but he needs experience. Sometimes we have to work with civilian speed. And Leeds and Davis are to be trusted. At least the chief recommends them highly, and he should know, if anyone. Sure. Remember now, not a word about the Atlantean syndicate. Don't worry. So far as those fellows will know, I'm just going along for the ride. Hi, Chief Riley. Good morning, Speed. Well, uh, do you think we wouldn't get here, sir? No, no, you're right on time, Clint. You always are. Your baggage arrived a few minutes ago. I knew you couldn't be far behind. Oh, uh, you and Preston know your mechanic and navigator. Oh, yes. How are you, sir? Speed Gibson, this is Mr. Davis, and this is Mr. Leeds. How, How are you? Speed. I've heard a lot about you from Chief Riley. Have you, Mr. Leeds? Well, I think we're going to get along fine. Maybe we'll let you help with the navigation. No, thanks. Clint's teaching it to me, but he's also taught me not to monkey around when somebody else is doing it. You did, huh? You've got a smart nephew, Mr. Barlow. <laughs> he can hold up his ends of things, all right. Is our baggage stored away in the plane, Chief Riley? Yes, Davis took care of all that. Your motors are warmed up, too. Switched them off just before you arrived. Good. And I guess everything is all set for the takeoff. Now, you have your instructions as to what procedure to follow in Africa. Check up on all our operators in the key cities. 
and keep in constant touch with me regarding your progress. I uh, understand, sir. We'll do our best. Sure, and with me along, they'll know more about Africa than they know about the United States when we come back. (laughs) You take care of us, all right, Smiley, with that uh, rabbit's foot along. (laughs) Well, start the motors, Davis. Yes, sir, right away. Boy, what a plane. Looks almost as big as the clipper ships, Chief Riley. Well, you'll need a large plane on this flight speed. You may have to live in it for days at a time. You'll find it completely equipped for every emergency. Uh Uh-huh. Plenty of uh, ammunition, of course, for big game. Yes, everything you might need. Are you figuring on having time to hunt big game, Mr. Barlow? If we uh, come across it, Leeds. Never know what might cross our path in Africa. Listen to that motor. Hmm. Sweet like an angel song. Gosh, I can hardly wait to start the flight. Well, here goes the second motor. Might as well go down to the float and board the plane. Yes. Now you have full instructions, Clint. From here on, it's all up to you, speed and presence. You uh, may depend on us. Come on. Think you'll have any trouble handling such a big ship, Clint? You're used to the smaller planes. Yes, but when I took this one up on the trial flight yesterday, she handled like a dream, Smiley. That San Diego company that built this bimoted amphibian certainly outdid themselves. They turned out a plane that's way ahead of anything else in the year. I'll tell you more about that after we land in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> well, here we are. I don't need to tell you, boys, that I wish you plenty of luck. Now, thank you, Chief. And we'll keep in constant touch with you by a short wave set. Smiley can handle that and the and speed can help him out. You bet. Goodbye, Chief. Goodbye, Smiley. And don't let any wild animals get these boys. Don't you pass yourself that speed and please. I think the wild animals will be the ones that'll have to worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead and get that plane, fella. <laughs> so long, Chief Riley. So long, so long Chief. Take care, sir. All right. What a plane. You can hardly hear the motors back here in the cabin. Mm-hmm. I never worry about motors so long as I hear them. It's when I'm up in the air and don't hear them that gets me fussed. <laughs> well, you won't have to think about things like that with Clint at the control, Smiley. I know, boy. I've known that razor back for a long time, and he's never let me down yet. And something tells me that you're cut out of the same piece of wood. Sure hope so. There's nobody I'd rather be like than Clint. Ah, uh, you said it. Um, uh, say, I wonder if there's anything to eat right handy. You hungry? Well, we've been up in the air two hours, and uh, I ain't had a bite. Uh, what about you? No, if I'm too excited to eat, I'll wait till we land at Bermuda. I'll get you something, Smiley. What would you like? Sandwiches, fruit, candy, or what? Uh, well, just give me a couple of three sandwiches and uh, some fruit. Uh, and some candy, too, uh, I don't want to eat too much before we dine in Bermuda. <laughs> no, sounds like it. I'll get the stuff now. Uh, where's Leeds and Davis? Mr. Davis is up in the control cabin with Clint. Leeds just went through here a while ago. Says something about checking up on the parachutes in the baggage compartment. Yeah? Uh, what's he figuring on doing? Bailing out? <laughs> don't know. Guess he's like some people when they get on a boat. First thing they look for is a life preserver. Yeah, Well, he'd better spend more time on his navigating and less time in the baggage room. Chutes won't do him any good if we get way off our course. Don't worry about that. Clint knows too much about navigation himself. Say, if we've been in the air over two hours, we're almost halfway to Bermuda. Uh Uh-huh. And I'm still hungry. Uh, Throw me an apple or something if you can't find those sandwiches in a hurry, boy. Here it all is, Smiley. You want anything to drink with it? Milk or something? I can get it out of the refrigerator. No, thanks. What are you looking for? When I was over getting the food, I I thought I smelled smoke. Imagination. Nobody smoked since we left New York. I don't get it over here. Just over there. Are you hungry already, Mr. Preston? Well, looks kind of like it leads with all this food around me. Please tell Clint to call me if he wants anything, Mr. Lee. All right, Speed. I'll tell him. Man, oh man. Billy, the sandwiches hit the spot. Smiley, now I smell smoke over here. Will you forget that talk about smoke up here? It makes me nervous. But it's getting stronger all the time. 
Where the dickens is it coming from? Well, maybe Clean's burning too much oil or something. Remember, this plane's brand new speed. Needs to be sort of broken in. No, it isn't that kind of smoke. Smiley, look what's cooling out from the baggage compartment from under the door. Holy leaping bullfrogs, it is smoke. The baggage room. Smiley, the plane's on fire. <laughs> Of the International Secret Police. and Smiley Preston take off from New York on their flight to Africa, expecting to land at Bermuda within five hours. Clint is at the controls. Speed is back in the main cabin with Smiley, and the mechanic and navigator, Leeds and Davis, who are busy with their duties, particularly Leeds. Halfway across, Speed becomes aware of smoke. At first, he thinks nothing of it, since Leeds, who just came from the baggage compartment, seems unable to notice the odor of smoke. Nor can Smiley. Then, suddenly, Speed sees a thin wisp of smoke coming from under the door of the baggage room, and not knowing whether the whole compartment is ablaze or not, runs toward the control room to warn Clint, while Smiley rushes for the fire extinguisher. Got the extinguisher ready, Smiley? Yeah, Speed, you open the door, and I'll, I'll pour this stuff in on whatever's burning. Stand aside so I don't squirt any of it in your eye. And... Here, let me have the extinguisher. No, you go up and stand by Clint. Maybe he'll, he'll need you while he's landing. He, he may need you for something. Are you ready, Speed? Yeah. Well, then open the door. <laughs> Oh, that smoke. Well, get out of the way, Speed. I, I don't see where I'm aiming. For all this smoke, I can't see nothing. Don't worry about me, Smarty. Just use that extinguisher in there before the fire spreads. Okay, okay. Here, here she goes. Oh, that's good, this, Smarty. Give it some more. <coughs> oh, go on, that smoke. Burns my eyes. Oh, you're putting the fire out, though. Clint's landing, too. That'll give us a better chance at it. I'll say he's landing. Didn't get a chance to put on our safety belts with all this rockets and... And we're being thrown around like beans in a bucket. But we're down. That's the main thing. Uh, see, Mr. Barlow? It started back here near the tail of the ship. Speed, Smiley. Is the fire under control? I think so, Clint. Can't tell until some of this smoke clears out. Yes, of course. Open the door of the portholes, boys. That'll clear it out quickly. All right. All right. You get that one over there, and I'll get this one. That's it. There it is. Any idea how it started? No. Speed spotted it first. Otherwise, the whole tail of the ship might have burned away before we noticed it. Yeah. Mr. Leeds, didn't you see the fire when you were back in the baggage room? Well, no, Speed. That's what puzzles me. Oh, it must have been caused by spontaneous combustion because there wasn't a trace of smoke in the compartment when I was in there. Nothing in the baggage to cause spontaneous combustion? No. Gosh, Clint, what do you think started it? That's what I hope to find out, Speed. We can begin right now because that wind cleared the smoke out in no time. Stand back, boys, so we can clear out the baggage. Well, might as well do the job right and throw it out, Clint. Well, it sure is a mess in here. I'll say so. Lucky that we just had our clothes in there. No important papers or anything. That's right. 
and we can buy whatever stuff we need in Bermuda. Boy, what a mess it is in here. Stand by, Steve, while I heave these suitcases out to you. Okay, Smiley. All right. Is the plane burned any? Well, as far as I can see, which ain't far right now, it just sins a little bit. But I hate to think what might have happened if Pete hadn't noticed that smoke when he did. Well, I'll say so. A fire in the air halfway between New York and Bermuda is no picnic. And you didn't notice a thing when you were back in the baggage room, Leeds. No, sir. I wasn't in there long, of course, but if there had been any smoke, I certainly would have noticed it. I should think so. Gosh, look at my suitcase. Burned to a cinder, and it had my one and only suit in it. And don't you worry about that, Sonny. Or just make sure the fire is really out. We might bring in some buckets of seawater and drench the compartment. And then we'll be on our way again to Bermuda. Will we reach there on schedule, Clint? I think so. I hope so, anyway. Because the sooner we reach there, the sooner we'll learn exactly what caused this fire. Ah, gee, I like Bermuda, Clint. Wouldn't mind if it took them longer than six hours to clean up our plane. I wouldn't mind either if I could sleep all those hours. <sighs> Boy, am I tired. I've searched every inch of that baggage compartment and couldn't find a trace of the origin of the fire. Yeah, we all searched the place. That means that someone deliberately started it. Started a fire in mid-ocean? Well, that's crazy. Not crazy. Desperate speed. Someone is trying to keep us away from Africa by destroying us before we ever reach there. For land sakes, why? Nobody knows why we're going there. Not even Leeds or Davis. They just think it's routine checkup on our posts in Africa. Somebody knows something. Or that fire would never have started. But couldn't the wiring be defective or something? Hardly, Speed. This is a new specially built plane, remember. It was given every test possible before Chief Riley accepted it for the secret police. Nothing is wrong with the plane, but I'm not so sure about the passengers. Leeds and Davis? Yes. But gee, they seem like swell fellas, Clint. Right. And I've known some charming murderers in my time, too. Gosh, but if Leeds had set the baggies room on fire, he sure wouldn't have let us see him in there just before it happened, would he? I wouldn't think so. But he may be more clever than some of our enemies. You know, Speed, an innocent man always acts more guilty than a guilty man because he's caught off guard when accused of something. He becomes confused by trying to clear himself of the charges against him. A criminal has thought it all out in advance, has an answer for any question that might be hurled at him. Oh, I get it. Well, then, if you think Leeds or Davis is guilty... Why don't you arrest him right now? We're not sure of anything. We have absolutely no proof of guilt. But that fire tells us that somebody knows that we're going to Africa to investigate the Atlantean Syndicate and Buchanan's mysterious disappearance in Central Africa. We must watch our step from now on. I'll say so. You know, anybody that set a plane of fire in the air with themselves in it ain't a criminal. They're just plain crazy. Well, watch yourselves whenever you're around Leeds and Davis. Neither of them must know that we suspect them. Where are they now? They're getting something to eat. Then Leeds was going down to the plane to check up on the motor. I'm going to cable Chief Riley about the fire and then join Leeds. It's a good idea for one of us to always be around while he's near the plane. Yes, sir. For all we know, we might get in the air and have the whole rear end fall off. Uh, but speaking of eating, I'm hungry. What about you, Speed? I could go for something to eat, too. I'd like to see more of Bermuda. All right. You boys go and eat, then. But come down to the plane when you're finished. And, Speed... Keep your eye on Smiley. Huh? Hold on to him if you see a pretty girl. Otherwise, he'll ask to see her home or wherever she's going, and we'll be here for a week. Now, look here. I resent that. Here you talk, you'd think women was my weakness. You weren't born in the South for nothing. Remember what I said, Speed. <laughs> okay. We'll see you at the plane, Clint. <laughs> Boy, I'm full. Yeah, me too. But that food was so good, I hated to leave anything. Well, I guess we'd better clear out of this cafe or they'll charge us for parking. <laughs> okay. Then we'll go on down to the plane. Well, I'd just as soon go back to the hotel and sleep, but uh, duty calls at... Ah, yes, sir. Duty sure does call. What are you looking at? Uh-oh. A pretty girl. Now, you let me alone, Speed. There's no harm in just looking, you know. No, but she's looking, too. It looks like she's going to come over here. Well, shut my mouth. That's exactly what she's going to do. Come on, Smiley. Let's get out of here and find Clint. Now, it's all right, Speed. We're not doing anything except just a sitting here. We can't help it if people come over and talk to us. It isn't just 
people. It's a girl, and she's pretty. Oh, she sure is. And we've been here too long anyhow. Come on, Smiley, let's get going. Oh, stop tugging at my arm, boy. You're going to get me riled. But, Smiley... Look out, she'll hear you. Oh. Please, do you mind if I sit at your table? I must talk with you. Well, of course not, miss. Here, sit right oh, down thank here. thank you so much. Well, now, uh... Now, what is it you want to talk to us about? You... You are American, are you not? Yes, ma'am. From the South, to be exact. I thought so. When I first saw you... Oh, and Americans are so strong, so dependable. Well, thanks, miss. If we can be of any service to you, we'd be mighty pleased. Smiley, we've got to go on us. Now, hush your mouth, Speed. This lady's in trouble. You wouldn't want to go without seeing if we could help, would you? But, but listen... Oh, you are so understanding. What is your name? Well, just call me Smiley. Smiley. What a lovely name. Oh, and I am in such trouble. You were indeed right when you said that. I I wonder if... Oh, but no, I could not ask that. Go ahead. Ask me anything you want. If you would only help me, you you would win my undying appreciation. And I would not ask... I, I could not ask anyone but American like you to help me. No one else would understand. Lady, I'm the understandingest man you ever saw. Now, uh, what do you want me to do? My brother is in a room here in this cafe. He left home because of a quarrel with my father and refuses to return. My parents have sent me to bring him back, and I wonder if you will go to him with me. I am not used to being in a public place, a, a cafe like this alone. I, I would like your protection. Well, I sure will go with you, miss. Just show me where you want me to go, and oh, I'll... Oh, it is not far. Just to a room off that corridor over there. Smiley, please listen. Now you listen to me, Speed. If you're so fired anxious to get back to Clint, well, go ahead. I'll be along pretty soon. But smile. Go on, get going. Okay, I'll go. But I'll bring Clint back here with me. Maybe he can make you see right. The boy, he he does not like me. Oh, sure, he likes you. He, he, he just appointed himself my guardian, and once in a while I have to tell him that I'm free, white, and uh, over 21 and can take care of myself. I am sure of that. Now, will you, will you please follow me? Oh, rather than anything else... Lead on, miss. All right, this way. It is not far. Well, I hope your brother won't mind my interfering like this. I do not care what he minds. He must return to our home. Yeah, he he must, and I'll see that he does. Personally, I think he's crazy to leave any home that uh, you're in. You are too kind. Now, through this door. Well, it doesn't seem to be in here. We shall wait for him. Now, I may seem stupid, miss, but uh, just how is your brother going to get in here if you lock the door? Never mind that. Just sit over there and make no noise. And if I do? I will make a little more with this gun and silence you. A gun? <laughs> uh -huh. So, you frame me, eh? Yes, Mr. Preston. And now we shall wait for your friends to come here and uh, rescue you. And don't you think for one minute that they won't. You know, that was kind of foolish of you to let Speed know where I am. Not so foolish as you were, stupid one. For when the boy returns with Clint Barlow, we shall be prepared to welcome them. By that time, my friends will have arrived and... And you, all three of you, will never walk out of this cafe alive. <laughs> Of the International Secret Police. 
zero. Ding it zero. Ding it zero. Ding it zero. After narrowly escaping death in a mysterious fire at sea, Speed, Clint, and Smiley land their big plane in Bermuda for a short layover. During this time, the fire-blackened baggage compartment is cleaned up, and Leeds, the mechanic, checks over the motors for possible trouble. Clint, suspecting that either Leeds or Davis, the navigator, is responsible for the fire, goes to the plane to watch over it. Meantime, Speed and Smiley dine at a cafe, planning to join Clint afterwards. At the cafe, Smiley is approached by a very pretty girl who asks him to aid her in getting her brother out of the cafe. In spite of Speed's warning, Smiley follows her to a room in the rear of the building. Speed says that he is going to get Clint, and Smiley, after going with Lota, the lady of mystery, discovers that the whole thing is a trap to get all three of them together and destroy them. We now find him trying to think his way out of the trouble. Lota is watching him. You appear to be thinking very hard, Mr. Preston. Are you wondering how to warn Barlow and the boy of the trap? Might be. But I'm really worrying about that little gun you're toting. A woman with a gun is mighty dangerous. I suppose you would like me to put it away. Mm, I'd feel considerable better. (laughs) Do not try to fool me, Mr. Preston. I have been warned about the secret police. I know you are most clever. Well, I wish I knew as much about you. Who are you working for? Oh, it is not mannerly to question a lady. Well, it ain't exactly mannerly to entertain your guests at the point of a gun, I might remind you. And to think I came in here to try and help you with your brother. A man will come here soon, but uh, he is not my brother. Why are you doing this, miss? Another question. Well, you're taking a mighty lot for granted after all. Supposing Clint doesn't come here after me. He warned me not to be taken in by any pretty girl. Maybe when Speed tells him I was, he'll get good and riled up and leave me alone. What then? Then we shall kill you and seek another way of luring your friends to a quiet place and destroying them. You're a beautiful woman. Beautiful, miss. Like a king cobra. The deadliest snake I know of. Do not move or I will shoot. Don't worry, I won't move. I won't give you the pleasure of shooting my carcass. But it'd do me a heap of good to see Clint snap the cuffs on those pretty wrists of yours. I saw a leopard taken that way once, chained and helpless, but snarling and hating to the very last. She was a pretty cat, too, but wicked. You are trying to make me angry. First you liken me to a snake and then to a leopard. But I am not like other women, Mr. Preston. I do not lose my head in anger, so you will have a chance to get these gun and uh, perhaps escape. Luther! Yes, Peter. Just one moment. You, Preston, do not move while I unlock the door. The gun will still be trained on you. Nice to have your undivided attention, miss. Well, I see you've got him. Oh, it was very easy. If Barlow is as easy to fool as this one, I cannot understand why he has lived so long. Shut up, Lothar. Oh, you need not fear my tongue, Peter. This one has been trying to learn something from me ever since I brought him here. Yes, has he? <laughs> well, we'll soon answer all his questions. At least, he won't be asking any more. Now, look here, Peter, uh, whoever you are. I don't know what this is all about, but if you think you're going to get away with murdering us in the back room of a cafe, you're playing crazy. If we disappear, there'll be a big investigation. You know that. I know, and we've thought of everything. For your information, Preston, we can do away with you and Barlow very nicely back here, because the gun we're using has a silencer on it. Besides, 
By the time he arrives, the orchestra will be playing outside. No one will hear a thing. No one will ever know what happened. Why, you murdering rat, you'll pay for this. All right, we'll see. Are the others outside? Yes, yeah, stationed in the corridor. When Barlow and the boy arrive, I've instructed the manager to direct them back here. Our men will close in behind them once they're in the corridor, out of sight of the cafe crowd. You're going to be mighty disappointed when Clint doesn't show up. Don't worry. When the boy, this Speed Gibson, tells his uncle that you've agreed to help a lady in distress, <laughs> well, Barlow will come here all right. <laughs> you figured everything out, ain't you? You bet. And this time, Barlow won't get away. He'll never live to investigate the Atlantean syndicate. Atlantean syndicate? Peter, you warned me not to say anything. Don't you worry, Lothar. This blight will never live to tell what he knows. <laughs> I'll see to that, I will. I'll see to it. Clint, I thought I'd find you down here at the plane. Oh, hello, Speed. Uh, where's Smiley? That's why I came. He wouldn't leave that cafe. There was a girl. What? You don't want Leeds to hear this, do you? He can't if you talk low. He's too far away, and besides, he's working on one motor. Talk fast, Speed. What happened? An awful pretty girl came to our table just as we were getting ready to go. I tried to get Smiley away, but after she asked him to help her, I couldn't budge him. Oh, the darn fool. And after I warned him before he left the hotel. I know, but I couldn't do anything with him. The girl wanted him to help her get her brother out of some room at the cafe. Last I saw of him, he was heading there. I told him I'd bring you to talk some sense into him. That's the one thing we'll have to watch for in Smiley. He'll get himself and us into trouble over every pretty face we see on this trip. If we don't throw a good scare into him now. What are you going to do, Clint? Wait and see. I want to make a phone call before we leave here. Then we'll go right to the cafe. I'll give that southern Romeo a lesson he'll never forget. Believe me, I'll tell him a thing or two. There's the cafe over there, Clint. Hmm? Oh, yes, I see. Looks harmless enough from the outside. I suppose Smiley's still in there. Hope we haven't missed him. Yeah, so do I. What are you looking for, Clint? Hmm? Oh, nothing. Well, I'm ready now. Let's go in. Okay. But I'd sure like to know how you're going to teach Smiley a lesson. Wait and see. Oh, here's the door. You go in first. They'll recognize you. Okay. Here's where we sat over there. Oh, mm-hmm. Here comes the head waiter. You talk to him, Speed. You don't want to make it appear as if we're worried. Worried? You mean this might be a trap, Clint? I thought of that angle. Look out. Here he comes. Yes, gentlemen. You wish a table for two? No. I was here a little while ago and sat at that table over there with another fella. You remember him? He was big, always smiling. Always. Oh, I recognize you now. Your friend is in the rear of the cafe. Go down that corridor to the last door, and you will find him within. Oh, that's well. I was afraid maybe we'd missed him. Come on, Clint. I'm coming. I don't think this is a trap of any sort, Clint. The place is too big to stand for any dirty work. And look at all the people that are here. They couldn't get away with anything without attracting attention. Then why is that head waiter signaling with his handkerchief? Huh? And look at all those waiters standing around the corridor. Speed, we've walked into a trap, all right? Well, golly, then we'd better turn around and walk out of it again before we get out of sight of the customers. And leave Smiley here? No, but we can get help from the English authorities here. It might be too late by that time. No, Speed, we've got to get Smiley as soon as possible. Get your gun ready. It's in my side pocket. Good. And don't betray your thoughts by any look or word. We've got to run that gauntlet of cutthroats as if we suspected nothing. Okay, Clint. All right, come on. Let's go out to the corridor. Meantime, let's talk as if we were thinking of nothing but getting Smiley away from some girl. Yeah. Well, this is the corridor the head waiter showed us. Yes. I'll bat Smiley's ears down for bringing us down here after him. I wanted to get some sleep before our takeoff, and instead I had to play chaperone for that Romeo. I know. I tried to talk him out of staying here, but he fell for that girl like a ton of bricks. The idea of helping her with her brother. Why can't he keep out of other people's business? Sure. 
If her brother had a fight with his dad, I don't see how Smiley could help anything by making him go home. Those fellas are closing in behind us, Clint. Now, lights in this corridor aren't very... Now, lights in this corridor aren't very bright. Don't worry. We don't start anything while we're out in the corridor. We don't start anything while we're out in the corridor. Someone might come along and see them. I remember Smiley. Uh, he was going through training school with me. <laughs> he was always in love with some girl or another, even back in those days. I wondered if he ever learned anything. <laughs> he was plenty smart, though, and plenty tough when he has to be. How are we going to get out of here once we find Smiley, if we find him? We worry about that when the time comes. Is that the door up there, I wonder? The light isn't any too good back in here. Now, come on, let's go. Looks like the end of the corridor, all right. But we'd better knock before we go busting in, just in case that isn't the right room. Call me, Clint. There must be five fellas in back of us. Don't pretend to notice them, Speed. Or they'll jump us here. We're far enough away from that main room now. This is worse than any fighting we've ever done. My backbone feels like it's crawling. I shouldn't have gotten you into this rat's nest. Hey, yes. I couldn't keep Smiley from getting into trouble. Maybe I can get him out of it. Yeah, I guess this is the right door, all right. Listen, Speed. Get your gun out when I knock on the door. And be ready to whirl and hold off those fellas behind us if they try to rush us. Can I do that now? Keep them back while you open the door? No. Once you turn, you'll have to start shooting. And I don't want that, unless it's absolutely necessary. It's too dark back here. They'd get us before we could get them. But if they do start shooting, while you hear a knife whistle by, drop to the floor. Okay. I'm all ready for him. Good. Now, I'll knock. Smiley! Smiley Preston! Are you in there? Why doesn't he answer? I don't know. Smiley! Are you there? Clint, get over here! It's a trap! Oh. It's Smiley! They got Smiley! Come on, Clint! Let's go after Please, him! Please, look out! Behind you! Hey! Of the International Secret Police. While Speed, Clint, and Smiley are laying over in Bermuda, waiting for their plane to be cleaned up after the mysterious fire at sea, Smiley gets into trouble over a pretty face. He is lured to a back room of a cafe where Lota, the girl who begged him to help her, turns a gun on him. And with Peters, a hard-looking individual who tells Smiley that this will teach the secret police not to investigate the Atlantean syndicate, awaits Speed and Clint. The corridor leading to the room is planted with men of the gang who want to destroy Clint and the others when they walk into the trap that already holds Smiley helpless. Clint makes a mysterious phone call before going to the cafe, however, and on reaching the room, breaks in to rescue Smiley in spite of the southerner's shouted warning. Clint, Clint grab that fellow. I got the girl. Look out, Clint. He's getting away. I've got him. What about those fellas in the corridor? They're, they're well taken care of. Peter seems anxious to get away. Let me 
at him. He took a poke at me just a while ago. Let me at him. Look at no, my take eye. Take it easy. Take it easy, Spotty. Fighting's all over for the time being. Let me. Let no, me. you don't. Oh, you fool. Let me. That's what you think, Clint. Speed, help me with this wildcat. I know, sir. I told you not to listen to her in the first place. You don't have to hold her long, Smiley. The police are in the corridor. The police? How come, Clint? That was that phone call I made just before leaving the airport, Speed. I had a hunch this whole thing was a trap. Well, it sure is, Clint. And this Peters rascal said something about us messing around with the uh, Atlantean syndicate. I did not, you bomb Are you calling me a liar? Now, well, I... calm down, Smiley. You've gotten us into enough trouble already without wanting to fight every minute. Now, we'll see just what this Peters knows when we get him and the girl down to the inspector's office. So come along. No, I will come not along, for you. Now, listen, please, come along. This is much easier. Come with me. Now, then, will you sit here, Miss... Uh, uh, what was her name, Inspector? Lote is all that we know her by, Mr. Barlow. She's often seen around the cafe, but so far has done nothing criminal until today. I have done nothing. Smiley tells us different, Lota. I was merely following orders. Peter's orders. Don't you try to put it off on me, me girl. You're in it as deep as any of us. In what? Wouldn't you like to know, pretty boy? Why, no, you... Oh, Smiley. <laughs> you sit down, too. Inspector, this questioning is liable to take some time. There's no need of you to stay here. Now, supposing you take care of those uh, pseudo-waiters who were waiting to ambush us, and I'll see what we can learn from this couple. Very well, Mr. Barlow. I'll be in the next office should you need me. Thank you, Inspector. If you think you're going to learn anything from me, you'd better take another think, Mr. Barlow, because I ain't talking. And loaded better not if she knows what's healthy. Have uh, you ever been in prison, Peters? Nah. Sure he has, Clint. Don't you remember? The inspector showed us his prison record just before he brought him in here. Yes, I know, Speed. I just wanted to see how much more he could lie. He lies even in the face of definite proof. My, my. Aren't you the smart one learning all those things about me? What do you know about the Atlantean syndicate? Atlantean? What's that? You know what it is, all right. You talked about it to Smiley. Why do you want to stop us from going to Africa to investigate it? Since when does a secret police hire children? What do you know about the octopus? Octopus? You don't know much about those blighters. But I could tell you a lot about sharks or sardines. You're not getting anywhere with him, Clint. Yeah, I know it. We haven't got much time to spend here either. Uh, how's that eye of yours, Smiley? Yeah, hurt something fierce, Clint. Yeah, it's getting purple, too. You'd better go out and have the police doctor fix it up for you. And, oh, yes, sir, take Peters with you. Tell the inspector to put him in a cell by himself. Hold him for further questioning. I'd love to take Peters with me, but I don't know as he'll need a cell once I fix him for giving me this black eye. Die off of me, will you? Now walk through that door before I throw you through. Now kill him. Don't you give me any of your back. Boy, when Smiley gets mad, he really means it, doesn't he? <laughs> he certainly does, Speed. But now, let's talk to Miss Lota a while. So, that is why you sent Peters out of the room. You thought I would tell you what you want to know. Well, I will not. No, I don't think you could tell us much of any value. Criminals don't tell too much to a woman in their gang. They fear her tongue and her good sense. A woman can't be fooled for long. What do you mean, fooled? Whoever employed you to lure us into a possible trap didn't give you the full information concerning our history. I knew you were members of the International Secret Police. Oh, yes. But did you know that Smiley is counted as one of its ace operators? Even though he has a liking for a uh, pretty face, he never forgets that it might hide great danger. And uh, you are beautiful enough to turn the head of any man. One thing they did not tell me, that Clint Barlow was gallant. Do you know everything about the Atlantean Syndicate? No, only that you are trying to trap me into answering your question. Oh, no. No, Lothar. But you're in a bad spot. Interfering with the duties of the secret police carries a heavy penalty. And attempted ambush and possible murder do not sit well with the British authorities. I was only following orders. But it may go a lot easier with you if you help us instead of fight us, Lothar. By telling us whatever you know, you will render us a great service. I would not dare do that. I'm afraid. Afraid of what? Of whom? I... I do not know. Do you know that the British authorities will protect you from any harm? I know that they think they can. But the octopus can wreak his vengeance anywhere. Octopus? The octopus is dead. We saw him jump from our plane over the Himalayas. I do not know whether he is dead or alive. Only that, that he is awful. That his power lives on to destroy anyone who goes against his will. Oh, nonsense. This is the 20th century, Lothar. You are a prisoner of the International Secret Police. 
under the protection of England until such a time as it is deemed advisable to free you. The power of the octopus or his gang cannot harm you now. I have told you all that I know, Mr. Barlow. Simply that the octopus or someone acting for him ordered that you and the others be stopped here at Bermuda. Peter's paid me for my part in the bargain. I believe he knows a good deal more than I do. And he won't talk. He may not know much more than Lotus told us, Speed. It has always been the way of the octopus not to let his left hand know what his right is doing. Whoever has taken his place is evidently following the same procedure. Clint, you don't think he might still be alive? Oh, I don't see how it's possible. Well, of course, there's always that chance we didn't actually see him die. Oh, please, but... please protect me from him, from the octopus gang. We shall, though, sir. You need fear nothing more from them. It is unfortunate that you became mixed up with that gang in the first place. I needed money. I did not know how wicked they were. Nor how kind you were. Well, let this teach you a lesson. And now I'm uh, going to talk to Peters again and see if we can learn anything more. And then we'll be ready to take off, see? See, we're late as it is. We'll be way overdue at the Azores. That's our longest hop, isn't it? 2,200 miles? Mm Mm-hmm. The weather report is okay. We should have a good flight. Barring uh, more mysterious accidents. I'll say. This flight has been full of trouble already. We're not even in Africa yet. Ah, according to the degree of which they've tried to stop us from reaching it, we'll have plenty of trouble on our hands when we get there. But then, let's get started, or we'll never get in the air. How's your eye feeling now, Smiley? Terrible speed, but my pride feels even worse. I can spend years in Africa, hunt all sorts of wild animals, and I don't get hurt. But I come to little old Bermuda, and the crook gives me a black eye. (laughs) Well, you would listen to Lotus. Now, don't you lecture me. Clint spent the first hour of the flight talking to me. I think I'm cured. As long as that eye hurts anyway, huh? I'm not getting much sympathy from you, but I guess I don't deserve any better. Oh, if they hadn't gotten us that way, they would have tried some other way, Smiley. It's the octopus gang, all right, and they stop at nothing. Mm Mm-hmm. We sure are flying into a heap of fun if you want to look at it that way. I hope my eye is all right by the time we get to Africa. Because I want to see all that I can see. (laughs) It will be. Don't worry. Well, I'm worried. Too much has happened since we left New York, and none of it's been any good. Wonder what Chief Riley thinks about those cables Clint's to send them to him. First it's a fire in the plane, then an ambush in the cafe. Yeah. The next thing we know, he'll be sending us reinforcements. Yeah. <sighs> Gosh, this hop is kind of monotonous. Doesn't it see but a lot of Atlantic Ocean beneath us? Quiet. I want it to be monotonous. I've had enough excitement for a few hours at least. I'm looking forward to seeing the Azores. In school, they were just a dot on the map. What are they like, Smiley? Well, they're more than a dot on the map, I can tell you that much. As for what they're like, they're... Ooh, they're just a little island. But Africa's a place, boy. Once you see it, why, it'll get into your blood. And you'll have to go back every now and then. You know, Africa will never let you go. Gosh, I'm glad we're going there. Always wanted to. And I sure hope we can clean out the octopus gang there. And then Atlantean Syndicate. If they're really behind it. Yeah. You know... Just thinking of Africa makes me thirsty. You want a drink of water, Speed? No, thanks. Seeing all that water below us keeps me from being thirsty. The moon's pretty on the water, isn't it? Yep. Moon's always pretty anywhere. But seeing it from a plane beats seeing it from anywhere else. Makes you feel like you're hanging in the sky like the moon and the stars. What? What's wrong, Smiley? But no water's coming out of this tank. No water? But that tank's full, Smiley. I saw them being refilled in Bermuda. I know. I checked them an hour before we took off. Let's try that other tank. Empty. Smiley, we haven't got a drop of water in the plane, and it's our longest hop. Well, we got to tell Clint. But how could it have happened? This is how it happened, Speed. The same one who set fire to our plane between New York and Bermuda emptied our water tanks before we took off from Bermuda. And if we have to make a forced landing, or delayed in any way, well, we won't have a chance. We'll die of thirst.
Greg Gibson of the International Secret Police. Flying to Africa to investigate the operations of a syndicate which claims to have located the lost empire of Atlantis, Speed, Clint, and Smiley Preston, who is replacing Barney during his serious illness, have had nothing but trouble since their takeoff from New York. The secret police know that their big, specially built plane is not at fault, since it underwent rigorous tests before it was accepted by the police authorities. That leaves the two new members of their crew, the mechanic and the navigator, Neither one of these men is a secret police operator, though both are trusted employees of Chief Riley, head of the secret police. But someone emptied the water tanks just before the takeoff at Bermuda, and this, on top of other mysterious things which have happened to delay their arrival in Africa, turns Clint's suspicions toward his crew. He needs proof of guilt, however, and with this in mind, decides to spend the night in a small English hospital near the spot where their giant plane is resting. We find Clint and Speed and Smiley talking with the mechanic and navigator in their hospital room. Uh, This hospitalization may seem foolish to you, boys, but we must be physically fit when we arrive in Africa. And that long hop without any water whatsoever hasn't done us any good. That's a cinch. Oh, I feel pretty good now. Sure you do, Mr. Leeds, but that's because of that stuff the doctor gave us. He said that we've got to make sure and get a good night's sleep, though, for it to really do us good. Right, Speed. And now we'll go and get what the doctor ordered, a good night's sleep. (sighs) Hmm... Suits me to a T. Boy, I sure am sleepy. <laughs> You're always sleepy, Smiley. Ah, uh, yeah, but that long time without a drink made me even more tired. Boy, I was so dry, I could have blotted a letter. Yeah, I guess we all could have done that before we landed, Mr. Preston. Well, I guess Davis and I'll turn in now. What time do you want to take off tomorrow, Mr. Barlow? Well, it all depends. I want to make sure that the ship is in perfect order. So Davis will have to have enough time to check it all over. Mm, And don't forget to fill those water tanks. And this time, I'm going to keep my eye on them until we get them in the air. I'm not taking any chances on having that water evaporate mysterious like again. (laughs) You had plenty of water under you, Smiley. Yeah, salt water. (laughs) I never want to hear the word salt again. (laughs) Well, never mind what you want, Smiley. Let's get back to our room and get some sleep. You sure you and Davis have everything you need, Leeds? Yes, sir. Thanks. All right. Good night. Good night. Right. Good night, Lee. Speed. Speed. Wake up. Huh? What is it, Claire? Get up. Get your clothes on right away. We're going down to the plane. The plane? But well, we're not taking off until tomorrow. Never mind that. Get dressed while I try to wake up Smiley. He sleeps like a log. I do not. How can anybody sleep with y'all hold a convention in the room? Well, Smiley, you awake? I ain't been asleep, Clint. I knew you had something on your mind all the time. You get that sort of far away look in your eyes. Listen then, you two. I haven't said anything about this before because I didn't want Leeds or Davis to suspect anything. And something in your look might have given the whole thing away. Leeds and Davis? The mechanic and the navigator? But they're in this hospital, too, aren't they, Clint? They should be. But I've got a pretty good hunch that one of them is directly responsible for all the mishaps we've been having on this flight. You mean he might be aiming to disable the plane during this layover, Clint? Exactly. And he won't stop at that, either. If the Octopus Gang isn't back at the Atlantean Syndicate, as we think, they'll move heaven and earth to kill us off. It's our lives or theirs, Smiley. And we don't want anything to happen to that plane between here and our next stop, Madeira. But, Clint... Whatever had happened to us would happen to whoever's trying to stop us from reaching Africa, wouldn't it? Yes, but that doesn't mean anything. They're so desperate they'd kill themselves if they were sure they'd get us at the same time. Now, are you ready yet? You bet. I'm all ready. Mm, me too. Let's go then. But be careful that no one sees you leave the hospital. Here we are. Better go by way of this window. 
I want this party at the plane to be a surprise party. For one of the crew, at least. Gee, listen to the birds, Smiley. Mm-hmm. Only birds I'm interested in listening for now, boy, don't seem. Golly, it's hard to believe that either Leeds or Davis might be a killer. He seemed like such nice fellas. Yeah, but when you've been kicked around as long as Clint and me have, Steve, you learn that things ain't always what they seem, especially people. Take it easy on the advice, my lad. There's the plane just ahead. If anyone should be around it, I don't want them to hear or see us. They won't see us if we stay in the shadow of this wall, Clint. Moon's so bright it makes the shadows extra black. Yeah, it don't look like anybody's fooling with our ship now, Clint. No, not outside, but it's a big ship. Plenty of room inside to work in. Must be working without lights. Don't need any with this moon. You could read a newspaper in this light. You talk like you're mighty certain someone is inside that plane, Clint. But I'm not absolutely sure, of course, but then... Wait a minute. There is someone in that plane. Here. Yeah. I just saw a gleam of light. Whoever it is must be working with a flashlight. Come on, let's get him. Hold it, Speed. We don't want to risk getting a shot out of the darkness. And remember, we've still got a job to do in Africa. How do you want to take him? Ease up and surround the plane before he knows we're here? Yes, I think that's best. And keep your guns handy. But don't shoot unless it's absolutely necessary. If either Leeds or Davis is up to something, I want to question him. He might give us a key to the whole Atlantean problem. Octopus gangsters don't talk, Clint. That was when the octopus was alive. Now we're not sure that he is. But come on, watch your step. Lead on, boy. Gee, it's spooky way out here on the Azores. Feel like anything might happen. Hush your mouth, Speed. Talk about trouble and it comes right along. There's another flash of light. It's up by the instrument board. Gosh, let's hurry before he wrecks the instruments. We're almost there now. Now, Speed... You wait outside the plane, and Smiley and I will go in and surprise this fella. Oh, Clint, let me get a crack at him, too. Order speed, and I haven't time to argue. Yes, sir. Besides, he may have an accomplice. Now, keep a sharp lookout. I sure will. Now, here we are. Stay right here, Speed. I'll let you know if we need help. Okay. Huh. The door to the control room is shut. So I see Come along. What in the dickens can he be doing with the instruments? We'll soon find out. I get ready. I'm opening the door. Lee! Huh? Up with your hands, Lee. We've got you covered. Hey, what is this? Well, that's what we came to find out. What are you fooling around the ship for? You're supposed to be resting up in the hospital. <laughs> I might ask you the same question, Smiley. Huh? Sure. What are you and Clint doing down here? I wasn't satisfied with the way this alameter was registering, so I thought I'd work on it tonight. I knew you wanted to take off tomorrow, and I felt too good to stay in the hospital, and since I am the mechanic, you might say I'm tending to my own business. You mean we're not? Take it easy, Smiley. Now, don't beat around the bush, Leeds, and keep your hands up. Listen, Barlow. I don't have to take that sort of talk from you. I'll get sore in a minute. Get as sore as you want, but do it away from the instrument board. Now, come on. I have a few questions to ask you. Now, do you mind if I replace a wire first? After all, you interrupted me in the midst of my work. Leave the wires alone. Now, the altimeter was working all right when I flew this ship in. It was the water tanks that were wrong, which was very strange. Because Smiley checked on the water just before we took off from Bermuda. Watch out, Clint. He's got his hand behind the altimeter. Keep him up, Leeds, and step lively. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, what's so funny? <laughs> I have to laugh at you, boys. Your profession makes you suspicious of everyone. And I wish you'd take that gun out of my back, Barlow. It's darned uncomfortable. If you wanted comfort, you should have stayed in the hospital. Now, sit down over there. I want to talk to you. Sure. <laughs> hey, fellas, can I come in? Sure, come in. It was Leeds. Hello, Speed. Your uncle thinks I'm up to some sort of monkey business. I haven't found out just what yet. What was he doing, Clint? Working on the altimeter. Clint, do you reckon we might be wrong about him? Maybe his story is on the level. Might be, but he's too cool about the whole thing, Smiley. If he was innocent, he'd be raising Cain. Uh-huh, that's right. Gosh, where's the alarm clock? Alarm clock? Sure, don't you hear a ticking? <laughs> don't tell me you carry an alarm clock around with you, Barlow. Hold on. Why are you edging away, Leeds? I'm not. I 
Just want to go outside if you boys are going to talk all night. Gosh, I might have, Clint. Looks like he's outsmarted us. Whatever he's up to, we can't prove nothing on him. Except an alarm clock. <laughs> of course, it might be a bomb. Bomb! <laughs> Clint! That's why he was up the instrument board, setting a bomb. Hey, get leave. He's getting away. Hey, let go of me. Wait, you let go. Get here. It's a time bomb. Let's go. Hey, he's gone away. Clint's gone after the bomb. Hey, we got to get out of here before that bomb goes off. Clint, come out. We haven't a chance. It's a time bomb. <laughs> Of the International Secret Police. Clint and Smiley spend the night in a small British hospital to fully recover from the long flight between Bermuda and the Azores without drinking water. Leeds and Davis are also supposed to be resting up, but during the night, Clint has a hunch that all is not well down at the plane. Rousing speed and Smiley, Clint leads the way to the plane and surprises Leeds in the control room. He gives the excuse that he was working on the altimeter, but speed hears a ticking sound. It is a time bomb hidden in the plane, and Clint runs to the instrument board, praying that the control wire is there, while Smiley and Speed grapple with Leeds, who frantically tries to escape, and does manage to get out of the plane, but Smiley stops him with a bullet. I wing Leeds! He's down! Good! Oh, golly, if Clint can only find that bomb wiring... Won't do any good to run. If that bomb goes off, it'll wreck anything within a hundred yards of the plane. Hey, the ticking stopped. Clint must have found the wiring all right. You wait here. Wait till I go out and get Lee. Okay, but be careful, Smiley. He might pull a gun on you. I doubt that. He's too concerned about being shot. What's oh, speed? Are you all right? Yeah, Clint. You found the wire and... Yes, we're set near the altimeter. That's why Lee slipped his hand in back there to set off the bomb. He must have had it set to give him just enough time to escape. He didn't, though. Smiley shot him. He's still alive. Oh, yes. At least he was making plenty of noise groaning a minute ago. Good. I want to question him. Lee started that fire in the baggage compartment, too. But I can't understand how the octopus gang could have made him obey them. Why, he's been a trusted employee of the International Secret Police. I'm beginning to think the octopus gang can do anything. We thought we were through with trouble when we got rid of the octopus. It looks like we'll have to get rid of every member of his gang before we're really through with trouble. Yes, it looks that way. Hey, Clint! Speed! Come on out here! Coming, Smiley! Let's pile out, Speed. I have an idea that Leeds really needs hospital care now. That'll give us a chance to question him, too. Did he hurt the plane any? Eh, not that I can see. I'll have one of the local mechanics check it over thoroughly before we take off from Madeira. <laughs> Look, Smiley sitting on lead. <laughs> he would. Always resting. I wouldn't call tonight's work any rest cure. 
One minute we're in the hospital, and the next I'm sitting on a killer. <laughs> Never a dull moment. Well, we're darn lucky to know what we're doing right now. If Speed hadn't heard that time bomb when he did... Spare but... me the unpleasant details. What are we going to do with this Razorback? Take him back to the hospital with us for treatment and questioning. Can he walk? Sure. Those groans you hear come from a guilty conscience more than from a creased shoulder. Come on, Bomber, get up. We're going bye-bye. Now then... Now that your wound has been dressed and you're comfortable in bed, do you feel like talking leads? Oh, go away. I feel rotten. That sawbones wasn't any too gentle. Why should the doctor be easy with a fellow who is going to bomb us? I wonder if Davis is in on this or if he knows that anything has happened at all. I checked on that when we came in. He was sound asleep. Sounds like he's okay, then. Davis doesn't know anything but his navigator. It would have been better if you'd learned nothing but mechanics, Leeds. When was that time bomb supposed to go off? Between here and Madeira. Would have blown the plane to bits. Nice people Chief Riley sends along with us as a crew, huh? He trusted Leeds Smiley. Everyone knew him. He's been with us for years and came with the highest credentials. The octopus gang must have gotten to him after he'd been working for Chief Riley, huh? It's hard to say, Sweden. The octopus might have placed him in our organization for just such a time as this. You know, he'll wait years for something to happen, and when it does happen, he's always ready for it. Uh, yes? Davis, Chief. You send for me? Oh, yes, yes. Come on in. Excuse me, but I'm still half asleep. Leeds, what's happened to you? Ask what didn't happen to us, including you, Davis. What do you mean? We surprised Leeds setting a time bomb in the plane. He planned to have it go off when we were on our way to Madeira. A time bomb? In the plane? But why? You don't know the real reason for our trip to Africa, Davis. But since plenty of other people seem to know about it and are trying to stop us from reaching there, I think you should know why. What? Then you mean this isn't just a routine flight to check up on secret police stations in Africa? No, sir. There's a gang who calls themselves the Atlantean Syndicate who we think are swindling the ten richest fellas in the world and we're aiming to stop them. And we think it's the Octopus Gang. Octopus Gang? Yeah, I see you've heard of them. Well, who hasn't? Do you mean they're actually operating in Africa? From all indications, yes. And Leeds here is one of their number. Ah, uh, you can't prove that. No? Well, we can prove a fire and a time bomb, and it's certain you wasn't just playing when you thought up those nice little things. Why, I didn't even know that Leeds had left our room. Clint had a hunch that something was up, Mr. Davis. Otherwise, he would have taken off and been blown up at sea. Did you hire Lota and Peters to ambush us in Bermuda, Leeds? I, I haven't the slightest idea what you're talking about, Barlow. It isn't going to do you any good to be stubborn, Leeds. We've got enough on you to keep you behind bars for life. Okay, okay. So you've got the goods on me. Then leave me alone. Where's your baggage, Davis? In that closet over there. Leeds, too? Yes. Most of the stuff is locked in the plane. But he brought a small grip in here to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Get it, will you, Speed? Sure thing. Is this the closet you mean, Mr. Davis? Yes. Hey, look. All this isn't going to get you anywhere, Barlow. We'll see. Yes, this is it. The other one had Mr. Davis' name on it. Yes, that's the one Leeds was carrying. Open it. It's locked. Where's the key, Leeds? Why, I must have lost it. Will you give me that key? All or... right, wait a minute. Never mind, Smiley. I have a skeleton key here for just such emergencies. Uh -huh. Well, just the usual thing. Socks, shirt. Here's a wallet, Clint, and a passport. Let's have it. Identification cards, visas. Yes, everything seems in order. Sure it'd be in order. Crooks always see to that. Looks like we're up a stump, all right. Nothing else in the case. Oh, uh, those military brushes. These? Yes, let me have them. Hey, look, you've wrinkled my shirts, thrown my socks all over the floor, and shot me in the shoulder. Now, isn't that enough? Uh, don't you want me to examine these brushes, Leeds? All I want is for you to clear out of here. Unfortunately, it is. It's too late to rid yourself of the police. What are you trying to do to those brushes, Clint? See if the backs will come off. Mm -hmm. This one's solid. But this other one, uh... Yes, it is removable. Well, shut my mouth. A nice, a cubby hole to carry secret papers in as ever I'll see. Yes, and there is a paper in it, all right. 
gosh. Doesn't make much sense, does it? Numbers. Yeah, that's the date speed. And look, New York, Bermuda, Azores, and Madeira. They have our route and the dates we land at these places. If they couldn't stop us from landing. Madeira. That means they're laying for us there, too. We found Leeds out. Maybe that'll end our troubles on the flight at Leeds. Maybe. But Leeds is going to tell us exactly what to expect, whether he likes it or not. Hey, look, may I have a glass of water if I've got to go into such a lengthy discussion? I'll get you one. Thanks. Ah, here. Here. Uh, let me see that piece of paper, Clint. Uh, maybe you overlooked something. Not much to see, Smiley. Probably means plenty if we knew just how to read it. You know, Clint, it just shows our fight as far as Madeira. They must have been awful sure we'd never get beyond there. Say, you think of the cutest things, boy. Uh-huh, that sounds logical. Well, you ready to talk now, Leeds? Yeah. <laughs> I'm ready now. What's he laughing at? <laughs> Don't ask me. If I was in his shoes, I wouldn't be laughing. Uh, on the other hand, my young friend, I think you might. Come on, Leeds. <laughs> Quit stalling and tell us what you know. Very well. I've been in the Octopus Gang for five years. And I've been watching my chance to get you, Clint Barlow, all that time. But I had to be careful. If every one of the secret police suspected me, my usefulness would be ended and the Master would have destroyed me. Master? You mean the Octopus? Yeah. What? power does this criminal have over people that he can force them to do his will? Murder. Destruction. He had a knowledge of psychology that was uncanny, Davis. Almost amounted to hypnotism in some cases. But I've worked with Leeds for years. I never dreamed that he was anything but a swell fellow. Capable and a good sport. The Octopus was the most dangerous criminal alive. And now that he's dead, it'll take a long time to destroy the foundations of crime that he has established. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> Come on, oh, tell me. You amuse me. <laughs> Clint, from the way Leeds is acting, I think the octopus is still alive and knows we're coming to end the Atlantean swindle. Nobody else would be so set on killing you. What about it, Leeds? Is the octopus alive? You wanted me to tell my story from the beginning, didn't you? We don't care where you started, just so you tell it. Clint, this fellow's stolen for some reason or other. If I didn't know he was going to stay right here, I'd say he was playing for time and a getaway. I'm admitting everything, am I not? I started that fire in the baggage compartment. I caused your ambush in Bermuda. Emptied the water tanks between Bermuda and the Azores. <laughs> Too bad I won't see others succeed in Madeira where I've failed. <laughs> you won't see, all right. You'll be in jail. You're wrong there. Huh? Clean. What's wrong with Leeds? <coughs> Leeds. <coughs> Leeds. <laughs> Thought you'd make me talk. <laughs> you fools. He's out cold. Did he faint? No. No, Speedy. He's dead. Dead? But how? Smiley only gave him a flesh wound. I was a fool not to have suspected something when he asked for that glass of water. You mean... He dropped a poison powder into it. There's still traces of it in the bottom of the glass. Now he'll never talk. Gosh, and he said we were sure to be stopped at Madeira. Of the International Secret Police. Zero. 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 
After discovering Leeds in the act of setting a time bomb in their plane, Speed, Clint, and Smiley question the mechanic, and he confesses to being a direct cause of all the trouble they had between New York and the Azores. He also admits being a member of the Octopus Gang, and Clint thinks that he is about to learn the whole mystery of the Atlantean Syndicate, but Leeds has an ace up his sleeve. Fearing the power of the octopus even more than death itself, he drinks poison and dies, laughing at the secret police and saying that others will succeed in stopping them, though he has failed, and that they will never leave their next stop, Madeira, alive. But threats have never stopped the boys yet, and we find them in their giant plane circling the picturesque island of Madeira, preparatory to landing. Going to land in the bay, Clint, or on land? I'm not sure yet, Speed. That's why I'm dragging the island now. I'm flying low so as to see if I can find a level spot ashore to set her down. Mm-hmm. Harder to find than a needle in a haystack, Clint. This island is practically all mountain, rare enough to meet us some 2,000 feet. Golly, guess we can't set down on land then. Don't see an airport anyhow. I think we'd better land in the bay. By entering Madeira there, the Portuguese port officials will be right on hand. We won't waste any time hunting them up or having them hunt us up. No, sirree. They were swelled us in the Azores, and I'll guarantee they'll make us welcome here. Uh-huh. They've been notified to look out for us. Say, that looks like a sheltered spot ahead there. I think I'll land there and then taxi right up to that float at the side of the pier. Mm-hmm. And keep your eyes open, boy. From what Leeds said, I expect the bay to be full of mines. Oh, I think he was bluffing. Anyhow, the octopus wouldn't dare to try any rough stuff right in front of the Portuguese officials. Then I, for one, am going to stay right under their eyes. <laughs> yeah, I can picture that. You're just aching for a real mix-up with the octopus gang, Smiley. Sure am, if they're reasonable and leave their bombs at home. Um, what are you so quiet about, Davis? Haven't said a word hardly since we left the Azores. It's just that I can't get Leeds out of my mind, Mr. Preston. I've worked with him so long. He was my friend. Yes, I know. It's hard to take, Davis. But you'll have to be prepared for occurrences like that on this case. The octopus and his gang recognize no code or law. They're completely cold and heartless. And have operators in high places. So we can't be too careful. I realize that. Well, I'm going to land now. Got your safety belts fastened? Right. Okay, then. Here we go. I'll side slip for a quick landing. Smiley, you know what that road is going up to the top of the island? It's like a fire break, only it seems to be made of rocks. Cobblestone speed. That's not a road, it's a slide. A slide? On cobblestones? Not for me. Oh, you just sit in something that looks like a pony cart when you make the descent, only it's on runners. Two men guide it, and believe me, boy, it's a ride of your life. Those stones are slick as grease from long use, and you go so fast you don't breathe from the time you stop to the bottom of the mountain. Golly, I'd like to try that. Hope we have time. Uh Uh-oh, we're landing. Madeira is one of the most fascinating places in the world, Steve, and one of the most picturesque. Someday you should return when you have nothing to do but explore the island and get to know its people. I'd sure like to, Mr. Davis. Boy, look at those fellas in uniforms waiting for us on the float. Well, <laughs> we're here. And all in one piece, yet. <laughs> He's an even worse crepe hanger than Barney's feed. <laughs> Well, let's pile out and see this comic opera island of Smiley's. Yeah, and let's hope it stays comic. (laughs) (laughs) Well, my friends, you like Madeira, do you not? Oh, boy, do we, Mr. Felipe? I'd like to spend a month there, wouldn't you, Clint? Yes, Speed, but thanks to Mr. Felipe's kindness, we crammed a month's sightseeing into just a few hours. And meantime, he's seen to it that our plane is refueled and checked. 
You've been very kind, oh, It is a pleasure to be of any assistance whatsoever to the International Secret Police, Mr. Barlow. I am only sorry that you cannot remain with us longer than a few hours. Me too, fella, but on our next... You see, our next stop is going to be Africa, where we're going to have to do a lot of work, and maybe we can stop here on our return flight. Oh, huh? I, I hope so. And now, if there is anything else you would like to see... One thing I'd like to do, Mr. Felipe. Yeah, and what is that, Miss Vid? Come down that cobblestone slide from the top of the mountain. Oh, no, no, Speed. We can't take up any more of Mr. Felipe's time for a thing like that. Ah, but he asked me, Mr. Barrow, if you can spare the time. One should not leave Madeira without experiencing the breathtaking exhilaration of that descent. It is the thrill of a lifetime sliding down a cobblestone slide. It gives the same sensation as skiing, they tell me. Mm, but where they ski, it's cold, and here it's hot. I have to say... I left my coat and hat in the plane. Uh, you might need it on top of the mountain, Mr. Davis. It is windy and cool. That's <laughs> answered. Thank you. We're really going up there, then? Well, it looks like it, Speed. I believe Davis and Smiley are as anxious to make that descent as you. <laughs> but how do we get up there, Mr. Philippe? I, I don't think I'm equal to walking up there in this heat. Oh, no, no, no. We shall go by ox cart. I think your nephew will like that, no? Ox cart? I'll say... Could I drive it? Ah, to be sure. But don't try to fly it, boy. The road up to the top ain't any too wide, and that ox and the cart are mighty big without you trying any fancy tricks with it. <laughs> don't worry, Smiley. I've never driven an ox before. I'll be careful. Oh, we can use this cut here. I believe it is available. Hey, driver, wake up. Uh, yes? You wish to drive anywhere? Uh, yes, but my young friend, he will do the driving. You may remain here and continue your sleep. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You're very kind. You'll trust us with this cart? You, you wouldn't get very far with it. Remember, you're on an island, boy. <laughs> uh, we all have honest faces, evidently. This will uh, seem a strange transportation after your taxis in America, Speed. <laughs> That's swell, Mr. Felipe. Is everybody in? Wait a minute, boy. I'm half in and half out. <laughs> Oh, Smiley would be last. Mm-hmm. I'm polite, and that's that's all, and then he calls me for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we are all in. You take the reins, Speed. Okay. Well, how do you start him going? Well, how do you start a horse in America? Why, get up, I guess. Well, I imagine that word will have the same effect on this big fellow. Well, we'll try it. Get up! Get up there! <laughs> <laughs> he's talking right back to you, boy. But he's not moving. Do you think he can move with that big yoke on his shoulders like that? Why, sure he can move. But you got to know the right word, and I'm the only one who knows him. Oh, as one ox to another, huh? Oh, yeah? <laughs> boy, did I stick my neck out on that one. Wow. <laughs> you sure did, Smiley. But what are your magic words? You really want to know? Oh, come on. Now, stop the questions and answers, Uncle Tom, and we'll be here all day. All right, if you Yankees insist on rushing me, here goes. Get up, you golden humpback razorback. Get a going. <laughs> That's a very good. <laughs> so those are your magic words, Smiley. Yes, sir. Right words, right place. He started, didn't he? <laughs> sure did. Probably scared the poor animal to death. Wouldn't surprise me if he ran all the way up the mountain. Do we stay on this road to get up there, Mr. Felipe? Oh, no. We take that to turn off ahead, Speed. Uh -huh. Will it take us long to reach the top? No. Once we begin the ascent, the road becomes very steep, Mr. Barlow. That is why we use oxen here in Madeira. They can stand a long, sustained pull better than any other animal. Uh, but supposing something breaks halfway up. Oh, quiet, Smiley. We're having a good time here in Madeira, in spite of you. And in spite of other things, don't forget what Leeds said. I'm not. But I think for once, Mr. Leeds was wrong. Ah, uh, we're almost there. Yes, it did not take long, did it? I should say not. Hey, it's certainly a lot cooler up here, too. I'm beginning to wish I'd brought my coat after all. Uh-huh, I thought so. You know, Barlow, I don't think that I'll go down that slide with you now that I see what it's like. 
Roller coasters get me, and this is worse than any roller coaster I ever saw. Gee, Mr. Davis, that's too bad after this long ride up here. The view alone is worth the ride, Speed. <laughs> well, I'll remain here to keep Mr. Davis company, and we shall bring the cart down. Well, then take my coat and hat, Davis. I won't need them on the descent, and you will if you stay up here. Thanks, Barlow. If you're sure you won't need them. Say, once he starts down, he won't know what he's got on, Davis. <laughs> okay. Guess this is the end of the line. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes, Speed. And just over there, you see the sled cart, which will carry you to the bottom. Ah, there are the two fellas to handle it. Just like you said, Smiley. Must take a lot of strength to keep the sled in line. Ah, uh, it does, Speed, but we have never had an accident. Now, come, we'll go over to the sled with you, even if we will not go down with you. <laughs> all right. Are you all set, Davis? Yeah, thanks. That coat feels mighty good up here. Boy, what a view. You can almost see to Africa from here on a clear day, Speed. Gee, I can hardly wait to get there, Smiley. Hold on there one thing at a time. And right now, we're going to do a mess of sliding. Climb in, Speed. Boy, it sure looks steep. (laughs) (laughs) Want to stay with me, Speed? No, this is going to be great, Mr. Davis. Here's room beside me, Clint. (laughs) All right. Three of us in here. Since we won't fall out... Well, I guess we're all ready for the ride of our life, Mr. Philippa. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoy it, Mr. Barlow. We will meet you at the bottom a little later, huh? What was that? Somebody that shooting. Hope they're not aiming at us. We'd make swell targets lined up against the skyline here. Oh, oh, oh Davis. Oh. Davis is hit. Quick, start the descent. It's the only chance of escape. They said they'd get us. Clint, he's falling. Yeah, I'll bring him down. No, lift him in here. You come too, Philippa. Hey, but it would be suicide. Too many in this land. We'll have to risk that. It's our only chance. The Octopus Gang will murder us all if we stay here. Come on. Here, help me with Davis. I got him. Climb on, Philippa. Oh. Right, I am in. Let's go. And pray for a safe landing. Of the International Secret Police. octopus gangster died with a promise that Speed, Clint, and Smiley would be stopped permanently on the island of Madeira. During their layover, there is nothing to indicate danger until Speed suggests that they go to the top of the island for the thrill that is famous the world over. The long slide in a sled car down the cobblestone track. Davis, the navigator, and Mr. Felipa, a Portuguese official, accompany the secret police to the start of the slide. But once there, Davis decides not to go with the others. He complains of the cold wind and Clint gives him his own coat and hat to wear. Just as they are about to start, a rifle shot rings out, and a second shot gets Davis. Realizing that someone is sniping at them, Clint gets both the wounded man and Felipe into the car for them, dangerously overloading it. But the slide is the only thing that might save them, and we find them hurtling down the mountainside, the sled threatening to overturn at any moment. You think 
we'll make it, Clint. I don't know, Speed. Hope for the best. We're near the bottom and deep. How dangerous? Can't tell. Well, nobody's shooting at us anymore. This side devil's up at the bottom, Speed. I got a feeling we're going to do a flip flop yet. I hope not, Mr. President. Look, it's beginning to level off now. We're not losing any speed, Jack. Look, there's the end of the slide ahead. What do we do? We're too jammed in here, Joe. We're going to hit that wall of rock head on. Oh, Newt, I thought our drivers are trying to throw us off in the track into the sand before we strike the wall. Wait, maybe we can help them. Everyone lunge toward the right. One, two, three. Oh, oh, hey. Oh, hey. Oh, speed. Speed. Are you all right? Yeah, Clint. What about the others? Smiling? <laughs> Wait till I get this sand out of my eyes and mouth, then I'll see what the damage is. Quick, quick. quick. Get to Davis. It's all right, Mr. Barlow. Nothing can hurt Mr. Davis now. Dead? Yes. I am sorry. He must have died just after warning us to slide to safety. He died because he was wearing my coat and hat. That sniper mistook him for me. Mr. Philippa, can we get to your office right away? Oh, yes, of course. Oh, nothing like this has ever happened in Madeira. A complete investigation must be made. Investigation? We're going to find the gun and the man that killed Davis before we leave this island. Now, according to this relief map of the island, Mr. Philippa, this little knoll here would be a logical place for a sniper to station himself, would it not? Yeah, judging from the direction of the shots came from, and a study of the bullet taken from Mr. Davis... I would say yes, Mr. Barlow. But I do not know if you remember or not. Probably you did not notice this knoll at all. But on it is a clump of trees. An excellent hiding place commanding a clear view of the beginning of the slide. Yeah, with the kind of rifle that fella had, he could do plenty of damage and did. He must have had a telescopic rangefinder on his rifle. Undoubtedly, Speed. That man was all set to pick us off one by one, beginning with me. Sure. With you gone, nobody'd ever run down the octopus gang. Uh, but, Mr. Barlow, are you sure this attack was from a member of this uh, octopus gang? Yes, Felipe. Ever since we left New York, they've been trying to stop us. You see, Clint is the only man in the whole service they're really afraid of, Mr. Felipe. Oh, nonsense, Speed. It's just that I've been on the trail of the octopus for a long time. We're old enemies. He studied my working tactics, and I've studied his. So I know what I might expect from him or his gang. Uh, but isn't this octopus dead? It was in the newspapers we heard, even in Madeira. We thought he was dead, but now we're not so sure. It seems impossible that anyone but him could checkmate our every move, as has happened on this flight. That was because we had an octopus gangster with us as a mechanic. What is that? Well, we didn't know it until he reached the Azores. Then he killed himself rather than tell Clint anything about the gang. Uh, and now, Mr. Davis. Uh, too bad. Too bad. Yeah. What's our next move, Clint? Easy, Smiley. I don't think the murderer will try to leave Madeira within the next few hours. He knows darn well we'll be looking for him. You mean we're going after him? Or them, Clint? Exactly. Mr. Philippa, is this knoll where the sniper hid himself easily accessible? How many trails lead to it? Only one that I know of. One? Why, there must be more than one. Never yet saw a criminal with only one way to escape. They make sure of at least two in case one gets blocked. Ah, but this particular location is uh, most unusual, Mr. Preston. You see, it used to be a pirate's lookout. Pirates? Gee, when? Oh, oh, many years ago, Speed. In the old days when blackbirding was common in these waters. Blackbirding? Slave runner speed. Used to Shanghai poor blacks in Africa, pack them in the holes of ships and carry them away to be sold to the highest bidder. Gee, that's awful. Uh, it was a very terrible speed. And these uh, blackbirders work hand in hand with the pirates that once infested the waters along the African coast. Yeah? Uh, from this island, the sea, as a rule, can be carefully uh, scanned. Oh. A ship can be seen some distance at sea. And the pirates uh, used to come up here from the Whispering Cave to see if any of the king's navy was in sight. If not, they waved the blackbird as a signal to carry their sorry cargo on through. Golly, what a story. To think that pirates were really here on Madeira. Boy, there's something a lot worse than pirates running around this little old island right now. Something with a powerful rifle with a telescopic range finder, and he's out to get us. Wait a minute. What, Clint? You mentioned a whispering cave, Felipe. Oh, yes, yes, the old fire at the base. A great cave on the other side of the island in which at low tide the winds flow through, making a whispering sound which has given it its name. I see. 
In the old days, it was thought to be haunted by evil spirits which gave the pirates the uh, privacy they desired. Even now, few people care to visit the cave because of its old, uh, bad reputation. And then, too, it is uh, dangerous. The tides have trapped many explorers in the past years. And you said this cave is at the base of the trail that leads to the knoll? Ah, uh, yes. Then we found the murderer. In the Whispering Cave? Yes, I'm sure of it. And if we move fast, we may catch him there. Which is the quickest way to reach there, Fidipa? Overland or by boat? Why don't we fly there, Clint? They'd spot us in a minute, Speed. And be able to get away before we could land or get to shore. Oh, yes, and we don't know how many are in the gang either. I would recommend my fast launch, Mr. Barlow. It is large enough to carry as many guns and men as you might wish and is the fastest boat in these waters. What about landing? A point of land juts out into deep water just before we are sight the whispering cave. I can bring the boat alongside this point and we can land from there without any trouble. The water is very quiet at this particular point. Swell. Boy, this is going to be exciting. It's going to be a deadly business, Keen. We're up against one killer that we know of. And there might be many more like him in that cave. How many are men do you want, Mr. Barlow? None, thank you. But yourself, of course. We'll get some tear gas bombs from the plane, and these, with our guns, will be enough to round up this bunch of rats, I believe. Yeah. Too many men, too much confusion, and rats can slip away through mighty small holes. Uh, very well, shall we go? Yes. First to our plane, then to your launch. Then to Whispering Cave, as quickly as we can get there. <laughs> Isn't this a swell boat, Clint? Reminds me of the launches of the secret police. Yes, I never thought we'd find anything like this in Madeira. Mr. Felipe is to be congratulated. No wonder there's no crime on the island. Until the octopus gang got here. They're only here because we're here, Steve. Dog gone them. How much farther is it, Mr. Felipe? Oh, you can see our landing point straight ahead. Won't the killer be able to hear our motor? No, no. Not if he is in the cave speed. You can hear nothing in there but the whispering. And the tide is low. Mm. Well, how is it now? Low. But I believe it is near the chain. Is it possible to remain in safety in the cave when the tide is high, Philippa? Oh, yes. There is plenty of room above the tide line. But the danger lies in getting caught going in or coming out of the cave when the tide starts running. Mm Mm-hmm. We would arrive near the time of change. We never would miss a swell opportunity like that. Do everything the hard way. Yeah, that's us. Oh, quiet. Who's going to stay with the boat, Clint? You are, Speed. Me? Oh, no, Clint. Please, let me go with you into the cave. Oh, no. Someone must stay with the boat, Speed, and you're the logical one. Oh, but Mr. Barlow, has he ever handled a launch like this one? Oh, yes. I'd like you to come with Smiley and me, since you're the only one of us who knows the interior of the Whispering Cave. And we must be prepared to attack once we enter it. I don't want to go wandering off onto any blind trail. Of course. Well, here we are. Be sure and stay real close to this point of land speed. We might want to climb aboard in an awful hurry. You needn't worry about me, Smiley. I only wish I could go with you fellas. Nothing to sitting out here in a boat when you might be capturing octopus gangsters in a pirate cave. Guarding this boat is just as important, Speed. Let's see now. Have we got everything? Guns, tear gas bombs... Emergency rations and flashlight. Yep, correct we have. Let's go, then. And, Speed, if you run into any trouble out here, give us two shots as a signal, and we'll come to help you. Okay, Clint. So long, and good luck. Thanks, fella. All right, boys. Now, be careful, everybody. You know, watch your footing. Yeah, I wouldn't want to fall into that water. Looks plenty deep, and I'll bet there's some mighty hungry sharks just hanging around. Oh, quit worrying about the fish and come on. We don't want to waste any time reaching that cave. And be your careful as we approach the mouth of the cave. The rocks are very, very slippery. Uh, when are we going to see this here cave? After we pass that jut up rock. Wait a minute. Let me reconnoiter first. To make sure there's no one on the lookout. Oh, very well. You know, I don't like this place. Kind of spooky, don't you think? No, I don't think it's spooky. Oh. Look out. Here we are at the jut of the rock. Now, let me take a look. It's all clear. Come ahead. But keep your eyes open. So that's the cave. Uh, mighty small entrance, ain't it? I guess now you cannot realize why high tide closes it entirely. Hmm. I don't like the looks of anything around here. Clint. What? 
There's something moving in the mouth of that cave. Someone's coming out. Look, down on your faces. If they see us, we're done for. Of the International Secret Police. After Davis is shot and killed by a mysterious sniper on the island of Madeira, Speed, Clint, and Smiley, together with Philippa, the Portuguese official, suspect that they may find the murderer in the Whispering Cave on the other side of the island. Determined to arrest this man, whom they believe to be another octopus operator, they all speed to this mysterious cave, once a pirate stronghold, in a fast launch. The older men go ashore, leaving Speed to guard the boat, and Clint tells his nephew to fire two shots should danger threaten. Meantime, just as they arrive inside of the cave's mouth, Smiley sees a movement inside, and the attackers all drop to their faces, hoping that they have been unseen. Can you see him, Clint? Yes, barely. Two men. Think they've spotted us? No, I don't dream anyone's within miles. They're looking out to sea as if expecting a boat. Now they've gone back inside the cave. A, a boat must be coming to pick them up. Yeah, but we'll have a little surprise party for that landing party. Is it safe to move yet, Clint? Yep, it's all clear. Come on. Well, let me make sure that I still got all the stuff I was toting. Wouldn't want to get inside that whispering cave and find myself without a gun. It'd be a mighty embarrassing situation, to say the least. All right. But don't waste any time, Smiley. I don't like to be out here on these slippery rocks any longer than necessary. We're good targets while we're here, you know. Okay, let's mosey. Say, I would give anything to know just how many men are inside of that cave. Now, these tear gas bombs will take care of an army, Philippa. Providing we get a chance to use them. That's our main worry to see our quarry before they see us. Yeah, man. Say, is it black inside the cave, Philippa? Oh, no, not at first. A weird blue light illuminates the place until one progresses into its depths. It is a very vast cavern, and the further one goes, the blacker it becomes. Uh-uh. Nice, cozy place for a murder. We're almost at the mouth of the cave now. Watch yourself. You must make sure there's no one near the entrance. You know, I wish I was a mind reader, because it looks like that's the only way anybody will be able to know. They have a weird blue light once you're inside, but from the outside looking in, it's mighty black. And I doubt very much if we are disturbed on entering Mr. Barlow. Since these fellows have no suspicion that we are here, there will probably be no guard. I hope so, Philippa. Have to take a chance, I guess. Keep your guns ready. Don't you worry about that. You know, this sand is a lot better to walk on than those rocks. Uh, it goes right into the mouth of the cave, doesn't it? Uh, yes, the tides have deposited this sand here, and you will find it clear up to the tide line in the cave. Hmm. Somehow I just don't like those tides that run into this here cave. Sounds dangerous to me. Never mind the tides, Neptune. We're ready to enter the cave now, so pipe down. I'll go first, then Philippa, and you bring up the rear, Smyrna. Sure enough. All's clear so far. Yeah. 
Wonder where they got to, Squint. Uh, would you rather find them a waiting for you here, Mr. Preston? Oh, no, not me. Say, this place does have a blue light. And you know it's beautiful. Keep your mind on your work, Smiley. Next thing we know, you'll start looking for mermaids. Oh, no, sir, not me. Mermaids and octopuses don't mix. I stay to your right, Mr. Barlow. We are getting to the tide pools now. And in this dim light, there is danger of falling into them. They are very deep. This cave has everything, doesn't it? Say, Clint, before getting too far into it, what about speed? How can we hear gunshots way back in the cave if nothing else can be heard? Ah, gunshots, yes, Mr. Preston. That is the one sound that will carry into the recesses of the cave. We'd better put our flashlights on a minute, Smiley. I want to see something. Sure enough. There's your light. Cast it down on the sand. <laughs> Looking for pirate treasure, Clint? No. Footprints. I want to make sure we're following the murderer, that he's not following us. Uh oh. Yep. There are the prints. We're all right. There was a chance that they might have sighted us, pretended not to, and then secreted themselves in some hiding place until we pass, so that they could block off our escape. But these footprints are good news. They're still ahead of us. Them, and we don't know what else. Don't you worry about us, Smiley. I'm just hoping that Speed doesn't have any trouble in the boat while we're all in here. Go away. Go away, you seagulls. Somebody's liable to see you hanging around here and wonder what's over here and come over to find out. That wouldn't be so good. Gosh, I wonder what the fellas are doing. They ought to be way inside the cave by now. Doggone. Wish I could have gone with them instead of sticking out here in the boat. What are you seagulls looking at anyhow? Fish? Hmm, let's see if I can see any. Gee, the water's clear. And look at that big fish down there. Boy, he's a whopper. Well, if I'd known I was going to stay in the boat, I might have gotten a fishing line someplace and had some fun. Hey, hey, what was that? Oh, it's just a rock fell in the water. I better not watch the fish. Somebody could come up here without me seeing him if I hang over the side of the boat all the time. I... What's that way out at sea? Hmm, looks like a boat. It is a boat, and it's heading right for this cove. Where's those binoculars? Oh, here they are. And we'll see just what sort of boat she is. Maybe they're just out fishing. Hmm. She's not flying any sort of flag. That's not so good. And that looks like a gun mounted on the forward deck. It's all covered up, but it sure looks like it. That must be an octopus boat. And if the raid is coming, it'll be here before Clint and the others will be out of the cave. I've got to warn them. Gosh, what'll I do? I'm getting kind of nervous, Clint. It seems to me we've come far enough to have found something or somebody by this time. We're still on the right track, Smiley. Still see footprints in the sand. Yeah, maybe we'll soon be above the tide line, and after that, I imagine we shall have found our men. They probably would not stay any place but above the tide line. That's so. I forgot about that doggone tide line. Oh, what's that? Oh, that is the whispering I told you about. The tide is a changing, and the currents of air are drawn up through small openings to cause this sound. Man, oh man, I don't like that a little bit. No wonder they used to think this cave was haunted. Will we have time to leave here before the tide runs in, Felipe? Oh, yes, it will take a little time for it to reach the mouth of the cave, you know. Yeah, but what we don't know is how long we're going to be in here. You don't know just when we're going to find those octopus fellas, do you, Clint? No, but I've got a hunch it should be soon. You see, we're above the tide line now. And look, there's a passage leading into what appears to be another cave. Quick, off of the lights. What is it? I think we've come to the end of the trail. There's a dim light in there. You see? Yeah, like from a lantern. Shall we go in and take them now? No, no. Let's wait a minute. If we get a little closer, perhaps we can hear something important. Uh, this time we'll have to... We'll both come when we get word from the boss. Shh, wait a minute. I'm sick and tired of hanging around this stuff. We've done our business, now we ought to get out of here while the getting's good. Yeah. Uh, I didn't like the job in the first place. I like to fight in the open. I'd shoot out of bushes. Yeah, we didn't get them all. No, we got Barlow. He's the kingpin of the secret police. He's the one the boss wanted to get special. Hear that, Glenn? Uh, Shh, careful. You want to go out and see if we can take the boat again? Nah. Yeah, it ain't no easy walk between here and the mouth of the cave to do it every half hour or so. I just hope that boat gets here before the tide changes or we'll be stuck in here until it runs out again. Well, there's the boss's signal. I'll open it up wide. We don't want to miss anything, and sometimes that set ain't so clear. The octopus. 
us wail. You mean he always has a noise like that when he goes on the air? Yes. He must be alive. But he can't be. Boy, we'll sure find out. And you think that they have a short to wave us out of this cave. It is amazing. Shh. Listen. OZ-1 calling OZ-7. OZ-1 calling OZ-7. Standing by. Okay for two-way conversation, boss. Come on in. The octopus. Alive. But Dan, you said he jumped out of your plane. Wait, wait. What have you accomplished, Dixon? Well, I got Barlow, boss. The others got away, but Barlow's out of the way. Barlow. Dead at last. I waited a long time for this. I sure finished them off. <laughs> Good. Good, Dixon. You shall be well rewarded for this day's work. I'm only sorry that I was not there to see you do the job myself. Why the dirty three-corner hey, uh, Boss, we haven't sighted any boat yet. When are they coming to pick us up? They should arrive at any time. I contacted the boat just before I talked to you. They had already sighted Madeira. Yeah? Ah, oh, swell. I'm getting nervous. I don't like to hang around a place after I've done a job. Still, I do not like you to leave before completing it fully, Dix. Oh, what do you mean? You said the others escaped. I want them destroyed as well. Particularly the boy. He's too much like Clint Barlow for my liking. He might carry on where his uncle left off. That must not be. But I don't know how to get him, boss. They'll be on their guard now. They had a Portuguese official with him. Saw his uniform through my field glass. Same as I spotted the hat and coat on Barlow like you said he was wearing. They had a description of your clothes clean. How does he do it? I how don't live? care how you get the boy, but destroy him you must. Perhaps with the boat at the island it will be easy. You may take greater chances, but not one of the secret police must leave Madeira alive. Well, I'll do my best, boss. You know what awaits you should you fail. Let me know the moment you have accomplished my orders. Yes, sir. We'll leave the cave now. That boat ought to be in sight by now. Very well. And do not fail. OC-1, signing off. Phew. Yeah, if he looks like he talks, I'll bet he's a beaut. Well, come on. Let's get out of this pool. Hey. Hey, they're coming out. Uh, what do we do? We might... Listen. Speed signal. Hey, you hear something like shot spike? It is speed. He's in trouble. Come on. Hey, who's there? Ah, go away from fight. Look out, Clean. Look out. What is it? Of the International Secret Police. Feeling zero. Feeling zero. Feeling zero. Feeling zero.
Clint, Smiley, and Mr. Philippa, a Portuguese official, enter the Whispering Cave on the trail of the murderer of Davis, leaving Speed to guard their boat. Clint tells his nephew to fire two shots if danger should threaten, but all seems calm enough outside the cove of the Whispering Cave until Speed sights a boat speeding toward the cove with what appears to be a gun on the forward deck. Meantime, Clint and the others inside the cave not only find their quarry, but hear the voice of the octopus telling them that a boat will pick them up at any time, but that they must first destroy Speed and Smiley Preston, as he believes they have killed Clint. The secret police barely have time to recover from the shock of learning that the octopus is alive when the killers come out. At the same time, the danger signal of Speed's is heard, but at the moment, the boys have plenty of fight on their hands from the criminal. Oh, no, you don't. Clint, Clint, I got one of them. Are you all right? Yes, sir. I've got Dixon in my control. Well, we've got to get the speed right away. You all right, Philippa? Yes. But all right. Don't you worry about the me. Good. Now, let's get out of here on the run. And you, too. Dixon, don't try anything. We've got you covered. Uh, don't I know it. And you outnumber us three to two. Uh, we won't start anything. Outnumber you? Why, you... What about sniping Davis the way you did? Huh? You won't even come out in the opening fight. Davis? Well, didn't I get Barlow? I am Barlow. Well, I'll be... Come on. Get going to the mouth of the cave. And on the double quick. Get on ahead, you two. But not too far. Or a bullet will slow you down. Now run. All right, let's go. Right. Let's go. Right. Uh, what do you think is bothering speed, Clint? I don't know. Unless he sighted the octopus boat. Speaking of being outnumbered, that gang on the boat will be all over us before we can do much about it. I've got a plan. It's an old one, but good. Save your breath, Smiley. You're going to need it. Uh, the tide is, is a running in. You will notice that the whispering sound has ceased. We shall probably get our feet wet in leaving the cave. Uh-huh. We're lucky if that's all. Faster, you two ahead. Hey, I'm not used, I'm not used to this running. Never mind that. Get going. Haven't heard any... Thing more from speed. Reckon that's bad. Uh, I can't tell. He's probably holding fire for the time being, though. May need that ammunition for something more than a signal shot. Uh, wait. They're approaching the mouth of the cave. The blue light illuminating the cave tells us of that. Yeah. Don't seem half the fire going out, is it? Is it just coming in? I see daylight. We're almost there. The water's not coming in yet. That's something to be thankful for. Now slow down, you fellas. I want to talk to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's your plan, Clean? It's something I want Dixon to do. Have you any way of signaling that pickup boat, Dixon? Sure. I do with mirrors. Mirrors? Say, are you trying to be funny because... No, you... no. I flash a mirror in the sun. Little pocket mirror, see? I got it here in my pocket. I'm supposed to tell him whether it's safe to land or not. That's just what I wanted to know. Dixon... You're going to signal your boat to pick you up somewhere else. What? They'll believe you. Because the octopus told you to get speed and smiley before you left Madeira. He's probably telling them the same thing now over their shortwave radio set. You let them get away, Clint? We can stand them off here. Felipa, isn't there a tiny cove near where our plane is stationed? Oh, yes. That is a Rigas Bay. Oh, that is a very well known. Good. Dixon, you tell your boat to pick you up there tonight. I won't do it. I know what you're planning, you'll ambush them. You'll do it or die in your tracks. I have no time to waste. What'll it be? Will you signal to that boat or will I shoot? All right, I'll signal. And just what Clint told you to signal, too. I can read it and I'll know if you're not telling the right thing. Ah, don't worry. I'll do what you say. You and Felipe stay here, Smiley. I'm going to speed. Take Dixon outside when I leave and give that boat the signal. If they want to know who we are, Dixon, tell them we're working for you. You get that? Yeah, I got that. But, Clint, you might run into trouble at the boat. Nothing that I can't take care of. Stay with it, Smiley. I'll come back as soon as I can. Meantime, give the signal to the octopus boat. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Dixon. They came, but the boat, that one out there, they've seen us. I think they have a gun mounted on the forward deck. That's okay. I've been taking care of that boat. I hope. 
Well, what do you mean? I haven't time to tell you now. I just wanted to make sure everything was all right here. Here? Yeah. But isn't that the boat that was going to come to pick up the octopus gangsters? Hey, did you find them? Were they in the Whispering Cave? Yes. Yes to everything. We got them all right, Speed. And now Smiley is seeing to her that one of the criminals is signaling that boat to pick them up at Regus Cove tonight. Then we'll capture the whole gang. Gosh, that'll be great. Yeah, if our plan works. You don't think it will? I can't tell. You got those binoculars handy, Speed? Yeah, right here. I looked at the boat room. That's how I knew they were carrying a gun. Let me have them a minute. Here you are. Oh, thank you. Now, let's see. What are they doing? They're watching Dixon's signal right enough. Several men are at the lee rail. The speed they were coming, I thought they'd pick them up from shore. But I guess the boat's a little too big to bring in close. They were going to use a dinghy. At least they were going to use one before this fellow you talk about signaled them. Speed. Huh? One of the crew is using glasses. Has them trained on us. Gosh, what do we do? Nothing. Until we see what they're going to do. Now they're returning Dixon's signal. Just three flashes. Hey, looks like they're lowering the dinghy, too. They didn't believe Dixon. They suspect something. What do we do, Clint? Trying to hold off a gang like that is like fighting a whole navy. We've got one chance, Speed. The Whispering Cave. If we can get in there before the tide seals them out. The cave? Yes, quick. Gather up all the stuff you can lay hands on. Here, I'll get aboard, too. And guns, ammunition, and don't forget the water canteens and emergency rations. Gosh, looks like we're preparing for a siege. No telling how long we'll be in that cave, Speed. But won't they just wait until we come out and then get it? We can't stay in there forever. We'll have to come out the same way we went in. Mr. Felipe said there was only one exit. We'll worry about that when the time comes. And what about this boat? It'll drift away without someone at the wheel. Yes, we wouldn't get very far with dead men as a crew either. And that's what we'll be if we don't get inside that cave before the octopus landing party arrives. Once they get ashore, we won't stand a chance. You got everything? Yeah, as much as I can carry. All right, then. Jump ashore. I'll hold the boat steady while you do. Okay. Now, what about you? Right. I'll bring her up alongside as close as I can. And then trust the luck. There, now's your chance. All right. Well, I made it. Look, Clint, they've got the dinghy in the water already. Yes, but it'll take them time to row ashore. Come along, Speed. We'll have to run over some darn slippery rocks to get back to Smiley and the rest in time. But we'll do it. We've got to do it. Look, you see there? Water's getting higher all the time. Oh, yes, and there's still no sign of a barlow. I wonder what could have happened. <laughs> he probably ran into a mess of trouble when he went to see what happened to that precious nephew of his. <laughs> Just the same sort of trouble that you're going to have when that shore boat lands here. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh-huh. Well, don't laugh too hard, Razorback. Or you'll... Oh, stop it. You'll crack that silly face of yours. Clint will come back here with an octopus under each arm if he met up with any Wait of them. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Look. Look. Yeah. Here, they're coming now. And he's bringing speed with him. I wonder what he did with our boat. Oh, it will smash up on the rocks with the tide running like it is, with the no one at the wheel. And they're toting a lot of stuff. Gosh almighty. Clint must have something up his sleeve, and I'd like to know what before this tide gets any higher. It's forced us most back into the cave again. Hi, Smiley. What's the idea? What are you edging around for, Dixon? I've still got you covered, and your gang is still out in the ocean. And don't you forget that. Nah, I ain't forgetting it. But let me remind you of something, copper. The cards will be in my hand before long, policeman. Yeah, but you won't be interested in none in the playing of them, big boy. And I'll see to that personal. What's my name? Philippa. I'm going back into the whispering cave. What? We've got to have a better chance of holding off that landing party in there than out here. Yes, but perhaps we will have no trouble with them, Mr. Barlow. What do you mean? Now, could we not have Dixon himself convince them that we are working with him and them? It's a slim chance. Once they get a look at us, Felipe, if they didn't recognize me, it's a sense they'd no speed. Everyone in the Octopus gang has heard plenty about him. I'll say we have. That's probably what's bringing them ashore, Barlow. In spite of my signal, they saw the kid was up and smelled a rat. Even so, that landing party ain't a big thing. We could handle them, couldn't we? Yeah, it'd be a long gamble, Smiley. Against big odds. Speed, let me have those glasses again. Could you take this stuff out of my hands, Felipe? Oh, yes, too, sure. Oh, sure, there now. 
Let's take another look at that boat. How many are in the dinghy, Clint? Six. And they're well armed. Well, so are we. And we don't have to land a boat when we attack them. Say, wait another minute. We'll be in that cave whether we want to or not. And the rocks between us and where we left our, our boat are being covered with water. That's yeah, right. we got our feet wet coming here all right. Well, what is it, our feet? That settles it. Clint, what is it? What do you see? They're uncovering the gun on the forward deck to protect the landing party. That means we haven't bluffed them for a minute. Back into the cave, everybody, or we'll be blown off this beach. <laughs> Of the International Secret Police. After Speed, Clint and Smiley, with the aid of Mr. Philippa, capture two octopus gangsters in the Whispering Cave on Madeira. They are about to leave when the octopus boat arrives to pick up the two criminals. Clint forces one, Dixon, to signal the boat to pick them up that night in Regis Cove. But suspecting that all is not as it should be, and recognizing Speed as the youngest member of the secret police, the outlaw boat launches a dinghy filled with armed men. The boys, forced back to the mouth of the cave, prepare to hold them off. But when a gun is uncovered on the deck of the octopus boat, rather than be blown off the beach, Clint orders everyone back into the cave. We find the party now trying to beat the fast-rising tide, which is lapping their ankles. Mm-hmm. We sure got ourselves in a nice hole, Clint. Do you think we're ever going to get out of this alive? There's a better chance of it in here. And yet we'd have stayed on the beach, Mommy. Hurry up a little, will you? This tide's running in fast. Yeah, I know. You think the octopus gangsters will try to follow us in here, Clint? I don't think so, Steve. They'll know that we'll be ready for that. I imagine they'll wait until low tide and then try to surprise us. Don't you, Felipe? Oh, yes, Mr. Abarlo. It is not a happy outlook. Yeah. Those emergency rations and the canteens of fresh water will not last forever. Starvation is the ally of those of criminals. Oh, don't worry about that. While there's life, there's hope. Well, oh. at least we're out of the water. Yes. We'll reach the tide line soon. Once above that, we can stop and catch our breath. Well, it hasn't been easy hurrying like this. Carrying supplies and weapons? Yeah. But, boy, this is sure some cave. I'd like to explore sometime when the octopus gang isn't after us. You'll probably see a whole lot more of this here cave than you want before you get out of here, boy. I have already, and this is only the beginning. All right, all right. Here's the mark of the tide. Now, then, take a little easier. You know we're safe from the water, at least. Unless a tidal wave pops in. <laughs> Would we be embarrassed? Hey, Dixon. Did you leave any supplies in that room you occupied in here? Uh, there might be some stuff. I don't know. A room, Clint? Uh, sort of a natural rock room, Speed. A shortwave sending and receiving set in there. Oh, say, Speed, I've got some bad news for you. What? The octopus is alive. We heard his voice coming in over the shortwave set talking to Dixon here. The octopus? Alive? 
I might have known it. He did use a parachute after falling through that cloud bank. But even then, Clint, how'd he ever get out of the Himalayas alive? I hope we can ask him that question personally someday. But now at least we definitely know what we're up against. And that somehow he's connected with the Atlantean Syndicate. So what do you know about that, Dixon? Atlantean Syndicate? What are you talking about? Oh, you're going to play dumb, huh? No, but I don't know what he's talking about. I was just hired to bump off a guy wearing a hat and coat, which was described in detail. It turns out that Barlow ain't wearing that hat and coat, so I kills an innocent guy. But I don't know anything about this Atlantean hooey. And you have it admitted to murder. You should have paid the penalty. Don't make me laugh, tin soldier. Wait till you get out of here with your skin before you start telling me what penalty I'll have to pay. What about this other fella, Clint? Well, he either can't or won't talk. He hasn't said a word since this all began. Mm, but he packed a mean punch. Did he hit you in that fight, Smiley? Of course. Didn't you know I'm the punching bag of this outfit, or didn't you know? <laughs> oh, come on, come on. Let's go into Dixon's hideaway and see what else we can find beside that shortwave set. Clint! Huh? Why can't we send an SOS over that shortwave set? Philippa, have the police shortwave equipment in their offices? No, no, Mr. Barlow, but there are several amateur stations on the island. Well, one of them might pick up our call for help. It's worth the try. Why didn't we think of that before? Steed, you're great. Ah, you're all crazy. You can't use that set. It's ultra shortwave. Nothing on this island could pick it up. Uh, there is a chance. One station in particular is experimenting in ultra shortwave. Well, come on. Let's get into that room and see what can be done. <laughs> Wait a minute. Huh? All be quiet. I want to see if the landing party has entered the cave or not. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I guess we're safe from them for the time being. Yeah, all I can hear is water. Yeah. Too much of it, suit me. Well, listen while you can, Smiley. When we're out on the Sahara Desert looking for the Atlantean expedition, maybe we'll wish we were back here. Wash your mouth, will you? This is bad enough without dragging the desert in, too. All right, all right, break it up. Let's go into that rock room. Well... Bless my grandpa's whiskers. Look at all the stuff in this room. All right, look the place over. Well, I get on this short wave set, Smiley. Find out exactly what we can count on in here. I wouldn't count on anything in here. Personal. You help him, Speed. And Mr. Philippa, I'll count on you to keep our prisoners quiet. Uh, you may it depend on me, Mr. Barlow. Boy, I sure hope Clint can get word to someone who might help us. You said it, boy. You know, Speed, most anything could happen to us in here and nobody would be the wiser. I don't know if it was smart or not to come in here. We had to, Smiley. Yeah, six one way, half a dozen the other. Oh, well, we're in. Let's see what we can find in here that might help us. Uh, what's in this box? Uh-huh, empty. Hey, listen, I'm thirsty. Can I have a drink? Yes, sir, Dixon, you may have a drink, but not a too much. Yeah, go easy with that canteen. We've only got two for the lot of us. Don't worry, I'll go easy. Uh, here you are. Thanks. Look out, he's going to throw hey, the canteen. Wait a minute. Let me out. I'll try to save some of that water. Gosh, why'd you do that, Dixon? If we run out of water before we get out of here, you'll be just as thirsty as the rest of us. What do I got to lose? Whether I croak from thirst in here from a rope around my neck outside, it's all the same. Keep that other canteen out of his reach. Yeah, certainly I will. Doggone, you razorback. I'll skin you alive for doing that. I couldn't save a drop of water. All right, take it easy, Smiley. I don't think we'll need water anyway. Well, I think I've got the set ready for the broadcast. Yeah, Clint? Swell. We'll try her anyhow. Keep your fingers crossed and pray that somebody picks us up. All right. Calling Madeira stations. Calling all Madeira stations. This is Clint Barlow of the International Secret Police. We're trapped in Whispering Cave. We're trapped in Whispering Cave by a desperate band of criminals. Their boat is in the bay. Come armed and come immediately. Any amateur picking up this message, please relay to Madeira police at once. Boy, they ought to get something. I'll wait a few seconds, then give that call again. Listen, the octopus. Do you reckon he heard Gene? If he did, we're some. So, Clint Barlow, you are still alive. Yes, and I intend to remain so. And yet you send out a call for help. Crawl back into your hole, octopus. You may be a liar, but you can't stop us from escaping now. Oh, can't I? <laughs> Sounds like he thinks he can. Yes, you fools. I barely caught your call for help, so I could not stop it. But I can destroy you before any help could reach you. You're bluffing, Octopus. Nothing you can say or do will stop us from catching up with you this time. And when we do, you'll not escape. We shall see, Barlow. Meantime, listen to the voice of the octopus. <laughs> and see if you will be able to reply. Now, what do you mean by that? I don't know. But it's useless to send out a call again. 
He'll have found a way to blot us off the air. Gosh, I sure hope somebody heard that first one, Clint. Well, what do you mean? Listen to the voice of the octopus. I don't know. Listen. What can it be? Thunder. No. It's the gun on the octopus ship. They're shelling this cave. We're caught in our own trap. Mm. 